So we'll be starting the session in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, my name's Paul Jackson. For um, those of you that, that don't know me, I'll be, I'll be chairing the, the first part of this session. Um, so it's a, a sunny winter's day in, in Australia here. So um, good morning to those of you in Europe and good afternoon to, to those in, in the Asia Pacific area. Um, and I just wanted to remind all the speakers that your, your talks are uh, scheduled for, for 12 minutes with, with three minutes for questions. Um, so what I will do, if you're, if you're seeming like you might be running close to time, I'll, I'll give a two minute warning in the, the chat window, um, just, just writing two minutes. And then if you get uh, close to the end, I'll, I'll request that you, you wrap up the time so that there's time for questions. Um, if we run out of question time, there's always the, the matter most uh, to, to put additional questions in and, and follow up conversation that way. And if I could just request also that people mute if they're, they're not presenting, that would be appreciated. The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Okay, so with that exciting introduction, um, I'd like to invite this first speaker of this session to, to share their slides and, um, and take the floor. This will be Zhizhong Jing um, with the, the talk titled Towards Establishing a Second B-Flavored CKM Unitarity Triangle. Uh, could you try and share your slides, please? Uh, I see that you're connected, but I neither neither hear you nor nor see any slides being shared. Hello, Jijong. Hello, Chijong, could you please um, start sharing your slides so that we can begin your presentation? Or could you confirm that you can hear us okay? The speaker doesn't appear to be responding. Aha. Zhizhong, can you hear us? You're still muted if you are trying to speak. I'm trying to share the screen. Can you ah, hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you now very well. Um, I will turn off my video. If you could 
could try a, a little more. Otherwise, um, if if this isn't working for you, I can also share slides on your behalf. Yeah, I, I'm trying again. But, uh, but uh, the, oh, no, I think I succeed. Okay, I think we are seeing something now. Um, unfortunately, for all concerned, it looks to be my face, but there we go. We, we see your slides now. Okay, if you could make these full screen, that would be, that would be ideal. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Um, you can get started whenever you wish. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry about the connection. And I will give a talk about the how to establish the second B-flavored CKM unitarity triangle. This work was done in collaboration with my PhD student, Di Zhang. So you know, in standard model, the origin of flavor mixing and the CP violation was from the so-called Kobayashi Masakawa matrix. It contains an non-trivial phase. And in this case, we can generate CP violation. So the question is how to test this mechanism. We know the CKM matrix is unitary. So we can measure the moduli of the elements to test the normalization conditions or to measure the triangles to test the orthogonality relations. And we know we are entering into the higher precision measurements of B flavored uh, triangles uh, in the upcoming high luminosity RCB and also the super B factory at Japan. So there are two twin CKM unitarity triangles like this. I show you the red one and the blue one. The most solid triangle is the red one. You see this, we can make a rescaling like this, and its apex is measured by rho bar plus i eta bar. And this, there are three inner angles, and one of them alpha has been measured from data. And this red triangle has a twin sister, is the blue one. It's determined by this orthogonality conditions in the complex plane. And its apex is defined by rho tilt and uh, eta tilt. So these triangles, triangles are very similar and congruent to a good degree of accuracy. The question is how to distinguish between them in experiments. And so far, people have paid all attention to the first one, the red triangle. So we, we can get over constraints. And you see these constraints from CP violation in K0, K0 mixing, from BD mixing, BS mixing, and B meson decays, also CP violation in B decays. So we can determine the error and also the apex very well from this uh, ex experiments data. And how to constrain the second one, the twin sister is the issue that I want to address in this talk. So now I, I use the Wolfstein expansion to calculate the two triangles. And you know this uh, famous permestration and we can calculate the apex of the red triangle, rho bar and eta bar. Also for the second blue one, the tilde rho and tilde eta. So you see these two apices are very similar and their difference is tiny. The amazing thing is that the apexes of these two triangles are actually on the same circular arc. This is, this is the apex for triangle red, you see here, and this for blue. And we can determine this tiny difference between these two apexes. So this, because they are on the same arc, so this is the orbit equation. And we use the Wolfstein parametrization to calculate the differences between rho tilde and rho bar, eta tilde and eta bar. So you see 
there are differences at the level and lambda square. So it's very, very small. But still, it's possible to probe it if our experimental data are accurate enough. So the question is how to test. And to measure apexes of these red and blue triangles so as to examine the consistency of the CCAM unitarity, we hope we can establish both triangles in experiments. And the red one has been established to a good degree of accuracy. And you see this is the apex. And from this, we can determine the rho and eta parameters. And this relation is exact. Also for the blue one, this relation is also exact. And if the future experiments can measure this triangle and establish the apex, then we can from the experimental values of till the rho and till the eta to determine rho and eta. And then we make a comparison between the values of rho and eta determined from this triangle and those determined from this triangle. And then we can see whether they are consistent or not, or to what degree of accuracy they are consistent. So this is the issue. So here we suggest in you know, real experiments, we can now establishing this triangle from CP violation in K mixing, in BD mixing, and BU and BD decays, and also CP violation in B sub U, B sub D decays. And for the blue triangle, our suggestion is to use the constraints from CP violation in K mixing, B sub S mixing, B sub U and B sub S decays, and the CPU violation in B sub U and B sub S decays. So in other words, we just separate two sets of data. One is from B sub D, B sub, A, uh, B sub U, and the other from B sub S, B sub U, and then to measure both triangles simultaneously. And here I show you a very useful reference and given by Biggie and Sander uh, about 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago. So in this paper, they did suggest how to determine the other five unitary triangles besides the most popular one. So I think today is the time to determine at least the twin B flavor triangles and then to make comparison between these two B flavored triangles and to test consistency of the standard model prediction. So in the second part of my, my talk, I just show you a two loop renormalization group equation corrections to these two triangles and to the CCAM matrix. And here you see, this is the moduli of nine elements of the CCAM matrix and we can determine uh, their uh, evolution with energy scale. Here S1 is the one loop correction, S2 is two loop correction. And we found that this two loop evolution is valid up to the accuracy of lambda fourth. And in the standard model and in the minimal super symmetric standard model, we can calculate these corrections. And we found that for the Wallstein parameters only for the A parameter, they evolve and they are sensitive to the two loop quantum correction. And for the lambda rho eta and also this rho bar or tilt bar, they are both uh, insensitive. So this give, give us uh, information that the two rescaled unitary triangles are stable against the changes of the energy scale. So if we can determine their inner angles at low energy scale, we can directly confront them with a theoretical prediction at a super high energy scale. And uh, here I show you some integral form of the evolution of Wallstein parameters and give some numerical illustrations. Okay, this is the uh, talk of mine and here I conclude. So my main point is that in the high precision measurement era signified by super B factory and high luminosity RCB, it makes sense to probe and establish 
the other CKM unitarity triangles. So I find it's interesting to separately establish and compare the B flavor twin triangles to test the consistency of the standard model prediction. And our calculation shows that the tiny differences between the twin triangles are there and their stability against two loop RGE running with energy scales are quite, are quite okay under control. And the same study can be extended to the other four second triangles and can be extended to the electronic unitary triangles in the neutrino and lepton sector. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. We, we have time for one quick question, if there's uh, some clarification wanted or, or a quick comment. Uh, if not, we can always follow up on the, the Mattermost or in the chat window and, and discuss offline. So I don't see any hands raised. So we'll say thank you to the speaker again for this very nice clear talk. And we'll move on to the next presentation, which is uh, by Luis Vail Silva. Um, hi, Paul. Can hi. you hear me? I hear you very well, Luis. Yes. Okay. And uh, if you could share your slides again. Um, we're ready to get started. You can see the slides as well. Very good. I see the slides and I see them moving. So please, uh, whenever you're ready, take the floor. Yeah, okay. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, in this talk, I would like to discuss how we can explore uh, new physics by using dipoles. And uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, Sebastian Jager and Kirsty Leslie. So let me start with an introduction, and then I'm going to move to a discussion of four Fermat operators, which is uh, the main concern of this talking here. And then I'm going to conclude. Okay, so the idea here is to study this Lagrangian in here, and that this Lagrangian, the dipole Lagrangian, encodes a rich variety of uh, different uh, processes and the properties of uh, fundamental particles, such as electromagnetic form factors, magnetic uh, dipole moments and electric dipole moments, uh, but also flavor transitions um, in both the quark and the, the lepton sectors. And uh, the same Lagrangian can be uh, used to probe the structure of the standard model, but also of new physics and therefore attest their structures of flavor, including CP violation in the quark and lepton sectors. And uh, to give an idea of the uh, reach to new physics scales, here I show some bounds that can be derived thanks to measurements on electron uh, EDM, on mu gamma and the neutron EDM. And as you can see in these uh, all three cases, we probe very high energy scales, much above uh, the TV scale. And uh, in this uh, conference in here, the topics of uh, lepton flavor violation and uh, CP violation, uh, including uh, EDM are very important. So there are plenty of uh, different sessions uh, that uh, discuss uh, uh, dipole uh, processes and transitions. Okay, so the going here is going to be probing new physics and uh, the framework of new physics I'm going to discuss is the is math. So we have uh, the basic assumption in here is that there is no uh, new degree of freedom up to a uh, very high energy scale, much above the electric scale. And that this is motivated by the fact that so far we have not seen any light uh, particle beyond the ones of the standard model. So at low energies, uh, these new physics interactions among uh, different uh, particles of the standard model, if these interactions preserve the symmetries of the standard model, can be uh, modeled by effective operators. And uh, these operators in here, uh, uh, the Qs in here, they preserve the symmetries of the standard model. And the, the Cs, the Wilson coefficients, they contain information about this uh, very heavy uh, new physics sector. And uh, so we have a basis for uh, these operators. I'm going to focus on operators of dimension six. One of the main operators of my talk is going to be a uh, this class in here of the Varsal basis. 
and uh, this set of operators of this class leads to uh, contributions to the dipole operator already at uh, three level. Another important category of operators in my talk is going to be at uh, this category in here. So uh, contact interactions among uh, four uh, possibly different uh, fermions. And uh, by studying uh, the dipole, by studying dipole transitions and the uh, 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 properties encoded in, in uh, the dipole Lagrangian, we can probe uh, the Wilson coefficients of non dipole operators. And that this is due to the mixing of a different uh, of operators of different uh, classes. So uh, the mixing of operators, non dipole operators into uh, dipole operators is illustrated here for uh, four different uh, classes of operators. And uh, as you can see here, uh, even if these effects are generated radiatively, we can still set very important bounds on the corresponding Wilson coefficients. Now, uh, there are plenty of elements of this anomalous dimension matrix uh, that is represented in here that vanish at one loop. And uh, the goal of this talk in here is going to be to discuss some cases in which uh, this uh, anomalous dimension matrix vanishes at one loop, but is generated radiatively at uh, two loops. And uh, then I'm going to discuss the phenomenological implications of having a non-vanishing two loop uh, leading order anomalous dimension matrix. Okay, so let me then uh, discuss four feminine operators. And we have uh, among the operators of dimension six, plenty of uh, different uh, uh, four fermion operators, which involve uh, different chiralities of the uh, fermions. So in the case of uh, these operators in here, the mix into dipoles shows up at one loop. So this is the case for the triplets in here, but also for the singlets in here, which mix into the uh, triplet at one loop and the triplet mixes into the dipole at one loop. Uh, then we have these uh, two categories of operators in here that can lead to enhance the mixing to uh, into dipoles. And that this is due to the possibility of having diagrams like this uh, one in here, where the internal flavor can be much heavier than the external legs. I'm going to come back to this point in the next slide. Uh, then we have these other operators in here, which cannot lead to diagrams like those in here. Uh, they can mix into the dipole uh, uh, through uh, diagrams like those in here. And uh, as you can see, this mixing is proportional to uh, the uh, flavor, to the Yukawa coupling of the external fermions. And uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, this possibility in here because it's very much suppressed when the external flavors are light. So in the following slides, I'm going to uh, show the results for the anomalous dimension matrix elements for uh, these operators in here. So some preliminary results on that. And while uh, the uh, determination of the anomalous dimension matrix elements for these operators in here is still ongoing. So as I said before, we can have uh, some enhancement factors. I mentioned this uh, Yukawa enhancement in here. For instance, we could have uh, mu and E as external flavors and the top as internal flavor. But we can also have other kinds of enhancement, such as in the case of having uh, four quarks, we can have strong couplings. And uh, in general, we can also have large uh, color uh, group enhancements, uh, group factor enhancements. And uh, in a certain way, diagrams like those in here, they are analogous to a bar Z kinds of diagrams, which are a uh, large two loop contributions that we have in some uh, BSM uh, models. Uh, the uh, scheme I have used in order to uh, do the renormalization is off shell. And uh, in the following slides, I'm going to discuss some uh, preliminary bounds that can be derived thanks to uh, the calculation of uh, some uh, two loop anomalous dimension matrix elements. So to start, let me discuss CP violation and uh, quark dipoles. And then we have uh, these operators in here that can be enhanced by uh, the call of the top. 
this is the RGE and uh, these uh, different uh, gamma interests in here represent the anomalous dimension matrix elements which depend on the external gauge boson being involved and also on the internal gauge boson uh, the different uh, possibilities being represented by the columns and the lines in here in this table. So in the case of having an external gluon, we we'll talk about uh, chromomagnetic dipolar moments, which is going to be important in the uh, next slide. And uh, for EVMs, we have a combination of uh, these two columns in here, the one for the B and the one for the W. Okay, so then by solving the RG equations, we end up with uh, these solutions in here for the EVM and the, for the chromomagnetic dipole moment, which is important in the discussion since it leads to CP violation through this uh, low energy coupling here. So as I mentioned before, there are some uh, enhancements such as uh, the call of the top, but it can also have enhancements uh, due to the strong coupling. And moreover, we can also have uh, large uh, group factor enhancements. So these correspond to these uh, large uh, numerical prefactors. And uh, thanks to this equation in here, uh, to this mixing to the dipoles, we can therefore set a very important bounds on the corresponding Wilson coefficients, which are given in this table in here. So in terms of a new physics scale, you can see that we are probing very high energy scales much above uh, uh, the reach of uh, direct searches in collider physics. So a similar discussion also applies to this second example in here that I would like to discuss concerning uh, charged lepton dipoles. And uh, here I would like to uh, discuss electron EVMs and the mutual gamma transitions. In this case, we can have uh, these uh, two operators in here that can lead to enhance the contributions so uh, in the two cases I mentioned in here, uh, the external flavors are mu or E, and uh, the internal flavor in here can be a button or a tau. So a D cow is much uh, larger than the U cows of the external flavors. And uh, then we have the similar discussion as before. We have the RG equations. We must determine uh, the anomalous dimension matrix elements involved. These are the uh, results I have obtained and then by solving the RGEs we have uh, this uh, solution in here where we can uh, where I stress the uh, possible enhancement by the internal Yukawas and uh, based on this expression we can then uh, set a bounds on the uh, non-dipolar Wilson coefficients as you can see the bounds in here probe a very high energy scales uh, in both the electron EDM case and also the mu gamma case for this uh, purely leptonic case. In the case of having this same leptonic operator, in fact, uh, the main bound does not come from the uh, two loop mixing I have been discussing, but it comes in fact from the uh, one loop mixing of this operator in here into other uh, four feminine operators, which leads to a better bound uh, due to uh, constraints that we have on neutral gamma conversion in nuclei. Okay, so in this table in here, I summarize the different uh, bounds uh, I have discussed in the previous slides. I'm still extending this work to other observables and also to other uh, different operators for Fermi operators. Uh, but uh, for the time being, what we can say is that uh, the scales of new physics that we can probe are very high. Okay, so uh, this brings me to my conclusions. So I have discussed dipoles. More specifically, I have discussed how we can use them in order to probe new physics. And uh, thanks to studying EDMs and uh, uh, mutual gamma transitions. Uh, those are the examples I have discussed in my slides. Uh, but in general, we can see uh, dipoles as a generic tool in order to uh, improve our understanding of flavor and CP violation, not only in the standard model, but also beyond. Uh, in order to address new physics, I have discussed uh, math, which uh, provides a systematic approach to uh, deal with new, very heavy new physics above the electric scale. I showed some results on uh, leading order to loop uh, mixing effects of non-dipole operators into dipole operators. And uh, as you have seen, uh, present measurements, experimental measurements set uh, 
important bounds on uh, non-dipole operators and uh, certainly uh, future data is going to probe even uh, higher energy scales. So that's it. Uh, many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Luis, for this very uh, interesting talk. Um, we do have time for some questions if somebody uh, has their curiosity piqued by this presentation. In the, in the coming talks, we'll be hearing the, the experimental situation from the mu three gamma uh, experiment. So that will be a nice dovetail into the experiment. So um, of course, once again, if you don't have a question right now, but something strikes you, please uh, follow up in the, the Mattermost chat and uh, include a question that we can have discussion offline. But last chance for a question to Louise. No, it seems it was very clear. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll, we'll move on to the next presentation, um, which as, as advertised will be uh, uh, the, the MEG2 experiments and searches for Remu under case from Kei Yeki. Can you see my slide? Okay. We we can. Yes. Uh, we see your slides. We see you. And uh, please okay. uh, get started whenever you're ready. Thank you. So I will tell you about the uh, rare muon decay search in the MEG2 experiment. I'm Kei Yeki from University of Tokyo. So um, in MEG2 experiment, we are going to search for mu2 gamma decay. This is a lepton flavor violating decay. And uh, this decay mode is interesting because this is a very good probe of uh, new physics. Now, um, for example, Sushi CISO model predicts relatively high branching ratio of this decay. Um, this plot shows, uh, this yellow region shows uh, um, branching ratio predicted by BSM models. And uh, this point is uh, upper limit given by the MEG experiment. And now in MEG2, we would like to go further beyond. As you know, the flavor violation is already observed in neutrinos. So there is no fundamental rule which prohibits a flavor violation. So uh, why not for charged leptons? Um, another interesting thing which uh, maybe I should notice is that um, I should note is that um, there's a correlation between G minus two, muon G minus two and mu gamma. For example, this is a plot uh, shown in this paper. Uh, in Suji, the branching ratio of uh, mu gamma is correlated with uh, um, mu on G minus two. And uh, this part is already, this upper part is already excluded by the mega experiment. And uh, one more thing uh, is uh, there's also other golden modes that can be used for model discrimination. For example, this is a uh, mu to E conversion, and this is a uh, mu to three E. And uh, the, these modes are also interesting because um, they have different sensitivity to different model. So these uh, decay modes are going to be explored by these experiments. And we will hear more about uh, this uh, mu to E conversion uh, in the talks after, my, after mine. So from here, I would like to explain you about the experiment uh, of MEG2. Our goal is to find uh, mu gamma, to search mu gamma with uh, 10 times better sensitivity than MEG. And this, is, uh, this becomes possible by using world's highest intensity continuous muon beam at PSI. This is a PSI proton synchro uh, cyclotron producing the muon beam. And in MEG, uh, in MEG2, we are going to have 2.3 times uh, more uh, intense muon beam than MEG. Now, uh, our enemy is the background. And this background increases as we increase the beam rate. So in order to have a better sensitivity, we need to have better detector resolution. 
So we need to improve the resolution by a factor of two for energy and timing and direction. Um, let me explain a bit more about signal and background. Uh, signal is shown here. It is a simple two-body decay. The energy of E and gamma is uh, half of the muon mass, and they are emitted in same timing and back-to-back. -back. On the other hand, the background is the accidental coincidence of gamma and uh, posteron, and they have different uh, energy and different kinematics, so we can distinguish them by measuring the energy and timing and position with very good resolution. So um, in MEG2, we upgraded the detector. Um, these cartoons show the apparatus in MEG and MEG2. As you can see, the overall picture is uh, not changed, but uh, all of the detectors are upgraded in MEG2. So let me explain them one by one. This is this yellow part is a postron drift chamber, and uh, we used to have uh, 16 modules in MEG, and now we have a single volume cylindrical chamber. And for both of them, uh, the common things are shown are written here. They measure the positron momentum and direction, and the as I said, uh, the resolution is important, and the resolution of postron is limited by multiple scattering. So it is uh, important to have extremely low mass material. So these are the these are designed like that. And another in important thing is the uh, the existence of a high rate background at the uh, low momentum. And we use a special gradient P field magnet to uh, avoid many low momentum positron hitting the detector. So the, such parts are common in MEG and MEG2. For MEG2, we use this uh, new drift chamber. This is a cylindrical stereo wire chamber. And as I said, uh, the unique thing is a low mass because we would like to reduce the multiple scattering as much as possible. <laughs> so we use uh, helium-based gas and uh, very thin wires. Now in MEG2, we have uh, many wires and uh, the number of hits is increased. So this results in good resolution. And uh, previously we had the readout electronics at the end of the drift chamber. And this was the cause of uh, efficiency loss because it, the postrons sometimes hit the electronics. But now those electronics are moved at the very end of the drift chamber. So we expect the efficiency to improve by a factor of two. This uh, post, uh, resolution and efficiency are not proved yet, but we started to see some signal. Now moving on to the uh, timing counter, which measures the timing of posteron. For both MEG and MEG2, we use uh, fast plastic scintillators, but now in MEG2, we have uh, much more counters. This is a photo of a uh, posteron timing counter. By having uh, much more channels, we can increase the number of hits per posteron. So this means that we can have many timing measurements for each track. So we can improve the resolution by taking the average of the timing. This uh, 40 picosecond resolution is already uh, achieved in the mule beam uh, pilot run. For each of the counters, um, it looks like this, and uh, there are many silicon PMs connected on both sides to have a higher light yield. They are not read out uh, for all of them. Um, we connect them in series and then read out uh, as a batch. <laughs> By series connection, uh, we can have shorter waveform compared to the parallel connection, which is good in terms of uh, timing resolution. Now, uh, moving on to the gamma ray side, we have a liquid xenon detector, both in MEG and MEG2. This is uh, uh, one of the most largest uh, liquid xenon detector, and it measures the energy and timing and position of the gamma ray. In MEG, uh, we used to have uh, PMTs, two inch PMTs for all of the, 
phases. But now for the entrance phase, we replaced the BMT with a smaller one, a smaller MPPC, 4,000 of uh, those. This is a photo of the uh, constructed detector, the inside of the detector. As you can see uh, here at the inner phase, we use uh, MBPC, the silicon PMs, and uh, here it's a PMT. And around here, where we use the uh, silicon PM, we can have much better um, granularity, so we can have a much factor two improved uh, position resolution. And also, uh, another important thing is the energy resolution, which is also improved because the uniformity of the coverage is uh, much better in with this configuration. I mean, the light collection efficiency does not fluctuate so much depending on the position or the shape of the electromagnetic shower made of made from gamma, made by gamma. But this uh, resolution, improved resolution, needs to be proved. Finally, um, this is the last detector, which is newly added in MEG2. This is a detector for tagging background gamma coming from the radiative decay of mu. So this is one of the largest, uh, most important source of background gamma. And when, when there's uh, energy when the gamma energy is close to 52.8 MeV signal energy, a signal gamma energy, there must be another positron emitted at the same time in case of background. So this positron may go either downstream or upstream, but when it goes to downstream, this detector can identify, uh, detect this positron and uh, identify this background by looking at the uh, time coincidence between the gamma and the positron. So uh, this detector is already constructed and it's already demonstrated the background identification performance. Um, finally, uh, a little bit more about the trigger and DAQ. For IMEC2, we also upgraded the DAQ system. We read out all of the channels uh, the waveform of all of the channels with the DRS chip developed at PSI. Previously, uh, in, uh, previously, we had to divide the signal into two and uh, insert it, use it for trigger and for signal. But now the trigger is uh, in MEG2, the trigger is integrated in a same system. So this way we were able, we successfully reduced the rack space and uh, we can have a sophisticated trigger. Uh, another new thing is the amplifier and shaper and high voltage supply uh, in, in the board. This is uh, necessary because we use silicon PMs, many silicon PMs for uh, EMEG2. So far, we only had a limited number of readout channels, but the, the mass production is uh, going to take place this year. So we hope to have a full channel soon. Okay, um, let me tell you about the uh, status in 2020. For the overall status, um, the detector construction is already finished. So we are doing commissioning. The timing counter and the background tagging detector are already um, ready for the physics run. They are tested and they already show good performance. For the drift chamber and the liquid xenon detector, we still need some commissioning. Drift chamber, <clears throat> we successfully, oh no, we used to have some wire broking, breaking problem due to corrosion, but uh, last year we successfully removed broken and potentially bad wires. But we also found some anomalous current problem, and this is this seems to be caused by some corona discharge around uh, the wires but the reason is uh, under investigation. For the liquid xenon detector, we found another problem. We found that the photon detection efficiency is uh, being reduced during the beam run. This is likely due to surface damage by POB photons. And however, we found that annealing is effective to recover this. So this is not a critical problem. Now, uh, in the end of this year, we are going to 
we would like to have established the stable operation of the chamber. And we also want to test the liquid xenon detector with 55 MeV, MeV gamma to uh, demonstrate the performance of the liquid xenon detector. So let me summarize. Um, MeV gamma is very good probe for new physics and uh, the detectors are already constructed and commissioning is ongoing. And as soon as commissioning is run, finish, we hope to start the physics run soon. Um, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, impressive and very clear talk. Um, we have time for some couple of questions. I see a hand raised already. Um, please go ahead with your question, uh, Siddhartha. Uh, hello. So, Hi. Uh, it's, yeah, so in the MEG1 uh, experiment, uh, can you say a little bit about the result? Like, uh, was it able to observe the mu 2 e gamma uh, decay? No, we just uh, gave an upper limit because we didn't observe mu e gamma. Okay. So this, this gives the current uh, best limit on mu e gamma decay. OK, thank you. I, and could you comment to, to what level the, the, the improvements in MEG2 are, are going to um, improve the, the limits over, over just the statistics? Just the statistics. Okay, so the, the improvement in sensitivity is a factor of 10. That, that's what yeah, factor of 10, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for another quick question or comment. Um, if not, then we'll thank you again and look forward to some exciting new results from MEG2 in the near future. And we can move on, thank you, to the, the next presentation, um, which is uh, about the Comet experiment from Hajime Nishiguchi. Okay, uh, so let me share my screen. Do you see now? Uh, Yes, we see you and we see the slides. So please, okay. you can yep. start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, greetings from Japan. So this is Hajime Nishiguchi uh, from KK and J Park. So in this presentation, I would like to uh, talk about the comet experiment, which is searching for a mu one to electron conversion, uh, similar with mu gamma at J Park. OK, so uh, this is the contents of my presentation. So uh, at first, uh, let me quickly summarize the physics motivation for this experiment and also the overview of the comet experiment. And then uh, I will uh, talk about the current status of the comet construction, especially the proton beam line and the pi and muon transport line and the detectors. And uh, uh, actually, one of the most important recent topic is the accelerator test, which is dedicated for the uh, comet experiment. So I will explain this one right now. Okay, so the concerning the uh, physics motivation, but it was already uh, nicely introduced by the previous speaker. So I just keep almost all. Uh, let me stress one thing. The, uh, as he said last time, the charge lepton flavor violation, it's uh, very attractive to explore the new physics beyond the standard model, especially uh, the mu one is uh, best probe to search for that. For example, the mu gamma and the mu conversion and uh, uh, to 3e. And uh, now we are searching for mu gamma, uh, so mu conversion. And what is mu conversion? So uh, this is uh, the, mu, the schematic view of the mu conversion. And uh, actually, uh, the, if the negative, the negative muon is actually the, can be the captured by the nucleus very uh, easily. And then the muonic atom is formed. And if the muonic conversion would occur uh, inside the muonic atom, then the muon would transit to electron coherently without changing anything on the nucleus. So uh, this is the muonic conversion. So the signal of muonic conversion is single and monochromatic uh, electron. For example, if the aluminum is employed as a muonic atom target, then the 105 MeV is muonic, uh, uh, the muon conver muonic conversion signal. Okay, and uh, actually, uh, 
Megatree experiment is searching for mu gamma, and we are searching for mu conversion, and they are very similar and the so-called twin processes, but there is um, big differences from points of view of physics and also the experiment. And so I would stress uh, one thing here, the searching for both process is very important. Uh, because for example, uh, as the previous speaker noticed, the sensitivity for uh, physics, uh, the process is different. For example, the mu gamma is sensitive for photonic process, but not so sensitive for non-photonic. But the mu conversion is sensitive for both processes. So I would say it's very powerful to, to probe uh, the properties of the new physics when the signal is discovered. Uh, on the other hand, the, the way to uh, find the signal is also different. For example, to search for mu gamma, a signal is the coincidence between the electron and the gamma. So the background is dominated by accidental overlap. So uh, in order to suppress such an accidental overlap, the DC beam is suitable. That's why the mega 2 is running at the PSI. On the other hand, for the mu conversion search, uh, the signal is single mono. Uh, mono Monoenergetic electron, so the background is dominated by the uh, beam related one. So, challenge is beam quality. So, the palace beam is the best uh, to search for mu conversion, for example, JPEG or Fermilab. Okay, so in order to suppress this the beam related background, uh, actually, the beam extin extinction is essential. So, this is a schematic picture of the beam timing. Uh, this is the, the gray sharp distribution, it uh, stands for the main proton bunches. So the, and after that, the uh, so-called prompt background would follow. This is mainly caused by the pion reaction. And if uh, the aluminum is employed as the Munich atom target, then a Munich aluminum has a lifetime of approximately one microsecond. So to have uh, long enough uh, bunch separation for the proton bunch, uh, I mean, uh, longer than one microsecond, then to have the uh, delayed uh, DAQ time window right before the next proton bunch, like this uh, DAQ window, then we can perform the uh, so called background free experiment. But if uh, some proton is leaked from the main bunch to somewhere uh, in between uh, this bunch region, then the, such an leaked proton can be very severe background to such form of conversion. So this is called extinction. So extinction is uh, the ratio uh, between the number of uh, leaked protons in between the bunches and number of filled protons in the main bunches. And this extinction factor is required to be better than 10 to the minus 10 at least uh, in order to achieve the comet core. Uh, our target core uh, sensitivity is 10 to the minus 17. Uh, this can almost uh, fully cover the theoretical predicted region. Okay, so this is the target sensitivity of 10 to the minus 17 of a comet experiment. It's enabled by four features. So the first feature is uh, we are using the high intensity pulsed proton beam, uh, which is provided by the JPEG uh, main link proton synchrotron. And then the, uh, this proton would produce the high yield pion. This, this the produced pion, it's uh, captured by a second uh, feature, this high efficiency, the five tesla solenoidal pion capture system. Then this uh, captured pion is transported by uh, this the third feature, the very long and curved solenoidal pion and muon transport section. So by using this long and curved solenoid section, uh, we can perform the background elimination very effectively. Then the last feature, fourth feature, the high resolution and vacuum compatible electron spectrometer. So this detector system can enable uh, the, enables us to perform the high sensitivity in the conversion such experiment. And this uh, comet experiment is designed to be uh, enabled by two staged approach. So the first stage uh, is called the comet phase one. Uh, in this comet phase one, we will construct the first uh, first uh, ninety degree uh, bending. Then place the detector system at the exit of uh, transport, like this picture. Then uh, we can. Uh, perform these two measurements. One is the direct beam measurement uh, to understand the background beam situation. And even for phase one, we can perform the mu conversion search experiment with an intermediate sensitivity of 10 to the minus 15. This is phase one. And after that, we will construct the complete, the all the remaining transport part, then perform the mu conversion search experiment with a full sensitivity of 10 to the minus 17. Okay, uh, as I said, in phase one, uh, we will perform the two measurements. The one is the beam measurement, the other one is mu conversion search experiment. So to search for mu conversion, we employed the 
a cylindrical detector system called SIDET. So this uh, consists of the cylindrical drift chamber and the cylindrical trigger hotoscope. Uh, because uh, you see, in the phase one, the transport of solenoid is not long enough. So the background pion is still remained even in the detector section. So in order to have a background tolerance, uh, such an uh, how to say, the hollow uh, cylinder design is employed. Uh, for the beam measurement, in order to measure all delivered beam, including background, uh, vacuum compatible tracker and calorimeter is improved. So this is called the streaker, the store tracker and e -car. So the vacuum com compatible tracker is uh, enabled by the prana and low mass and straw tracking detector. And for the e -car, the LYSO crystal, the high resolution and the high density uh, scintillation crystal is employed. And actually this uh, detector concept is same as phase two detector concept. So I would say uh, for the phase one is three car detector would be uh, kind of the real prototype of the phase two detector. Okay, so from now on, let me uh, quickly summarize the current status. So the first one is fast facility construction. So this is the uh, picture of the uh, part of the main link synchrotron of JPAC, and this is the, the proton transport line to the Hadron experimental facility. So we have the three uh, proton the transport line, A line, B line, C line, and A line uh, is kind of the primary line and it's already in operation. And for the B line, uh, this one's just completed recently and uh, in operation in, uh, uh, from this June. And the C line, so this is dedicated for Comet to transport the proton to Comet experimental hall. So this, the C line construction I just started. And actually the upstream part of the C line uh, is shared with the B line. So it's already completed and uh, in operation. Okay, so inside the Comet Hall, the Pion and the Muon transport, uh, this uh, system is under construction and the transport solenoid is already completed. And uh, other components, I mean, the Pion capture system and the detector solenoid, et cetera, uh, under construction. So this is a snapshot of the uh, latest situation in the experimental hall. So as I said, the proton beam line dedicated for Comet, uh, namely C line, is under construction and it's expected to be completed in uh, next year, 2021. And the first beam, uh, I mean, a, a first proton beam will be delivered to Comet Hall in 2022. And concerning the pion capture solenoid, so the all uh, coils were already fabricated and so the magnet construction is ongoing and it's expected to be uh, completed in 2022. Okay, so the one of the most important recent topic is dedicated 8GB operational test for the accelerator. So actually, uh, you see here, the main link synchrotron is running at 30 GB uh, usually, but uh, instead of that, the, for the comet experiment, we need to uh, operate it on the 8 GB in order to suppress the anti-proton background uh, production. So uh, this means we need a special operation for the main link synchrotron. Then we decided to have such a dedicated operation test. So during that test, uh, operational chain, I mean the injection, acceleration, extraction, everything was successfully established. And also during that test, we also performed the extinction measurement inside the synchrotron and also the, in the secondary beam line. And inside the synchrotron, the excellent, very, very excellent extinction uh, of 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 11 was confirmed, uh, while the comet experiment required the 10 to the minus 10 extinction uh, at least. And, but on the other hand, in the secondary beam, uh, we observed the small leakage in the last RF packet. But even for that, uh, this is equivalent to the one times 10 to the minus 10 extinction. This is just matched with our requirement. But uh, actually, during this measurement, uh, we also found the way to improve the extinction and also to sub to suppress this small leakage. So now next test is under preparation to verify this method. And the proposal to perform this next test is already submitted. And I had this is uh, already approved. Okay, so concerning the detector construction, so the, uh, as I said, for the phase one, the, we 
we perform the two measurements, the beam measurement and the mu conversion search experiment. So the, for the mu conversion search experiment, so the uh, cylindrical drift chamber was already completed and it's now uh, under commissioning with cosmic ray. So this is the event display of the cosmic ray track. And the, concerning the street car detector, so this is a picture of the street track assembly for the first station and the five station will be uh, constructed in total. And concerning the e-car, so the prostat uh, was successfully completed, so detector assembly will start soon. So schedule, uh, as I said, the, for the facility and the dedicated proton beam line C-line, uh, construction is ongoing, and it's uh, expected to be uh, completed in the next year, 2021, and the first beam is expected in the 2022. And the transport line, pion mion transport line, and the detector solar line, the pion capture solar, and everything will be ready in early 2023. And concerning the detector construction, so the cylindrical drift chamber was already completed and it's uh, under commissioning. So the trigger hotoscope construction will follow. And the streetcar, uh, street truck first station is under construction and uh, all five stations will be completed by 2022. And ECAR, so the detector assembly will start soon and all the detector will be ready by the end of 2022. And concerning the accelerator, uh, as I said, the dedicated HGB operation test was uh, conducted successfully and the good enough extinction was confirmed. This is a very big milestone for us. And during that test, we also found the way to improve the extinction more. So the next test to verify this uh, extinction improvement is under preparation and the proposal was already submitted. So uh, as soon as uh, sea line and the radiation seal will be completed, it's expected in 2022, uh, proton beam commissioning will start and it will be followed by the engineering and also the physics run of the comet phase one. Okay, I think this is just a summary. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for this uh, very clear talk. Um, uh, there's time for maybe a quick comment or question if somebody has one. Maybe a quick question from me then. Um, so re regarding the schedule um, for Comet phase one, when would you predict first uh, physics results to come out um, from, physics from phase one? You mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to answer. The physics data taking, I, I would say physics data taking can be started in 2023, but uh, it's very difficult to expect when we can have a faster result. Okay. But 2023, we'll start taking data and then uh, yeah. hopefully yeah. some sometime in the, the, the coming years after this, we'll, we'll be seeing first results. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Very, yes. very exciting. Okay, uh, so in the interest of time, I think we should move on. But if there are additional questions or comments to, to ask the speaker on this nice talk, I suggest to follow up on the Mattermost or post them in the chat window here. Um, and thank you again very much for this clear presentation. And We'll move on to the, the next and I think final talk before the coffee break. Uh, Masuro Aoki telling us about Gimi. So, uh, um, yes, uh, let me see. Very nice. We, we see can your you... slides and we can see you as well. So, um, whenever you're ready, please start. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Well, yet another MUE conversion experiment uh, using the uh, uh, Unique atoms produced in a primary proton target. This is the uh, collaboration list, uh, mostly from uh, uh, Osaka uh, City University, Osaka University, and the KKIMSS groups. <clears throat> and the triumph. Now, let me just quickly skip through the introduction because uh, uh, there I'm, are two. I'm sorry, I, I just to oh. interject, I, I don't see the slides moving forward. So, could you just check? Oh, really? Uh, maybe it's just me. Is it moving? Uh, no, I, I also do not see moving slides. Just the, the, the introductory yeah. all the time. I still see the first slide. Oh, let's see what's wrong. Let me let me just check. Uh, let me just move to the full screen. Is that moving? So we now see slide three. Could you just try and move forward or back? Page two. I, I, I don't see them change. Three. So, so, so maybe just uh, stay out of full screen just, like this. Yep. And we can. Continue. Okay. I'm sorry. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah, this no is problem. just. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Mark related issues. Okay, uh, let me just quickly go through the, uh, I mean, just quickly uh, 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 go through the physics uh, introduction because there are, there are two good talks. Uh, the, uh, we are going to look for is a muy convergent nuclear field uh, in which uh, if you uh, uh, put the mu minus in the material, it's uh, quickly trapped in the nucleus and you have two uh, processes for this mu minus in the standard model. Uh, one is a muon capture process, the other is muon decay in orbit. Uh, because of the uh, existence of this muon capture process, uh, compared to the uh, lifetime of free space of mu minus, which is 2.2 microsecond, actually if mu minus is in the carbon, lifetime is only two microseconds. And if there is anything uh, physics related to beyond the standard model, then we might see mu minus just interact with the nuclei, nucleus and change to the electron without any uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, relation to the neutrino emission. And this is so-called the mu conversion in nuclear field that we are trying to search for. And this is uh, 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 clearly uh, forbidden in the standard model particle physics. So it's clear evidence of the new physics. Now, the uh, 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 Hajime uh, gave a very good uh, uh, talk relation between, uh, not Hajime, the speaker in the MEG2 also, give the differences of the physics uh, sensitivity between photonic and non photonic process. So I just uh, skipped this one. But anyway, the MUI conversion is uh, 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 very uh, 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 good to search for, in addition to MUI gamma and uh, many other related uh, charge electron flavor processes. The, uh, Principle of measurement is something like this. The process that we are looking for is mu minus interact with the nuclei, nucleus and the emit electron. So uh, there is a single mono energetic electron at 105 MeV emerging out of the uh, delayed timing around one microsecond. And there is no accidental background. So uh, you just have to measure uh, electron. There are two uh, major uh, physics background that uh, we are afraid of. One is so-called decay in orbit. Uh, this uh, right-hand plot is actually, I took it from the syndrome two, the last experiment with gold target. Uh, this blue uh, uh, circle with the LR bar is the experimental result showing the uh, high energy tail of the decay in orbit, uh, trying to sneak in underneath the signal region. So we need to have the good momentum resolution to the electron to distinguish this decay in orbit background from the signal. The second one is so-called beam pion capture background. Uh, this can be uh, controlled by using the pulse proton beam and using the uh, uh, beam timing, uh, event timing. So uh, these two things we have to be careful. And these are the recent upper limits uh, for the gold target and the titanium, uh, and, and, uh, titanium target. So in order to improve these uh, upper limits, we, we need to have the high intensity muon beam for high energy, high statistics. So this is a very typical uh, flagship uh, 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 advanced experiment such as MU2E and the Comet, uh, utilizing the uh, very long superconducting uh, solenoid magnet, trying to achieve uh, 10 to minus 17th level of a very huge jump of the uh, uh, experimental uh, sensitivity, uh, which is very uh, advanced experiments. And the DME, on the other hand, is based on a very simple idea and the total different systematics, just uh, trying to squeeze this uh, huge uh, uh, front end part into a single slab of the material, which is actually the primary proton target. Uh, in which a proton uh, hit the target, then you might have the pi minus produced and the pi minus might be uh, in flight to decay to mu minus, and this mu minus might stop in the target itself. Then if there is any mu conversion happens, then we might see mono energetic electron in the delayed timing emerging out of the proton target. That is the uh, uh, basic idea of the DME experiment. So this illustrate uh, the, what I just told you. Uh, we can expect uh, electron emerging out of the proton target, a uh, uh, primary proton target, by using uh, uh, a secondary beam line. Uh, we can just extract to the high energy end 
of the expected momentum and just measure the uh, momentum by using magnetic spectrometer. So DME project is uh, under running under the KK IMSS uh, S1A type project. The currently approved to run with graphite target to achieve uh, 10 to minus 13 the single event sensitivity. The detectors are already uh, uh, basically they have already developed and uh, we are waiting for the uh, completion of the beam line, which is H line, we call it in the JPAC MLF. Uh, this 3D uh, uh, figure produced by the G4 beam line show the whole detector setup, including beam line, starting from the production target. And we have a secondary beam line. This is generic beam line. And at the very end of the beam line, we have a, a magnet and the chambers, a truck tracking chambers to measure the electron momentum. So the beam line we are going to use is H line, uh, which this is the very busy layout, but the real uh, drawing of the layout of the H line. And this is a zoom up uh, uh, around the experimental area. The, the acceptance of this H line is very large, which is more than 100 millistrajion. And this is very general purpose beam line. So uh, any other experiment can use this beam line after the DME finished. And the uh, H1 area is also can time share with other group and which is under construction and uh, aiming to have the first beam uh, uh, hopefully within this fis Japanese fiscal year. So this is a photo of the construction of the H line. You have a dipole magnet and uh, uh, focusing uh, uh, solenoid uh, actual focusing elements and uh, so on. And here is H1 area. As for the detector, uh, we've already finished the basic uh, development of the detector system, which is, uh, 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 well, a kind of state of the art, uh, slightly different style of multi-wire proportional chamber. Here as shown here, this is the, uh, this illustrate the time uh, structure of uh, the particle hitting through our detector. We have two very huge pulse of the child particle uh, produced by the uh, uh, primary proton uh, pulse. Then after that, we have to detect the delayed uh, uh, particles produced by the muon decay or mu conversion. Uh, during this time, the chamber has to be turned off. So in order to achieve we have very special structure of the MRL PC in which the anode wire and the potential wires are strung each other. And by changing the uh, voltage to the potential wire, we can dynamically switch the gas gain of the system from order one to order uh, force, force power of 10. And this chamber was already uh, developed with the uh, reading out the preamplifier and the recording of digital circuit. And we are borrowing the magnet for the spectrometer from Triumph. And we have performed the integration test of our detector system by using uh, a different magnet at the yet the small size of uh, our beam uh, our experimental area uh, by measuring the uh, decaying orbit spectrum around the medium momentum region. Uh, not 105 MeV, but just around 50 MeV over C, uh, limited by the uh, spec of this experimental area. So our main purpose is just that we used uh, the chambers we've developed and the DAQ. Uh, everything worked very well. And uh, recently we accumulated uh, much higher statistics. And uh, in the analysis, this is a little bit uh, uh, unique. So let me just explain. Uh, this waveform is the uh, waveform from the strip readout pad from the MWPC uh, showing the wavy baseline caused by the high voltage switching to the wire chamber. Uh, this time region chamber is off. Here on, then off. I mean gas again turned down to one. And only here, uh, we just subtract this stable wavy baseline to extract real heat. 
And this process was repeated in every 40 millisecond, uh, synchronized to the uh, primary proton pulse. So we might have uh, a few several different but real tracks in one image of such a, a snapshot. So by taking combination of all of strips information after subtracting the common noises, then uh, we can uh, safely uh, uh, extract the hit, uh, hit information and perform track fitting. And we can use the edge of the Michel spectrum for the momentum uh, uh, calibration. And also we can use the body part of the Michel spectrum to check the acceptance curve. So this is very preliminary uh, 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 DIO momentum spectrum at around the medium momentum region at around the Michel edge, but we can see the tail, not the sharp edge because of this is taken by with uh, mu minus. So uh, this is the current uh, status of the experiment. So uh, this is a summary. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is a uh, small size, simple experiment uh, is uh, under the uh, 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 preparation, uh, trying to uh, uh, maximize the potential of the major discovery at the JPARC. And uh, we are, uh, the beam line that we are going to use is a generic beam line so that we, it can be used for many other experiments. And we are hoping uh, uh, we'll have the beam line available soon and, uh, and just to quickly take the physics data, hopefully. That's all. Maybe just on time. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, thank you. Um, we have time maybe for a quick question or, or comment. Please uh, raise your hand or speak up. It's very clear. I, I think the the question I maybe had was was answered in your last bullet about uh, beam time conflicts with the other experiments. So I, I think you you just mentioned this that there's no there's no overlap with um with beam time for the other the other users of um of JPARC. Um, any other uh, quick final questions or comments to to Dimi, uh, the, the physics program, the, the experiment itself. Uh, I don't see any. Once again, another another clear talk. Thank you very much. Um, so that's thank you, very much. Uh, thank you. That brings us to the the end of this uh, first part of the session, and we have uh, a short coffee break now, um, and we'll resume. And I think it's it's seven minutes from now, so we, we have a, a short break to uh, to stretch our legs, and then we'll be we'll be resuming um, in seven minutes. So we'll see you soon. And if anyone wishes to follow up with the speakers on the Mattermost, please feel free to ask questions there as well. Thank uh, you. Hello. Hello. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I test my slides? I am after the coffee break. Yes, please do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we see the slides. Um, okay, I, I don't see them going into a full screen, but but maybe this is okay, as it is. Okay. It's fine. Uh, could you could you just try changing slides so we can? Yeah, no, I'm changing. Uh, I don't see them moving. I, I see a, a a a box to the right hand side with a, a selection of different file names in there. Oops. So the files don't seem to be moving. Or oh, the slides, excuse me, don't seem to be moving. Is it fine now? Uh, it hasn't changed for me. Oops. One second. You could try and make them full screen before sharing them. That, that is one method that seems to be helping some people. Okay.
Okay. Uh, now, can you see my slides? Much better, yes. And could you try just uh, changing slide just to be sure we can see this? Okay. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Ah, thank you. Uh, and we hear you well, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be also be changing the chair of the session for the, the next part after the coffee break. So um, thanks to all the speakers and people for keeping to time. And uh, Akimasa Ishikawa will be, will be taking over uh, again. Hi there, I would profit of the coffee break to try the slides, okay? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Is this for screen now? No. Okay, let me see. You can see your slides, but uh, it's not the full screen mode. Okay, let me try with this other one. Yes, we can see your okay. slides. And uh, can do you see that it changes the slides? Yes. Okay, very good. Then it's working perfectly. Thanks a lot. Okay, so it's time to resume the session. Hey guys, Mate. Hey, good morning. Good morning. So you should should see my slides right now. Okay. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. So good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Hudec. I'm from Charles University in Czech Republic. 
uh, these are names of the people I worked with on the projects I will be presenting. And I'll be talking about uh, how we confronted quark lepton unification with lepton flavor unidirectivity violation. So uh, first, let me start with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so first, very generally, uh, uh, during non-observation of new physics, uh, you uh, you can exclude only models uh, beyond the standard model extensions that are non-decoupling. While for the decoupling models, uh, usually only like the, the bounds on observables usually only bring bounds on parameter space of of the models. While uh, once new physics is hopefully sometime sometime observed. Mm. We will be able to exclude the models as a role, which means in all parts of the parameter space, which uh, I'm personally very pretty much keen on, and I find it interesting. So uh, during this uh, this talk, uh, I will not introduce lepton flavor by universal related violation in beam meson anomalies because I believe that, that in this session everyone is aware of the of it. So I will simply assume that. We know it, and I will, during the first ten minutes, I will hope that, uh, that I will hope that we uh, that some of those anomalies will be confirmed as physics we understand the model, and I will stand those anomalies uh, against uh, theory of minimal quark lepton unification, which is. Uh, very in, pretty much interesting and non-trivial thing because quark lepton unification predicts a lot of leptoquarks and as we all probably know and we could have seen it even in in this conference leptoquarks are um, very uh, useful or very convenient to this uh, to explain the beams and anomalies but it does, does not necessarily have to be the laptop quarks stemming from quark lepton unification. So this is the question. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, I will not be presenting tailor-made models uh, made for uh, explaining the beams and anomalies, but uh, models that were suggested before those uh, universality violation signals uh, were known and models which are nice because of their minimality and such properties. Uh, so the question is, uh, can we uh, explain B meson anomalies uh, in the language of minimal uh, quark lepton symmetry models? And if not, uh, then if we fail, it means that we have succeeded to exclude some nice model, which is, by the way, the only thing that science can do, right? Uh, just to... Uh, show that uh, the minimum SU models, SU4 models were, uh, um, were used even before. This is a sample list of some papers about those kinds of models. Uh, the last two are ours. Uh, and so what, what do we actually mean by minimal quark lepton unification? Oh, so we have three points. First point is uh, min the minimal extension of the standard model gauge group as you four times as you two times you one uh, this is the minimal extension which uh, enables quark lepton unification which means that uh, in the the, part, the old party salam idea of uh, supplementing three colors of lep of quarks with leptons and forming a tetraplets out of them the second notion of minimality means that we have no extra charge fermions, only standard model ones. Uh, on the other hand, we have right handed neutrinos there, and optionally, we can also add some extra singlet in order to in incorporate in their CISO mechanism. And the, the third notion of minimality of those models is the minimal scalar sector. Uh, so we introduce only those scalars that are needed in order to reproduce standard model in at low, at low energies. As you can see, uh, we didn't ask the model for laptop works, but anyway, uh, many of them appear even in, in the minimal model. Mm. Now let me say just some uh, few ge very general, uh, re general remarks about laptop works that are unrelated to quark lepton unification. So if I uh, 
write a sample laptop or interaction like this, then this is the interaction matrix. And if I want to in induce lepton flavor universality violation with let the laptop works, then I need that the, the columns of these metrics differ. On the other hand, uh, whenever there are two or more non-zero columns, uh, we also introduce lepton flavor violation processes such as mu to e gamma that we heard about, or k long to a mu, and so on and so on. So uh, usually, when one has no constraints on uh, on how to choose this interaction matrix, people usually put most of the elements to zero, but this is uh, not automatically possible in our case where the pattern in this matrix is dictated by the extended gauge symmetry. So what laptops do we have in our in our minimal model? So first we have to gauge laptop work U1. It's very well known to it's known to be very um, very convenient for this describe, uh, describing the Bemisen anomalies. Uh, however, uh, due to its gauge nature, uh, it, uh, its unit, uh, its interaction matrix must be, pro matrices might, must be proportional to unitary matrix, say similar to CKM or PMNS matrices. And if one takes this, uh, this constraint, uh, Seriously, one finds that uh, the lepton flavor violating uh, the constraints from lepton flavor violation are quite stringent. Usually, for a typical point, it's about 2000 TeV, and for a well fine tuned point, it's about 60 TeV. The lepton flavor violation is always there because unitarity tells you that all the columns must be equally populated. Mm. So you, we have no, with a gauge vector laptop work in the minimal model, you have no chance to uh, come or to explain the beamers on anomalies without getting in, into con conflict with other things. And we have the scalar uh, with quantum number three to one and one half, which is not very convenient for the description of uh, the beamers on anomalies, the current ones. And then there is a scalar R2 uh, with uh, quantum number three to one plus seven over six. It is usually used for uh, uh, for explaining RD, which, uh, however, doesn't work here, at least in the perturbative regime. Uh, but you can also do something with RK there. I will talk about it later, just uh, shortly. To um, one should uh, um, check that you can really uh, assume that this R2 laptop work is the lightest BSM field and the, the others are much heavier. So this check is done by investigating the scalar potential and one, one fight, finds out that it is really possible. So, and with this scalar laptop work, what can we do with that? Uh, so uh, in the uh, Extended gauge symmetry tells us that its interaction matrix cannot be chosen arbitrarily, but uh, must follow this pattern. It it's, uh, consists of combinations of uh, elements of the unitary mat mixing matrices uh, U and V that we know from the gauge, uh, or that I introduced in the, for the gauge laptop work. Uh, and those are combinated, combi combined uh, with uh, the Fermi, relevant fermion masses. It's similar to standard model Higgs, uh, the couplings of which are proportional to the relevant fermions. So, uh, as this uh, laptop work couples to right-handed uh, leptons, uh, it it doesn't uh, interfere, its contributions do not interfere with the standard model ones, and therefore, in order to get RK Rather than one, you need it. You need it to couple it with electrons, not with muons. Mm -hmm. We know that it's it's not the most preferred uh, scenario, but it still can somehow somewhat work. So, uh, furthermore, as I said uh, earlier, uh, the laptop work interactions generally introduce 
and or induced or lepto number violation like mutu e gamma and so on and so on in order to get rid of those uh, strange very strange constraints uh, what one needs to do is the following thing to set the the arbitrary mixing matrices such that you you get that uh, the laptop work does not uh, in does, does not talk with uh, muons at all and this is i believe really the only way how you can deal with it uh, to all orders of per perturbation theory so this is the pattern of uh, the interaction matrix of the laptop work which does not uh, violate muon number and can explain uh, RK with a little work mass about one and a half TeV. However, uh, there is still some, uh, something interesting in the tau sector as well. And combining those, uh, uh, those two elements leads to the following penguin, which, which then uh, is responsible for uh, neutrino as flavor, lepton flavor violating tau decays. And if one correlates those two processes, those decays and RK, we ended up with this picture. And in in this picture, uh, the, the, this this belt, uh, this pur purple triangle is what's, uh, what's allowed by our, our model. Uh, this uh, integral is what is the currently preferred value and the most important thing is that uh, during due to this triangle uh, it does not quite work because as you can see uh, it doesn't work uh, at least with such a large deviation of rk so what we uh, what we did was uh, we assumed that rk will get somewhat uh, closer to the standard model value and then we uh, made a lot of predictions you can find them in this paper so uh, just conclusions the minimal cochlear planification is incompatible with the current values of the b metals and anomalies while if the excess uh, in rk is, uh, is smaller they can be accommodated partially uh, we have a lot of predictions for bell 2 such as to e gamma, which will be a really good test of this model, and predictions for proton proton colliders, uh, you can find them there on or in our paper. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the second part, which is, however, was just one slide, so it doesn't matter. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Okay, so Luis. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Matei. Uh, can you go to slide eight, number eight? So you said, uh, it's okay. So you said that uh, couplings to muons would be uh, uh, prohibited at all orders in perturbation theory, right? Uh, is there a symmetry that uh, protects uh, these couplings? Yes, I mean, if, if you, if you, uh, uh, if neglecting uh, other contributions to muon number violation, like from the the, the other ex extra heavy fields and from uh, neutrino mixing and so on, if you consider a standard model and uh, this laptop work, then uh, muon number is simply uh, is simply conserved, perturbatively conserved uh, by a symmetry because there there is uh, no vertex which would violate it. Okay. Yes, me. Can you hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I was just wondering. Um, you were mentioning that you could have couplings with uh, with electrons uh, for explaining the right-handed part. I was wondering how the new result from LHCb uh, on K star EE at low Q square, if it has an impact on what on your model or not at all. Uh, actually, I uh, didn't think about it, but I I, I think it, it's uh, and it, it doesn't uh, 
prefer like this, this variant like, yes this is what i'm presenting is really simply the best one can do with this model and if if uh, it's yeah, I know it's it's not the best scenario you can fi find on archive or best or best fitting scenario. Uh, but, uh, I was just we were trying to do, do, do the best one can do in order to say yes, this model really doesn't work. So uh, yeah, uh, about LHCB, I think uh, it it is it goes against our predictions. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Let's move on to next talk by Carla. Uh, yeah, can you can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so let me also share my screen. I think you should be seeing it uh, by now. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so yeah, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present the, the last results uh, of LHCV on lepton universality test in electroweak penguins. Um, so electroweak penguins are flavor changing neutral currents, uh, which only occur at the loop level in the standard model, as you see here on the diagrams. And this makes them very sensitive uh, to the potential effects of new physics uh, that could affect branching fractions, angular distributions, among others. And the fact that uh, these are loop transitions also makes them, uh, allows us to access much larger new physics scales than, than direct searches, which is very useful uh, given uh, the absence of direct evidence for new states. So in fact, in the recent years, we have some intriguing deviations in, in rare BDKs, both in uh, differential branching fractions and angular distributions, uh, which were detailed yesterday uh, by David, but also in lepton universality test, as you see here on the right, where the standard model predicts a uh, value of one very precisely, and we see uh, systematically lower values both in, in RK here on the top and RK star on the bottom. So wh what are actually these lepton universality tests? So what we do here is that uh, we basically uh, try to, to check the property of the standard model that says that uh, leptons of different generations couple identically to the electroweak bosons. So this is what we call lepton universality. Now this has been experimentally confirmed in the first and second generation in the decays of, for example, phi or, or Jepsi mesons. At LHCB, we are measuring this in, uh, in BDKs and in particular what I focus here on is in B2SLL transitions. So we basically study the same B process, same decay, but with muons or electrons in the final state you see here in this in this error ratio and we actually measure this in a given q square region where q square is the uh, square the lepton in barium mass the nice thing of these ratios is uh, that adronic uncertainty is cancelled here which gives a very clean theory prediction and does a very stringent test of the standard model so of course you can test the lepton universality also in other sectors and i refer you to the other talks in this session uh, on that for this Okay, now we, we, I will focus on results from LHCV. So just let me remind you that uh, LHCV is a single arm forward spectrometer and uh, it's characterized by a very precise uh, momentum resolution here, which, which actually exceeds the capabilities of the electromagnetic calorimeter at the energies relevant for B physics. And it's also characterized by uh, very good uh, capabilities in terms of uh, particle identification, both for electrons and neons. We have taken data during the run one and two of the LHC, where we have collected around three inverse femtobar at seven and eight TeV, and around six inverse femtobar at uh, 13 TeV. So now how we actually measure lepton universality. So uh, in theory, we have this ratio here, which is uh, predicted to be precisely one. Experimentally, what we actually measure is the ratio of yields of these two processes uh, with muons and electrons, and this is typically taken from mass feeds to our data set. And then also from the uh, ratios of efficiencies between these two decays, which are extracted from simulation and calibration samples. Now, if we want to measure directly this ratio of electrons over muons, this is uh, quite challenging given the differences uh, that electrons and muons uh, have in our detector. So what we actually do is that we exploit the well-tested lepton universality in the Jepsi modes to build a double ratio. So what we measure, in fact, in, uh, in our detector is the double ratio of the rare over the Jepsi mode for muons and electrons. And then uh, the efficiencies are also normalized uh, between the 
uh, red and GFC modes for uh, both electrons and neons, which allows to cancel uh, largely the systematic effects on this measurement. Moreover, we also exploit uh, this property to, to do a, a stringent cross-check, which is to measure the single ratio of the GEPSI modes going to muons and electrons that we call r -Gepsi, which allows to control our efficiencies. Now, what do I say that electrons and muons are so different? Well, there are many, mainly two reasons at LHCB for this. Uh, on one hand, there's the large occupancy that we have in an hadronic machine, uh, which has a larger impact on the, electronical, on the electromagnetic calorimeter than the muon chambers. And this has a direct impact on the trigger thresholds we need to apply at the hardware level. So you see, uh, as an example here, uh, what we use in run one and run two, and you can see that we need really much harder thresholds for electrons, which means that we have then uh, lower yields for the signal mode. This is mitigated by including also in our analysis events that are triggered uh, by different means, in particular by the hadron trigger or even independently of the signal, which means by any other particle in the decay. So the analyses are then performed in various trigger categories. On the other hand, at these uh, high energies that we have at the LHC, the electrons radiate a large fraction of uh, Bernstrahlung energy while traversing our detector. Now, this is a challenge, in particular, if uh, Bremstrahlung is emitted before our magnet, because then the trajectory measured by our uh, tracking system does not account for all the total initial uh, momentum at production. We have a recovery procedure in place for this, where uh, we look basically for uh, clusters in the, in the electromagnetic calorimeter that match the trajectory of the initial electron. Of course, this procedure is not perfect. And in fact, due to the worse uh, electromagnetic resolution uh, than for the tracking, in the end, electrons have a worse uh, momentum resolution that also implies a worse mass resolution in the, in the final modes. Uh, now, let me move to the uh, latest results by LHCV on this sector. So first of all, I want to present the, the last update on RK, which is the measurement of lepton universality in B2KLL and has been done by adding a uh, part of the run to data set, which effectively is a uh, factor two statistics increase and also reanalyzing the run one data. So this measurement is done at the low Q square region and we use three trigger categories for the electron modes in this case. The selection is uh, mostly based in uh, particle identification and mass beta uh, against physics background. So for example, you can see here that if you require that the electron and kaon invariant mass is larger than the D0 mass. You can kill efficiently subileptonic backgrounds uh, while uh, being still very efficient on your signal. So this is the kind of vetos that we place. And then on top of this, we use a BDT, uh, which is based on kinematics, uh, to kill the, the combinatorial background. Uh, after this, uh, we get uh, quite some clean distribution for muons, as you see here on the left. Uh, where there's only very small combinatorial background. And then for electrons, due to the worst mass resolution, things are a bit more complicated. So we have significant backgrounds also from partially reconstructed backgrounds. For, here, for instance, here in blue, you have a background dominated by B2K star E, where one of the pion is basically not reconstructed, faking your final state. And we have also uh, contamination from the leakage of the GEPSI state uh, at, the, at this low Q squared region. Overall, however, we are able to describe uh, the data very well. And from a simultaneous fit to these two modes, uh, we extract RK. So uh, the results that we obtain in this analysis are shown here, 0 0.846, uh, with around 7% precision. This is compatible with the previous result that you see here in gray. And also, it's uh, away from the standard model at the level of 2.5 sigma, as you see here. Um, this is dominated by the statistics of the electron mode, uh, but we have already times two more BDKs in Tate that uh, are going are being analyzed. Now, um, not only it's important to measure uh, RK with more precision, but also to measure uh, lepton universality in other modes. And this is what we have recently done in uh, B variants using lambda B to PKLL decays for the first time. This is what we call RPK. And uh, this is interesting because both the theoretical and uh, experimental uncertainties are different from RK, but also the sensitivity to new physics models is different due to the spin one half of the initial and final state. So this analysis is performed with the RAN1 and 2016 LHCV data and follows a similar strategy to RK, 
In this case, we only use uh, two trigger categories for the electrons. And uh, the Q square uh, bean is expanded towards lower values to enhance the, the statistics. Uh, moreover, a particularity of this mode is that uh, we have uh, quite some contributions uh, from different resonances in the PK spectrum, as you see here on the right from background subtracted candidates. And so we include as much as possible here going up to 2.6 GeV also to enhance the, the S statistics available. Now, let me show you uh, the cross check I've defined before with uh, using our JEPSI, exploiting again the, the lepton universality in the JEPSI decay. So what we do here is just measure uh, the ratio of JEPSI, so PK JEPSI uh, yields with JEPSI going to E and mu mu, corrected by the efficiency of this mode. And we found a good result, a, good, a result which is very good compatible with one when including both statistical and systematics. And also we measure this value, this quantity, as a function of uh, kinematic variables. For instance, the, the transverse momentum of the lambda B, the invariant mass of the proton and the kaon, and the opening angle of the two leptons. And we see in all the cases that we have uh, flat uh, distributions, which, uh, which give us uh, confidence that we control very well the, uh, sorry, the efficiencies in all the phase space relevant for this analysis. So then putting all together, uh, we can uh, also fit the invariant mass distribution of PK LL candidates. Um, again, you see that the muon mode is, is much cleaner. In this case, for electrons, uh, we have uh, the partially reconstructed dominated by lambda B to PK star uh, LL decays. Uh, but overall, again, we have a good description and, uh, and uh, uh, a yield that is dominated by the electron mode. Putting all together, we achieved the first test of lepton universality in divariance, which is found to be 0 0.86 with around 16% prediction, precision, sorry. This is compatible uh, with unity at one sigma, but is also in agreement uh, with previous RH measurements, so uh, lower than the standard model prediction. I should quickly say uh, that this analysis also represents the first observation of the PKE mode and also a first measurement of the PK mu mu branching ratio, which is found to be around two times 10 to the minus seven, and it's limited by the knowledge of the normalization mode. So this brings me to my conclusions. Uh, there are some interesting deviations in lepton universality tests that could point to the presence of new physics in B2SLL. I've shown you the fair results with B baryons that go in the same direction. And uh, actually, it's very interesting that there's a coherent pattern with other B2SLL anomalies and also potential combined explanation with B2CL new anomalies. And for this, I refer you to the, to the theory talks later today and on Wednesday. Um, from the experimental point of view, uh, what we want to do is to increase the sensitivity by adding more statistics, which is crucial to confirm whether this is new physics. So we are also looking forward to results from other experiments and at LHCV on top of updating uh, the existing measurements. We are also working to add uh, new modes like R5 or R5. You can see here on the right the uh, sensitivity we expect with the already collected data. So stay tuned and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions to cover? Okay, go on. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Kala, very nice talk. Just a small question about uh, the RK measurement presented in you know the final uh, whatever you presented in slide four or five. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, of course it is as you said statistically dominated. Uh, as far as the systematic part, do you have in backup or somewhere just to understand what is the major sources of systematics here? Uh, is there somewhere coming from the, for the electron part, uh, the contribution on the lower side, the PDF, is, does it, I mean, so what is the major source of systematics if you have, thank you. Yeah, I think I have a slide on that indeed. Let me, uh, let me go there. So, so here we are. So yeah, the, the main uh, systematics here are on one height, uh, on one sun, uh, sorry, this is RK star. Well, I think it's, it's quite similar for RK, but okay, it's, it's usually uh, mostly uh, residual backgrounds. So we have, uh, this is a small effect, but uh, you know, we, we, may, we basically uh, model the partially reconstructed background I shown you from uh, K star decays. Uh, let me go 
about two defeats. So yeah, this this kind of of background okay, we have okay. here. Yeah, right. that uh, is what I was so, thinking. So thank you. Yeah, you can have contributions from higher states. I mean, we check this, and this is a small effect, but indeed it's there. Uh, with more stats, we should also be able to control that better. And uh, even there's the idea of uh, of fitting simultaneously B2K and B2K study to control this much better. So this can definitely be improved in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So let's move on to the next talk. So Blasiv. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, please share the screen. Yes. So is this fine? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so I thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity. So today I will be talking about uh, the complementary test of electron flavor universality violation. So in the BS2 F2 prime, mu plus mu minus for the F2 prime going to K plus K minus D case, mass and progeny. So to get a brief introduction, so there are various flavors of parts. And uh, the swapping of the flavors to another uh, occur in two ways. One is charge current and the neutral current transition. So in standard model, all these uh, flavor changing processes are, uh, are inherit processes inherits the fundamental property for the electron flavor universality. So as we know, it, it states that the couplings of uh, gauge bosons to the leptons are independent of the flavor, lepton flavor. So any sign of uh, the lepton flavor non-universality would be direct sign of neoplasms. So there are various evidences uh, where the, the violation of lepton flavor universality has been observed. So here we see uh, some of the observables in the uh, neutral current sectors, this RK, RK star, and P5 prime. And uh, the branching ratio of BS to pi mu mu. Similarly, in the charge current sector, we have uh, this RD, RD star, P star, D star, FLD star, and B2D, D D star, and MOD case, and RJ psi, and DC to J psi, and MOD case. So there has been various uh, studies uh, where standard model extensions have been addressed in, uh, in order to understand these discrepancies. So right now we discuss here some of the opportunities to look for the new physics in b 2 sln So we know that uh, uh, in standard model, these neutral current transitions are uh, highly suppressed and they proceed via uh, loop or box level diagrams. Uh, even there are other possibilities, including the Z prime and the of models as well. So as we know, this, the standard model predictions come with very larger uh, hydronic uncertainties. So hence, uh, it is important to define some of the uh, theoretically clean observables. The well-known uh, among them is the ratio of branching ratio, so which is defined uh, uh, with reference to the two lepton flavors. Uh, in the numerator, we have mu, and in the denominator, we have P plus E minus. So these uh, ratios uh, are very helpful so that uh, uh, even the experimental systematic uncertainties are controlled and even the early time QED uh, corrections are controlled. So in addition, the angular analysis of uh, these uh, decay modes uh, help us to set some of the uh, optimized observables. Uh, so with the reduced form factor dependency, so for example, we have P5 prime, P5 as well. So the motivation uh, for these studies of the anomalies, we have RK, RK star anomaly. So RK is uh, so standard, stand 2.5 sigma away from the standard model. Similarly, RK star measurement, so stand 2.1 to 2.5 sigma from the standard model expectations. So these are the two plots for RK and RK star. Similarly, the P5 prime anomaly. So there are various measurements uh, in different bins. So so this uh, also all the measurements stand at uh, 3.3 and 1 sigma and 2.1 sigma respectively from the standard model expectations. So next we have the BS5 anomaly, which is the branching ratio of BS to pi mu mu. So it stand at 3.7 sigma away from the standard model expectation. So, so now right now we give predictions of several observables for this uh, BS2 F2 prime, mu plus mu minus dk. So this analysis is well motivated since uh, so this decay has received less attention in the theoretical side. And also experimentally, uh, many there are not, not many results involving this P2 particle. 
So whereas F2 prime is a tensor on some it's free tool. And this DK mode can be studied easily at the present LHCB deck. So we have here the effective Hamiltonian uh, consisting of the uh, standard model Wilson coefficient addition to the new physics Wilson coefficients. We have here C9 LP, C10 LP, C9 prime and C10 prime. So these prime operators are uh, uh, involve the right-handed uh, interactions. So for our analysis, we uh, uh, refer uh, the global fix uh, for this uh, new physics with some coefficients. So uh, we totally consider seven new physics scenarios, uh, uh, four 1D scenario and uh, three 2D scenarios. So all these uh, with some coefficients are vector and axial vector in the structure. So similarly for the form factors, BS to F2 prime. So we obtain uh, by using the perturbative QCD approach. So one can uh, write down the partial decay width. So here the function MD uh, can be decomposed into 11 angular coefficients. Uh, similarly, later one can get the uh, differential decay rate in terms of these angular coefficients as follows. So in addition, we define various physical observables such as the differential branching ratio, forward backward asymmetry, left arm polarizing fraction, a ratio of branching ratio, and various uh, angular observables P1, P2, P4 prime, P5 prime. And in addition, we have the Q observables, which are basically defined uh, the difference between the mu component to the uh, electron component. So the standard model predictions for this uh, BS to F2 prime DK. So we see here the uh, uh, so for the various observables, the central line and also the one sigma uncertainty. Uh, so we see, uh, we do observe the zero crossing for AFB, P2, P4 prime and P5 prime. So we have uh, for AFB and P2, the zero crossing at three GV square. And similarly for P4 prime, we have at 1.4 and for P5 prime at 1.6 GV square. So P1 is almost zero in the low Q square region. And uh, the ratio of branching ratio RF2 prime is obtained to be constant and equal to one. And the uncertainty associated with RF2 prime is uh, almost negligible. So uh, right here, we uh, uh, discussed uh, the uh, same, same observables uh, in the different Q square beams. So in the presence of uh, 1D uh, new physics couplings. So what we see here, so the LO band represents the standard model and uh, there are various other new physics scenarios. So for the differential branching ratio, so, so we see that there are uh, deviations uh, from, the stand, from the central values uh, in all the new physics scenarios, but uh, no significant, significant observations can be made. So in the FL case, uh, so very minor deviations can be found in uh, some new physics scenarios, but uh, for the asymmetry, uh, two, two sigma deviations can be observed in all the things. And P1, uh, so no, no distinguished new physics scenario can be made since uh, all, all of the signal new physics scenarios lie within the standard model uncertainty. And for the P2, up to one sigma deviations can be found. For the P4 prime, so one to three sigma deviation from standard model expectations are observed. For P5 prime as well, uh, we find up to one sigma deviations. So similarly, uh, in the presence of the same 1D metric scenario, so we study the Q-square distribution. So Q-square distributions, especially they are, uh, so one can uh, see the zero crossings, especially AFB, P2, P4 prime, and P5 prime. In standard model, as we see, AFB has a zero crossing at three. Uh, here we have the C9 is overlapping with uh, the standard model. So whereas C9 is equal to minus C9 NP is equal to minus C10 NP, we are at 3.4. For the C10 NP and C9 NP is equal to minus C9 prime, we have at 3.8 GV square. Similarly, for P4 prime, so the standard model and the C10 have the same behavior at 1.4. Similarly, the C9 NP, C9 NP minus C10 NP at 1.8, and C9 NP is equal to minus C9 prime at 1 GV square. So they are different from uh, the standard model. Similarly, for P5 prime, we do get uh, the different zero crossings in some physics scenarios at 1.8 and 2.2 GV square. So right here, we can see the binwise plots in the presence of uh, these 2D new physics scenarios. So similarly, uh, like 1D, so we have uh, uh, three sets of combinations of uh, the coefficients. 
So we do have quite more deviations uh, in the differential branching ratio and the electron polarization fraction up to 1.5 sigma deviations can be seen in some of the bins and for power record asymmetry up to two sigma deviations can be observed. So P1, uh, similarly, the all the central values differ in some nuclear scenarios, but they lie within the standard model error bar. The P2 prime in the first two bins, we do get uh, 1.5 to 2.5 sigma deviations. And in the P4 prime, up to two sigma deviations in the first bin due to C9, uh, NP C9 prime, and the other line within one sigma of the standard model. Even for the P5 prime, the central values, uh, we do uh, we get the central values differ by some nuclear scenarios, but they are consistent within one sigma of the standard model. Similarly, the uh, Q square distributions, we do uh, get the zero crossings uh, different from uh, all the, the 1D scenario as well as the standard model. Uh, so especially, so we want to see here the electron flavor universality test and particularly uh, these uh, uh, observables such as R and Qs. So, so the, the speciality of these observables here is the uncertainties are very less in these observables. Uh, hence, uh, any uh, uh, the new physics scenarios uh, we do, uh, we observe here uh, very huge uh, deviations from the standard model expectation in many of the uh, NP scenarios. Similarly, in the case of uh, the presence of two new physics couplings, uh, so we do get uh, very huge uh, uh, deviations uh, in, the, in the presence of the two new physics coupling. So to conclude, uh, so so we see that the band ratio for BS to F2 prime mu mu is of the order of 10 to the minus 7 standard model. So uh, in most of the new physics cases, the branching ratio is reduced in all Q squares. Uh, except for the C line, uh, the zero crossing for AFB is shifted to the higher Q square values. So in the case of FM, the electron polarization fraction that seems to be reduced and shifted the higher values of Q square compared to the standard model. The observables uh, R, R and Qs observe different uh, significant deviations from the standard model in most of the new physics uh, scenarios. And this work to mention that the zero crossing in AFB uh, is quite interesting in order to check the left computer universality violation. The measurement of uh, all the variables, various observables uh, for this particular DKMO in the future can shed more light to identify the possible new physics and it provides the complementary information uh, regarding the RQRQ star anomaly as well. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Okay, so I have one question. So if two is spin two steps, so uh, there are many, uh, much more uh, helicity states than K star. Yes. So is there any so, difference? Is there any difference? Uh, difference? Uh, uh, no, uh, so when you uh, when when calculate the uh, two polarization tensor, uh, so the form factors, uh, uh, are similar to uh, B2 K star. There are not much difference between this uh, K star or F2. So, new physics contribution to F2 prime is almost the same as K star? Yes, yes, almost. Okay, thank you. Oops, is there any other comments, questions? If you have, please, please raise your hands. It seems not. Okay, so thank you very much, Rajiv. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to next talk by Devasis. Oh, hello. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Myself, Devasis. And I will talk on behalf of Bell collaboration and I will discuss on test of lepton family universality and the search for lepton flavor, lepton and the baryon number violating tau decay at Bell. In the outline, I am showing three results. First one is test of lep lepton family universality, ARC study B2 KLL decays. Second one, lepton flavor violation in B decays B2 KLL prime. 
method result. I will show left on flavor, left on, and the variant number of highlighting tau decays, tau going to proton and two lepton, where lepton may be muon or electron. In this slide, I'm showing KKB accelerator ring and the bell detector. As you know, the KKB is an electron positron collider, which mostly collides at a central mass energy 10.58 GB. It is uh, where the uh, BB bar cross section is 1.1 nanobar and cross section of tau tau is at around 0 0.9 nanobar. So it is a B factory as well as a tau factory. During the enter in physics room, bell collected around one inverse autobahn data at different resonance and off resonances. Here uh, I am showing a little introduction to lepton family universality. As you know, in standard model, the electronic coupling of Gauss bosons to leptons are independent of their flavor. And the property is known as lepton flavor universality. The B decades of B2KLL are B2 SL cell SLL uh, quark label transition, which constitute a flavor charging neutral current process. Such processes are forbidden at three level. How about they can proceed at uh, a loop level? Here I am showing two uh, diagrams a penguin diagram and a box diagram. To test electron family, uh, family universality, the ratio of branching fractions are determined uh, in this study. This is basically uh, branching fraction of K, uh, B to K mu mu over B to K E E. This will be useful to explore new physics since the common experimental systematic uncertainties and other form factors are cancelled out. In this study, uh, we uh, search the charged as well as neutral decay channels using upstream 4S uh, data sets of 711 inverse femtobahn. Signal extraction is done by three variables with the uh, uh, beam reconstant mass, the change in energy, and the neural network output, which is the background separation variables and the uh, projection plots are shown here for MBC, delta E, and the uh, background separation variable. In signal yield, we found for charge, as well as neutral modes, are, in the, are shown in the bottom. Here I am showing the RK results that we got. The RK study is done at uh, several beams. Uh, we are uh, in the right hand plot, the RK is the packet average of RK0 and RK plus. All our measurements are uh, compatible with standard model prediction. Whereas for uh, this red beam for RK plus is higher than LSV result by 1.6 standard deviation. The next topic I will come for, uh, I'll uh, search for lepton flavor violating decay, B decays. As you know, uh, in many theoretical models, lepton flavor violation accompanies lepton family universality violation. We switch for these channels, charge channels, B plus going to K plus mu plus E minus, B plus to K plus mu minus E plus, as well as the neutral decay channels. Our preliminary results are shown here. Here, uh, the MBC position plots are shown here for charge mode as well as for neutral decay channels. All these channels we set an upper limit order of 10 to minus 8 at 90% confidence level. However, for a B plus going to K plus, A plus, E minus channel, you can see there is a small bump here. And for this channel, we put a 3.2 sigma uh, evidence signal. And we also quote a uh, branching fraction order of 10 to minus 8. The next result, I'll come to tau study. As you know, Sakharov formulated three conditions to explain metro antimatter asymmetry in the universe. The first one is a baryon number violation, C and a symmetry violation, and interaction out of thermal equilibrium. Still, now we have experimental confirmation of C and CP symmetry violation but we do not have any confirmation of baryon number violation. So at Bell, we are looking for this kind of baryon number and the lepton number and the lepton, uh, uh, lepton favor violation. 
for tau tau going to proton mu minus mu minus and also ele uh, electron channel as well as the cross channels and your observation of this kind of process will be clear signal of new physics in the right hand side i am showing a feynman diagram uh, for tau minus going to anti proton mu minus mu plus and the reference is given here where the theoretical story is done on this analysis for the lcb set the first upper limits on this kind of decay tau minus going to proton mu minus mu minus order of 10 to minus 7 using 1 inverse 5 to 1 pp collision data in this slide i will uh, uh, i'll discuss about the uh, set of data that we are using for our study and the uh, reconstruction process and then i will discuss on the selection criteria we are using almost full bell data set for uh, this analysis for tau study we use the option of forest resonance data as well as the off resonance and option 5s data set for the starting signal we use two variable the reconstructed tau reconstructed mass and the change in energy in the uh, 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 right hand side, I am showing a plot for reconstructed mass and change in energy. We are uh, this is from Signal Monte Carlo. We are the red box shows the signal region and the region outside the box, the sediment region, where this green belt, the strip, is used to predict the number of background in the signal region. The selection criteria here I have mentioned the basic selection criteria from impact parameter cut to uh, the polar angle uh, cut. Then I am using a uh, we are using a three one best topology to select the tau tau events and reject high multiplicity event. This basically in the signal side I, we need three tracks, whereas in other side we need one charge track. And this is done by a plane perpendicular to the first axis. In addition to that, we use particle identification criteria and some other event set variables we use in our analysis. Also for electron channels and tau minus going to put on mu minus mu minus channel, we use a gamma conversion vector to, to reduce gamma conversions. In addition, for tau minus going to anti put on e minus e, e plus channel and put on same sign electron channel, we put a cut on sum of ECL energy to be less than 10 GeV in order to reduce two photon and radiative HAVA backgrounds. Then I am showing a side event plots for anti tau minus one to anti on A plus C minus channel, where it's the left one is a top left is a reconstructed mass and a right one is the change in energy. Uh, as I discussed, for this channel, we put a gamma conversion vector on uh, the invent mass of oppositely charged jet truck with electron mass hypothesis. Here I am showing in the bottom plot the invent mass of oppositely charged truck in order to suppress the bhava contamination. Here you go the results. We found one event from antiproton E plus C minus and put on mu minus e minus channel and put on mu minus mu minus channel in the signal region. Whereas for other three channels, there are no event in the signal region. Our uh, number of observed events are consistent with the background prediction. In the next slide, I'll show the expected number of background in the signal region. So uh, as the number of observed event are consistent with the expected. So we put an upper limit on the signal, signal yield using feldman cousins method. Uh, here I am showing a calculation of tau minus going to anti on E minus mu plus channel branching fraction. So we do not find any event in the signal region. And the expected background in this signal region is 0 0.4 plus minus 0 0.63. And the upper limit we found on the signal is 2.2 at 90% confidence level. On the right hand side, I'm showing a scan result for p value versus the signal yield. So the branching fraction 
uh, upper, upper limit on the Banksy fraction uh, will be order of 1.9 10 to minus 8 at 90% confidence level for tau minus 1 to antiput on the mu minus mu plus channel. Similarly, in the table, I have listed all the channels and corresponding signal reconstruction efficiency, the expected number of background in the signal region, the observed events in the signal region, and upper limit on the signal yield, and upper limits on the bunch infraction. Our best limit is from tau minus going to antiput on mu minus mu plus channel. And we are order of 10 to the power minus 8 for all other channels. Here I will go for summary. RK is a measure for several Q square beings. All measurements are compatible with the standard model predictions. And RK result for this particular beam the one with 1 to 6 Q square beam is higher than LSEB result by 1.6 sigma. And the more precision measurements can be done at well too. Whereas Lepton flavor of halos and beauty case are uh, set, uh, the branching function sort is set in order of 10 to a minus 8 at 90% confidence level. For neutral mode, Bell results improve than Babor results by an order of magnitude. As I discussed, for LSEB, first uh, put an upper limit for put on mu minus mu minus and anti put on mu plus mu minus channel in order of 10 to a minus 7, whereas Bell. Uh, whereas we put for this muon channels in order of 10 to minus 8 and our result improved by an order of magnitude than LSFD whereas for other channels electron channel and electron in the cross channels our result the world of fast limit on other four channels more improved results are expected from belt thank you thank you for your kind attention thank you very much any comments or questions So tutors. Hi, impressive results, I must say. Uh, I, I would like to um, comment on or ask on, on uh, B2K EMU or B2K mu E, the results there. Um, can, you, can you comment a bit on uh, what backgrounds you considered there? Because I mean, one thing that can cause this spike here uh, could be, for example, B two K pi pi. I'm not very familiar with Bell. Is that can this misidentification be a problem? Yeah, uh, uh, maybe, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, from the future results, we uh, find this. Uh, uh, this small bump, but uh, yeah, we can discuss in the open session about this more. Okay, Gagan. Yeah, it's just a follow up comment. I, uh, so, indeed, the possible picking background from K pi pi. Uh, because of the particle misidentification of pi, and that has been uh, very carefully, uh, very carefully uh, studied in this channel. Uh, we think uh, this may be uh, one or few, uh, few event uh, which are uh, kind of golden event, uh, having very high likelihood in in this continuum suppression variable. The last. Uh, uh, there are three, D, three uh, dimensional fit. So we think it's just a uh, statistical fluctuation uh, for a few events, uh, but uh, there's no issue from the peaking background estimation, just to come. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's also quite, um, so would, would be quite surprising if you see a very significant, if there, there was a very significant signal in B2K plus mu plus e minus, but not in B2K plus mu minus e plus. Can be true, but it's pretty unlikely. Okay, Matt. Hi, oh, yes, just to follow up. Um, the, uh, uh, an additional reason why this would be a bit unlikely is, um, of course, that there is already a, an upper limit 
from LHCB uh, with a branching fraction of uh, about six terms 10 to the minus nine. So this, uh, this also argues in favor of a statistical fluctuation. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention it. I, I was one of the proponents there. Yes, Titus was too <laughs> modest or too, too polite. Okay, so thank you. It's time to move on. The next speaker is Luca. Yeah, hi there. Hi. I'm sharing the screen. <clears throat> okay, do you see the, the, the slides? Yes. Okay. Right. So thanks for letting me speak in. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is a flavor model, uh, trying to explain the flavor puzzle, and it is uh, inspired by the minimum correlating one, but it's going beyond it. So let me start with a very single slide of introduction. The flavor puzzle is essentially summarized saying that uh, we don't know the hierarchies among the fermion masses. Uh, we don't know the difference between the CK matrix and PMS matrix. We still don't have a very precise measurement of the CP violation in the lepton sector. And this is <clears throat> giving freedom to construct different models, but this represents a lack of information for us to construct a more precise or more dedicated model. Uh, we don't know whether the neutrinos have normal inverse ordering and still another freedom, and we don't know the nature of neutrinos, if there is Majoran or Dirac. These are all unknowns that uh, um, would help us uh, to determine the, the, the model beyond the, the flavor puzzle. There are different solutions or so attempts to give a solution to this, uh, to explain the flavor puzzle. Uh, they go look into different directions, so continuous symmetries, discrete symmetries, anarchical models or some uh, other type of approaches. And all these, uh, uh, these approaches have in common one uh, point that is the top-down approach, in the sense that uh, uh, for several reasons is decided symmetry, and then the symmetry is then developed and the, the, the corresponding phenomenology started. However, what I want, want to give today is a bottom-up approach, just look into the data and see what the data are telling us. So the largest break in the quark sector is provided by the top quark with respect to other fermions, and also with respect to the masses of the neutrinos and the charge leptons. On, for the, the lepton sector, we have, uh, when, once we consider the type 1 CISO, we have that the largest breaking is provided by the red and the neutrinos. So why not to consider scenarios in which at the only renormalizable terms are the ones corresponding to the top quark and the red and the neutrinos? So the idea is to construct a Lagrange that at the renormalizable level has only these terms, while all the rest arises at the non renormalizable level, arise naturally uh, suppressed. So starting from the quark sector, <clears throat> the, the way to get it is to consider that uh, the left-handed quarks of the third generations are in singlet, and the, top, the right-handed tops are also in singlet. So thinking about to construct a flavor symmetry to explain the flavor puzzle, we want the fields associated to the top to be in singlet, such that we can write it directly, a, you cover the top, uh, that is uh, uh, the one that we can see here that is renormalizable. Indeed, the U cover can be a border one. All the rest of the terms should be described by the delta L. And as a result, the, at, at this order, the U covers that we find are the U covers that tell only the three free entry of the U cover up, different from, different from one, while all the rest are undetermined. Going on, we want to describe all the rest of the masses and the mixings. What we want is to get the other terms in the Lagrangian suppressed with respect to the top Yukawa. So we want to prevent any other renormalizable term in the Lagrangian. And we can do that grouping the rest of the quarks in doublets or triplets, or importantly, the non-trivial representation of any symmetry. So what we can do is to group the left-handed quarks in a doublet, the right-handed top quarks in a doublet as well, and the right-handed down quarks in a triplet. The associated symmetry in this case would be an SU2 for the left-handed quarks, an SU2 for the right-handed up quarks, and an SU3 for the left-handed down quarks. So in this case, that is the most general, the largest symmetry that we can construct consistent with these choices of uh, deciding that quarks in doublet or triplet or singlets. We have that the kinetic terms are naturally invariant under the proposed symmetry. We have that the Yukawa Lagrangian is not invariant, 
this is the game. We, we don't want these additional terms in the, in the Yukawa Lagrangian, but we can construct all the rest of the masses they're mixing right in a Lagrangian that is formally invariant under the Prevost symmetry at a minimum of violation. This means, this means introducing a series of Fourier fields that are non-dynamical fields, they don't have a mass dimension, uh, but they do transform under the Prevost symmetry. At a certain moment, they develop a background value. <clears throat> we can think of them as scalar fields that develop VEV at a certain moment, but at this point, the beans pullions, they don't have a scalar potential, they don't have a mass dimension, they don't, they don't have kinetic terms, okay? Summarizing the fields that uh, we have in the quark sector are the fermions with the transformation that I said before, plus three different spurions, while in the mean of a violation case, we have only two spurions. So we have one spurion delta y up for the up sector, that is a B doublet. We have a delta y down in, that is a double triplet, and the vector, just an anti-triplet of a three down right in the down sector. So the idea <clears throat> is that uh, once we construct the next two leading terms in the Lagrangian, we have a Yukawa up that is a block structure. So a 1, 1 entry, a 3, 3, 3 entry that is a 1. And then we have a block in the 1, 2 sector. And now the Yukawa down that again, we have the bottom that is not over the 1, so sub naturally suppressed with respect to the top. And after the other uh, entries of the down Yukawa. More specifically, what we want that at this point is still an assumption, like in the minimal correlation case, we have that the delta y up develop a background value that is diagonal, while the down Yukawas, the down Spurians, um, get values that are proportional to the Yukawa of the down sector times the secant matrix. With this choice, we have the Yukawa of the up quarks directly diagonal, already diagonal in this basis and the down quarks that can be diagonalized by the secant matrix. So at this point, we can describe masses and mixings. And which is the phenomenology associated to the quark sector? Um, essentially, we can write all the, firm, the operators, effective operators invariant under the symmetry. We can consider just the dimension six one that are the most relevant ones. Uh, this is the full list of operators that we managed to find that are an independent set of operators. Without entering into details of the different operators, just let me give you the solutions, the, the conclusions. We consider different observables, so meson oscillations, meson decays, and the strongest constraints come from the B2S gamma, B2K LL, and to the meson oscillations that provide a bound on the cutoff scale over the, the three coefficients of order 6 TV. So this is the scale at which we could expect the presence of new physics at which we should write the, new, the underlying theory respect to what we have. This is very similar to the minimal correlation case. However, there is a very strong difference, the tau sector. Indeed, the minimal correlation, we have that the Brunson ratio B sub S to mu mu is equal or correlated to be uh, equal to the Brunson ratio B sub S to tau tau. This is not what happens in the data-driven flavor model, where these branching ratios could be of order one, or the, I'm sorry, could be of same order, but they are not correlated among each other. So a very precise measurement of these observables, and the same is, um, occurs for B2K, mu mu and B2K tau tau. A very precise measurement could tell us if data are in favor of minimal correlation or not. And if they are not in favor of minimal correlation, the data-driven flavor model could be favored. Moving now to the lepton sector, um, this is the situation with the type one system is very similar to the minimal lepton flow violation, or at least one of the realizations. Um, so the only terms that are present at the renormalizable level are the ones with the retaining neutrinos, while all the rest of the terms are described by the delta L. Again, what we want to prevent is that uh, at the renormalizable level, we have masses of the charged leptons. So from this point of view, we want to prevent that the tau could arise uh, at the luminizable level. So for this reason, we can decide that we can take this symmetry SU3 for the left-handed leptons and SU2 for the right-handed leptons and the SO3 for the, for the right-handed neutrinos. And in this way, we can see that the tau right can be a singlet, but being the left-handed lepton to be triplet, we can reconstruct a luminizable level in the Lagrangian. Instead, in order to get the symmetry associated to the tiny neutrinos, we need that the YN is the identity matrix. In this way, we have a symmetry. Otherwise, we would not, we would not have any symmetry for the retaining neutrinos. 
Also in this case, we need three spurions, two for the charge leptons in this case, that is a triplet and doublet, a vector ye, and after we have a B triplet in the uh, purely neutrino sector in Wayne. The idea now is to get a charge leptons that doesn't have any one. So the largest entry is suppressed in any case with respect to the Topiukawa naturally. While the neutrino mass matrix doesn't have any structure and this favors large mixing in the neutrino sector with respect to what happens to the quark sector. So the uh, next leading order Lagrangian that we can construct is the following one where the Yukawa, so the spurions that we were discussing for the leptons should acquire these values. Notice that uh, we are not able to identify this, the background value of YN, but we are only able to find the, um, the ground value of YN, YN transpose. And this is very similar to what happens in the minimum for violation. Um, and the result of taking these values is that the charge leptons are automatically diagonal, while the, the neutrino mass matrix can be diagonalized by the P-minus matrix. The phenomenology in the lepton sector can be really summarized in these, in these plots, looking at the ratios of Brancy ratio mu to gamma to gamma and the Brancy ratio of mu to gamma to mu gamma. While in the minimum lepton for violation, these ratios are very close to one, are predicted to be all of them very close to one. In the data driven favor model, they are very much different from one, can be much different from one, even a factor of 100 difference. So even if it is futuristic, especially for the possibility of using the tau decays, uh, this could be, again, another possibility to distinguish the data, the data driven favor model with respect to the minimum lepton for violation. Finally, let me arrive to the last part of the talk, uh, that is the justification of the flavor alignment. In the minimum flow violation, uh, there is no justification of the flavor alignment in the sense that the, there is no way to explain why the spurions in the minimum flow violation do acquire the background values that they need to. And this is what we discussed in these papers. However, in the data driven flow model, there is one explanation that from this point of view, we are going beyond the minimum flow violation. What we have to do is to promote the different spurions to be dynamic as color fields. So now they are really, really the scalar fields, so they have kinetic terms, they have mass dimension. So whenever we write them, we need to write them suppressed by the cutoff scale of the theory. And we can construct a scalar potential and minimize the scalar potential. So we did it. These are the terms, the invariant that can be written in the scalar part of the scalar potential. These are the invariants that can be written in the lepton sector of the scalar potential. And without entering into much into details, I don't have time to do that by just giving you the solution. So we minimize the scalar potential. We found a solution that is compatible with quark masses and mixings, also, also at the price of the tuning in the parameter the scalar potential, at least in the quark sector. In the lepton sector, we do have masses, uh, fermium, uh, lepton masses and mixings uh, in agreement with the data, and we do have Majorana, the prediction for the Majorana phases. And this is due to of the Majorana nature of the neutrinos. In the Dirac case, we will not have uh, such predictions, let's say, or the equivalent treatment of the predictions. So just giving you the, uh, um, to simplify the, the result, um, here we have the angles, so the mixing angles in the lepton sector, in red and blue and green, and in phi, the axis, uh, is just a, a parameter that enters in the parameterization of the invariants in the scalar potential. And we see that there are two values of this phi where the three mixing angles enter in their three sigma region. So we have to see the, the values of phi where the solid lines enter in the band between the dashed lines, the corresponding dashed lines, okay? So we, uh, the, the, the minimum of the, um, the minimization is indeed compatible with this, uh, uh, the, the experimental value of the solution data. Moreover, having the my prediction for the major phases, we can go look into the prediction for the neutrinos of beta effective mass. And we can see that we have very um, pretty, um, precise prediction for the normal inverse ordering. And uh, um, a possibly future prediction of neutrinos of beta effective mass can indeed distinguish within this model if we have inverse ordering or normal ordering. In any case, can give the, some constraints on this, uh, on this model. And that's all. Thanks a lot for, for the uh, attention. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Okay, so Luis? Uh, hi, Luca. Can you go to slide number 10? 10. 
here we are. Yes, yeah, so uh, you mentioned that uh, by looking at the BS tau tau very precisely, you could test your model. Um, so how precise uh, do you need to measure uh, such a branching ratio? And uh, can't you test the same uh, new physics that you could have at BS tau tau by looking in uh, meson mixing? The meson mixing, not. Meson mixing, this, uh, the, the, there is no tau that enters is actually what uh, provides the, 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 distinguish, the, dis, the distinguishing feature with respect to mean of violation are actually the tau. So meson mixing is not possible. But for B, Passabas, the case, and B2K, LL, uh, yes, we do. We can distinguish the two models. And about the, pre the precision, uh, mean of violation, these processes are correlated. Let's say the same value that you expect for the branching ratio of the B sub S to mu mu is the one that you expect for the B sub S into tau taus. Through that, in the case of mean of violation, there could be some extra corrections, but this correction would also be much largely suppressed. So um, I cannot tell you value for the precision, precision but what I can, I can tell you is that uh, if the value of the, the decays are extremely similar to each other, then this would be in favor of mean of violation. While if the result is value that are different, of order one or order 10 difference in the data-driven problem model would be favored. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. Thank you. Let's move on to next talk by uh, Nafisa. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me share my uh, screen. Hello, good morning from Canada. My name is uh, Nafisa Tesnim. Today I'm going to present an interesting analysis of mine on behalf of Babar Collaboration. The analysis topic is based about the um, evaluation of charge lepton flavor on epsilon decay, specifically on uh, epsilon 3s resonance energy. So here is the outline of my talk. Um, I'll try to keep everything um, in brief. So let's move on. As we all know, all interactions must conserve some quantities such as lepton numbers, types, etc. However, we have observed neutrinos can change from one flavor to another which is only possible if the neutrinos have non-zero finite mass. So it is evident that um, lepton flavors can be violated in the nature. Now the question is how much violation is happening in the nature? Um, is it possible to measure the violation precisely? Or do we have enough luminosity to observe the violation? Uh, if we particularly look at the, um, the mode um, that was seen in, in, the, in, the, um, in the video part of the slide, you can see that when a muon is decayed to electron through gamma, the water is at 10 to the power minus uh, 54, which is way um, you know, below the uh, experimental observation. So experimentally, it is not measurable. However, if we think about the epsilon sector, the scenario is totally different. So let's look at um, the answers to those questions in my next slides. Um, there is no direct uh, theoretical calculation on the epsilon 3s decays to emu. So we calculated that theoretical constraint on the limit indirectly by reordering the incoming and outgoing particles on a muon that decays to three electrons. So according to the a paper, um, which is Nusinov's um, ETL paper, um, the branching fraction is less than 10 to the power minus three. Uh, 
Um, however, we report several orders of magnitude more sensitive than these indirect limit. I will come to this point um, when I'll show my result. So let's move on. Here you can see some of the existing experimental searches um, regarding the absolute decays. Power has always proven to be a leading experiment, particularly in the absolute uh, decay sectors. Uh, such as you can see, absolute 3S goes to electron tau or muon tau. Those were reported by Babar experiment. Um, and here we are again going to report the first experimental measurement of decay of absolute 3S goes to E mu, because you know you can see from the diagram, like you know. Uh, Barber has uh, an excellent luminosity over Bell experiment, which is 10 times more than Bell experiment, 20 times more than uh, Q experiment. And um, we, have, uh, we have an excellent um, luminosity um, uh, for, for absolute three S data. So we are in a good shape. In this slide, you can see that the list of the luminosities and the absolute numbers of the data and MCs we have used here in this analysis. Uh, just to remind you that we have used 3% of the whole data set to finalize all the selection criteria and uncertainties before looking at the result. Uh, then with the approval of the review committee, we unblend the rest of the data set of um, 27 inverse of empty burn. Um, this technique is called the blind analysis technique. Uh, it helps us to eliminate any type of experimental experimenters uh, bias in the analysis. Um, at the end, we have subtracted these three percent data from the final result. In this slide, you can see that uh, how a typical electron muon event uh, can interact with the Baba detector. Obviously, we want an event of two primary tracks of electron and muon. Um, and you can see that uh, the electron produces shower in the electromagnetic calorimeter and the muon deposits this energy on the muon detector. So the, if the two primary tracks are having totally different um, you know, interaction in, with the detector. So it's, it's giving us confidence to measure it properly. As you can see, uh, as you can see, the main source of the background are coming from either the tau pair or mu pair or electron pairs. So using the appropriate kinematic cuts and particle identification, uh, we have to remove all these backgrounds. Um, then um, if you look at the, um, look, look at this slide, you can see that when electron positron collides at the absolute three S resonance energy, a stream of different particles were produced. Uh, we need a special uh, background filter to collect uh, two primary track signals of electron and muon uh, from these streams of uh, different particles. So after after collecting those um, um, after collecting those um, uh, sorry, uh, hold on a sec. I think I, I lost the. I'm I'm sorry. Um, I I lost the. Um, I'm very sorry. Um, I lost so we, we see your screen, so can you change the top? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me... so we see your email, but uh, yeah, yeah. You can um, open the top for PowerPoint presentation. Exactly. Um, I'm looking for the presentation. Okay. Yeah, we can see the slides. Okay. Okay, so you can continue with this slide, I think. Uh, can, can you see it now? Yes. We see analysis strategy slide. Okay. Uh, 
Hold on a sec. Why it is not getting? Ah, uh, what happened? I cannot see my slides. Anyways, let me continue. If you can see, I'm fine. Can, can you see the slides? Yes, we see page eight. Uh, oh gosh, what happened? Okay, here, here we are. So as you can see, like, you know, we have applied the um, furthermore selection criteria to uh, surface the background here. And um, those backgrounds could be faking as the signal events. And as you know, um, uh, for, like, you know, when it comes for the PID selection, um, the tighter the selection that you uh, choose, then it would remove a lot of backgrounds at the same time it can eliminate your signal candidates um, even so, um, I mean, we we were very careful to choose what uh, PID selection we would use. So uh, we have, you know, um, engaged 16 different combination of PID selection. And then um, from there, we have optimized our PID selection. So you can see in this slide that in, in this plot, um, the mass distribution of the electron muon collected only um, by using the background filter. And all the colors even that you are seeing in this plot are the background. So as I mentioned, we have used our different selection criteria to remove them all. So this is at the very beginning how it looks. And then eventually we remove all of the uh, background events and then um, collect our candidate signals. In this slide, I'm trying to provide you an idea how we separate the background events with our own selection criteria. You can see there a circle has formed on the lateral momentum plan um, in the signal Monte Carlo in the, in the first plot. So um, we are expecting our signal candidate events to be also found within um, one such circle of radius less than um, 0 0.01. Any other events outside the circle were rejected as shown in the second plot, like, um, you know, you can see the broken uh, blue lines. So this is the way we were uh, um, collecting our signal candidates and rejecting the backgrounds. So in this slide, you have seen that, um, um, you have seen that like, you know, uh, after, after applying all the selection criteria, the signals are um, uh, looking like this and, um, let me make sure that this is not a cut on the mass, it's, it's just um, cut on the different variables. So let me move on. Um, and here is the, here is the uh, uncertainties that we have measured. And then here is the um, summary that we have here. You can see that the uh, number of candidate um, signal we have seen here is 15. And um, we have also provided the total number of backgrounds and then the number of absolute we use in this analysis. And here is the um, result that we are going to um, report for this analysis. We have calculated the branch infraction, which is um, uh, given um, one, one into 10 to the power minus seven. And then we also calculate the upper limits with the confidence level of 90%, which is uh, less than 3.6 into 10 to the power minus seven. Now, um, as I told you already, like, you know, um, uh, all the lateral flavor violating decays can be predicted by the main, um, beyond many um, standard model processes. So what does it mean? It means that it many clears, if, if there is any signature, uh, clear signature from the experimental uh, experiment, then we it, it could open a uh, door of a new physics. So here we have uh, used our branch infraction to place a constraint on d squared by lambda, uh, lambda of new physics, which is 83 tera electron volt. And now I am here in the conclusion. As I said, we reported here the branch infraction and um, we also inter, um, uh, interpreted the new limit, which is um, um, uh, 83 tera electron volt. And we thank you um, if there is any question.
Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Seems not. So is it possible to measure lepton flavor universality in Upsilon 3S decay to EE and MU? Do you have a plan? Uh, we, uh, we have reported only Upsilon 3S goes to EMU. Uh, Upsilon 2S goes to EMU is um, is being um, uh, under, under analysis. It, it is still not reported, but um, the work is under undergoing on. So I, I mean, let me refer by university in Upsilon 3S to EE and MU. Uh, yes, um, I, I mean, um, the, the other two modes were already reported. So um, mm -hmm. the universality to this measurement, um, I have to check, I have to check. Uh, there should be, uh, sh it should be the universal, um, the universality should hold there, but I have to check the numbers. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? It seems not. Okay, thank you very much, Nafita. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for the mess in the middle. Anyways, thanks. So let's move on to next talk. Tomas? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I will try to. So, uh, Nafita, so please, to, I need to please don't share. Nafita, please don't share your screen. Yeah. How do you get rid of this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. So, good morning from Prague. Um, I would like to first thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here and present our work. I would like to tell you something about lepto flavor violating hadronic processes involving a tau lepton, in particular hadronic tau decays and um, lepton tau conversion nuclei. This work uh, has been done in collaboration with uh, Kevin Monsalves and Jorge Portoles from Valencia. So just to briefly introduce my talk, um, the lepton sector of the standard model is not really rich in flavor phenomena compared to the quark sector. Still neutral leptons, neutrinos oscillate, but uh, on the other hand, flavor violation in the charged lepton sector is not really observed. Indeed, some minimal ex the minimal extension of standard model predicts a uh, very suppressed, that these, that these processes are indeed very suppressed. And on the other hand, new physics scenarios allow for enhanced charge lepton flavor violation. So on, uh, what we can do is actually try to collect all the information from experiment and in systematic way, try to constrain these new physics scenarios. So what is usually done in literature, they discuss uh, processes involving muons or electrons. So we decided to look into processes involving tau lepton. Tau lepton actually comes with a unique feature because it uh, allows us to study also hadronic tau decays. So if I uh, would like to say that we then analyze tau in both processes, which are actually connected to some experiments which were already uh, done in the past. So there are already existing limits uh, around, for example, by Babarol Bell uh, collaboration. And uh, we also took into account some improvements of these limits. For example, in the case of Bell 2, where they should improve limits on hadronic tau decay by at least one order of magnitude. And also we took into account uh, uh, the fact that NA64 experiment at CERN should be able to measure the cross-section of lepton tau conversion in nuclei. And they already have some expected sensitivity. So we used also this uh, as inputs to our analysis. And then in in the standard model effective field theory framework, we actually calculated in particular this uh, hadronic tau decays and uh, also the lepton tau conversion in iron and, and lead, and then combine everything in a global uh, numerical analysis. I don't think I need to uh, introduce uh, standard model effective field theory. So just briefly, this is actually framework which allows us in model independent 
and systematic way uh, parameterize at electric scale effects which might appear due to um, some new physics or uh, uh, emerging at uh, some scale lambda. Uh, it is done in terms of uh, operators of some dimension. We will take uh, only dimensions up, uh, operators up to dimension six into account in this analysis. The operators we use are uh, stated in this table and they are actually based on operator basis from uh, work uh, done by Jatkowski and company. And uh, we'll be trying to put some limits on the Wilson coefficients which appear here. In this setting, uh, the Wilson coefficients are expected to be of order one. So if I go to the next slide, here we can see for hadronic tau decays, the contributions for the perturbative part of the amplitude. So here the uh, operators of dimension six are denoted by this uh, big dot. So we have first the contribution to the quark antiquark pair in the final state. So this is uh, what is typically discussed in literature. And we also took into account two gluon state, most important, the most important contribution uh, to this process. And then the quark currents, which appear actually in the final state need to be hadronized. This we do in terms of chiral perturbation theory and also resonance chiral theory, which allows us to introduce resonances as explicit degrees of freedom regarding the lepton tau conversion in nuclei. These are the contribution to the perturbative part of the amplitude. So again, the incident lepton can either interact with quark in the nucleus or analogically with antiquark and also with gluon. So these are again uh, dominant uh, contributions for the gluon part of the cross section. And since the since those uh, partons are uh, like inside of nuclei, we need to take this uh, fact into account because there are some low energy non perturbative QCD effects present. So once we perform the calculation of the perturbative part of the amplitude, we need to convolute uh, our result with pattern distribution function and then again the total cross section. Regarding the pattern distribution function, actually we use uh, the fit of the nuclear pattern distribution function, which was done by the group around the CTQ project. And then we, when we plug in our perturbative cross section, we, when we convolute it with the, uh, with the pattern distribution function to get to the total cross section. So this is how actually our um, hadronic observ observ observables are obtained. Oh, one other remark about flavor changing neutral current. So in principle, in this contact information uh, interaction, we also um, allow for quarks to change flavor, but still we consider the same Wilson coefficients for all the quark flavors. Uh, and some last remark about the Wilson coefficients we use, because some of the coefficients, they always contribute in the same way in the processes we, we consider. Then we need to actually, we are not sensitive or we are not able to fit particle, uh, particular Wilson coefficients, but only the, some, some of their combinations. So we actually need to redefine a bit our, our, um, our set of the variables we fit. But in the end, we end up with 15 free parameters, which are ready to, uh, for the global uh, numerical analysis. So what we actually do, we have this bunch of uh, hadronic observables and each of them then depends on several levels on coefficients. So uh, what do we do? We can actually fit this ratio of the Wilson coefficient and the uh, square of the scale we're interested in. And uh, we use then a tool called, called HEPFIT, which is open source uh, tool, which is embedded in Bastion statistical framework. And then this tool will actually allow to sample the whole Wilson coefficient parameter space and then gives us some allowed values for Wilson coefficients, giving different confidence level correlations, etc. It's a very, very nice tool. And uh, when I said Bayesian, I also need to say uh, something about priors. So at the beginning, we, we assume that uh, we actually use flat distribution for the Wilson coefficient. So we actually say that any value for the Wilson coefficients is equally uh, pro. So this is the the homepage for the HEPFIT. If you would like, if you would be interesting to learn something more about this tool, and this is all the results. 
So this plot might look a little bit messy at the beginning, but uh, actually it's pretty easy to read. So regarding the hadronic tau decays, we have here the, the limits given by Bell in the shades of blue. So there are like eight, eight lines uh, plus one given in shades of blue, which correspond to the, to the limits uh, from Bell. And then the shades of red correspond then to improved limits, uh, improved expected limits uh, by Bell two. And uh, basically considering that uh, the coefficients would be of order one, you can actually extract the information on the scale uh, where the physics corresponding to this charge of flavor violating phenomena emerges. So this is translated into this uh, table. So we see, for example, if only uh, the coefficient C gamma would be responsible for new physics we could uh, say that uh, new physics emerges above 120 tera electron volts. On the other hand, there are, they are coefficients which uh, have much weaker bounds. So uh, this is a correlation metric. So we see that uh, some of the coefficients are rather correlated, which then translates in this plot into the fact that if we actually perform individual analysis, it means that if we would just set non-zero only one of the Wilson coefficients would gain much stronger bounds than in the case when we allow all of the coefficients to vary. So we see that actually if there are some correlations among coefficients, then the sensitivity is actually somehow diluted among uh, more coefficients which are correlated. So we are actually getting much more conservative results assuming, assuming uh, all of these uh, coefficients non-zero at the same time. For completeness, I also show you results for mu tau conversion in uh, iron based on expected NA64 sensitivity. And we see that the limits are much weaker, much weaker than compared to a hydronic tau decays. And again, this is translated into the um, table where we assume for coefficients that there might be of order one. So just to conclude, I would like to say that We've been studying model independent, uh, we've been, we perform model independent numerical analysis of standard model effective field uh, theory dimension six operators, which are related to charge lepton flavor violating processes involving tau lepton. So we studied actually altogether 28 uh, hadronic tau decays and four, um, four cross sections related to new tau conversion on iron and on, on lead. Uh, out of which the constraints uh, imposed by new tau conversion in iron were the most, uh, were the strongest. For the experimental inputs, we used present bell limits and also expected uh, limits, uh, which should come with the uh, bell two. And also we used expected sensitivity of NA464 experiment for lepton tau conversion nuclei. We can see immediately that uh, these uh, limits uh, ex expect the sensitivity expected by N64 experiment cannot really currently compete with the bell limits. Another improvement, at least to two orders of magnitude would be necessary, but then it would really provide valuable computer inputs, uh, resolve some um, uh, uh, correlations among parameters, etc. For the statistical part of the Project we use AppFit2 and the paper will actually appear very soon on archive. So stay tuned and I will leave you with uh, some view on Prague because unfortunately you cannot be here in person. So at least this, and this is the end of my talk. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments or questions, Tomas? Um, hi, can I have a question? Uh, can you comment more about your assumption about quark universality in the new physics? Is it just an assumption for simplicity or? Uh, the quark universality, what, we, what do you mean like uh, here? I mean, you said that you assume that all uh, the losing coefficients are the same for all the quarks. Yeah, it's, you? Just, it's just for simplicity. Basically, I mean, like uh, then we would not have uh, more free parameters, of course. we. We assume only minimal flavor violation in the quark sector. So basically that the flavor violation is just given by CK matrix and the new physics uh, then, I mean, 
yeah, as you said, I mean, it's, it's basically the simple, simple, simple scenario. Yeah. And uh, do you know, like, would the result look look different if if you went beyond this assumption? Oh, I don't, I don't think we tried it. You no, know, but uh, yeah, we might at least consider discussing it. Yes, you're right. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions? Can you go to page three? So you assume energy of incident beam of leptons as uh, 100 GB for electron and uh, 150 GB for muon. Yes. So what is the optimal energy? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last sentence. So what is the optimal energy? Well, this this energy are, are, are taken just uh, directly from NA64 uh, prospect. So they are assuming that for electrons, they will have a beam of 100 giga electron moles and new beam of 150 giga electron moles. So this is just like energies we took from their uh, experimental prospects. So um, actually, of course, it's a, it's a little bit different type of experiment than for, for uh, new e conversion right i mean this is this is based on like uh, uh, so yeah. i think i think it is very interesting to scan over the uh instant beam energy okay yeah well uh, okay. as i say it depends on the experimentalist we just we just took the values which they assume now in their in their uh yeah in their what they assume that uh, they can actually do so Okay, any other comments, questions? Seems not. Okay, thank you very much, Tomas. Thanks. Okay, so let's okay. move on to last talk by Kenji. Hello. Kenji. Hello. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, <laughs> then screen is of course okay. I cannot see your slides. Hmm? You can see it here? I cannot see your hmm. slides. Again, I like to share. <laughs> How about this? Okay, so now I see. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk on the... Uh, Physics prospects at the Bell 2. <coughs> uh, first, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our machine and detector, Super KKB and Bell 2. The, this is the advanced B factories, and uh, the Super KKB is a uh, asymmetric energy E plus E minus provider at the <coughs> Upsilon OS resonance, uh, the 10.58 GeV energy. Resonance. On this energy, the cross section of the tau pair is uh, very similar with the B clock production cross section. So the B factory is also the tau factory. And there are several challenges to get the higher luminosity. The, as shown here, the we will use the so called nano beam scheme to get the narrower beam at the interaction point that compared to the uh, previous KKB accelerator. The vertical beam size is 15 nanometer at the IP position. And also we are going to use a higher beam current compared to the previous experiment. And uh, uh, with this machine, the detector should work with the higher beam background and also higher trigger rates. The, those are challenges. And our target to integrated university is uh, 15 bus at one, uh, that corresponds to that uh, five times 10 to 10 tau pairs we will get, uh, which is uh, uh, 50 times higher than the previous B factory. And uh, this is the uh, overview of the belt detector. The inside the belt detector, the electron and the positron collide, and uh, inside the detector, the, we have a vertex detector, and drift chamber, and particular ID, and the current meta mean detectors. And this is uh, some, something uh, general purpose, but uh, forward backward asymmetric energy along with the beam energy, asymmetric energy beam. 
the, this is the status, the, this is the history of the peak luminosity. <coughs> the, the physics data is taking started actually in the March uh, 2019, but the, uh, the luminosity increase, the, we, we perform the luminosity tuning during the data taking, and uh, recently we achieved the world record. And the current world record, current uh, our uh, peak luminosity is the 2.4 times 10 to 5. 34. And uh, this is also the history of the uh, weekly uh, integrated university or total integrated university in the red curve. The, the we collected the data uh, rather stably, and although the in background is something high. But uh, so far, we the, the integrated university is 73 investment one. And using data, we can analyze. And uh, using this world high largest number of PLP events in the IPLAS e minus four regions, that, that offers the data for the tower physics analysis with the high pressure. And we can perform the, uh, here is the list of the, some tower physics pro program we consider the lepton flavor violating decays uh, or CP variation, EDM. Uh, new physics searches, as well as at the uh, uh, several uh, precise tests of the standard model we are going to. And in this talk, I like to show a status of the tau mass measurement and also the uh, prospect of the lepton flavor variant case. <coughs> On the uh, tau mass measurement, we have performed the, uh, ta this measurement using the early pellets data, 8.8 .8 investment one data. <laughs> And uh, in this measurement, uh, we select the uh, uh, three pi on in the signal side. Uh, sorry, E plus E mass goes to the tau plus E mass, and uh, another signal side tau decays to the three pi on. And we tag the, this event by a tag side, the one child track uh, decays. So <laughs> then measure the tau mass using the shield mass technique. Uh, developed by the Argus group, that we calculate that this should mass, minimum mass, uh, using the information of the, the momentum and energy of the, this three pi on. And uh, the current best value using this method is uh, obtained by the bell. The, the error is uh, about uh, 0.35 MeV. Uh, uh, but please note that, that, that the pair production at the threshold energy the measured by the best three shows that better result of the systematic and the static error. Yeah, anyway, the, uh, we select that this event, this kind of event, and calculate that this uh, minimum mass. And this is a uh, uh, minimum mass distribution. And we see a clear uh, shoulder at the, around the tau mass region. And so we, uh, by fitting this region, uh, we can get the uh, tau mass. <coughs> and uh, uh, anyway, uh, so dot is the data and the history is the Monte Carlo expectation. And we see a clear shoulder uh, in the data. So we'll discover the uh, tau pi event as a very two. <coughs> and uh, the zoom in view of the shoulder region is shown here. and. Uh, we extract the tau mass by fitting the empirical edge function as shown in the, this blue curve. And then we get the uh, preliminary result of the tau mass as shown in here. The statistical error is uh, 0 0.75 and stomatic error is 0 0.33 MeV. The summary of the systematic uncertainty is uh, listed here. The largest uncertainty from the, uh, the calibration of the momentum of the charged particles, and it is due to the B field map. <coughs> yeah, anyway, we got a similar systematic error with the previous B factory results we already get. And uh, we think uh, we can improve the using more data and more precise correction. Then achieve the best precision among the shield mass measurement. And here is a comparison with the um, PDG value and the best results and the previous value. 
Baba Rudyard and we get that this <coughs> result. Okay, next, uh, let me move on to the uh, prospect of the lepton flavor variation in tau decay. Uh, in the standard model, the LF, LFV is highly suppressed, even considering the neutrino oscillation, the, the branching ratio is very small. But uh, many extensions of the standard model predict the uh, LFV decays. So the branching ratio are enhanced at the highest uh, current expander limit. So the observation of this signal is a clear signature of the new field. And the tau lepton, uh, the heavy, so open the many uh, possible LFU decay modes. The, <coughs> and so we can search the several many, uh, we can reach the many uh, ex, uh, theoretical ex, uh, station predictions. And uh, the analysis of the tau LFV is uh, basically uh, following this way. The, we, uh, we will uh, search the, uh, this kind of event, E plus E minus goes to tau plus pi, tau minus and one tau decay to the LFV mode. So another tau decay to the, uh, some generic tau decay. So, so <coughs> the signal extraction is uh, made using the information that this uh, signal side information that uh, we fully reconstruct it, then the, uh, uh, make a uh, invariant mass of the signal side and the delta is, uh, it is the energy difference of the major the energy and the beam energy. <coughs> or maybe an oriented signal frame to reduce the population. Anyway, the, this is uh, some uh, Signal Monte Carlo expectation to tau to three mu that we can see uh, some concentration on the signal C region. So we will see a signal concentration around here. And in the analysis, we evaluate the background from the, this sideband region. The background contribution is small for the uh, three lepton modes because of the good PID performance. But uh, uh, if we See, consider the lepton gamma modes or well, some those lepton gamma modes, the background contribution is some is non-negligible. So this is the some expectation, the signal region here, but uh, we see uh, many uh, background around the signal. So the background reduction is an uh, uh, important uh, thing to in the analysis. So this is the uh, upper limit of the uh, uh, branching ratio measured by the uh, atlas Babar Bell Cleo SB uh, for the many uh, third LFB modes. And the Bell and Babar's reach the order of 10 to minus eight branching ratios, then LHB is improving the results in the already contacting this result <coughs> for the tau to three mu modes. And uh, this uh, tau to three lepton and lepton some charge meson modes shows a better sensitivity uh, compared to the, the lepton gamma mode. Uh, it is due to the less background. So this is important things. So <coughs> the, this is the future prospect of at the bell two, the, the future prospect of the peak luminosity and uh, the integrated luminosity in the blue curve. Now we will collect the uh, 50 inverse atom data by two, 2031 uh, with upper uh, detector and also the accelerator at, this, at some point. And uh, using this 50 inverse atom data, the, uh, this is the, ex, the tendency of the upper limit of the branching ratio and as a function of the luminosity, that this is a gray and the bare result, and uh, this is the expectation at the bell two. And uh, <coughs> using this 15 bus at one data, we will get the, uh, this branching ratio sensitivity is order of 10 to minus 10. So background suppression is key issue. So understanding the background, the background, fake PID, uh, understanding the importance. So now we are, going to improve the reconstruction algorithm. 
And also the intelligent event selection by machine learning technique is something important. So we are trying to improve. Okay, this is a summary. The uh, Belt experiment just started that we achieved the world record luminosity already, 2.4 times 10 to 34. And the accelerator tuning is ongoing, and the more data will be recorded. And also, the, we started the actual analysis, physics analysis, and the tau mass measurement by early data shows that we are tau discovery <coughs> and the promising sensitivity. And we get a preliminary result of this with this sensitivity. And the Bell 2 will collect the 5 times 10 to 10 tau pairs. So tau LF research will be reach the higher sensitivity. <coughs> and uh, we expect that the order of 10 to minus 10 branching ratios. Density. So we will get a more precise result with more data. So please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions to Kenzie? Please raise your hand. It seems not. Okay, so can you go to page seven? Yes. Okay, so in, so in future, uh, stomatic uncertainty will dominate this analysis. And the largest stomatic uncertainty is from B field map. So is there any prospect to improve the B-field map? Yes, the, we are going to make a more precise uh, momentum deconstruction the, by a calibration using the more data. So yeah, we think that we can improve more. Okay, so can, we, can you reach to the uh, uncertainty of Bell 3? S3, yeah, mm, maybe. <laughs> okay, so any other comments, questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Kenji. Thank you. So if you have further or question, you can go to uh, Matamoto chat. And the uh, next session we will resume at uh, 11.26, no, no, 11.29, sorry. And the speakers at the next session, please check your connection. So, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, Rusa. Yeah, hi. So, um, okay. I can't share the screen now, I think, right? Uh, no one is sharing, so you should be able to share it. Okay. So, can you see? Yes, and uh, let's see. In the full screen mode, do you see that uh, green square? Or no, it's okay? Don't. It's okay. Okay, okay thanks. Thanks. Can I also try hello. my my connection? Okay. Yep, yeah. hello, Marco. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, can you see my my screen sharing? Yes, I can. So maybe try to Let go full just... screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, I prefer to stay like this because uh, I can use the mouse uh, to point. Uh, otherwise, it seems like I cannot use it. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I think. Hopefully, it's again. fine. It's yeah, yeah. Really wide. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm, hi, hello, Usman. Please yeah, so can I can I check my connection? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So can you see the screen? 
Yes, we can. Will you go full screen or will you leave it yeah, like? Yeah, I'm just trying to yeah, go to full screen. Yeah. Oh, sorry, this is. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, the full screen works well. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks. Hello, may I try my yep. slide? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see the sharing. So if you try presentation, yeah, yes. it works well. Have we try to switch? Yes, yes, it works. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, uh, hello. Can I try my screen? Sharing my screen yes, and yes. check. Go ahead as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Uh, is it changing? Yeah. Okay. Maybe try. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it is changing. Yeah. yeah okay. Maybe. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. All right, so I think it's time to start. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. So I will be chairing the, the, the rest of the uh, Quark and Lepton flavor session. Uh, we will have mostly theory, theory talks, uh, actually with one uh, bell two talks about electronic uh, beta decays in between. And at the very end, uh, we will have a theory and experiment to talk about the G2. Uh, Mion G2 and uh, electric moment uh, measurements. So let's start with uh, with the first presentation. So Rusa will tell us about the angular analysis of modes with uh, B to C to electron and uh, new bar transitions and new physics. So please go ahead. Okay. So now you see my screen, right? Can you see? But I can't hear you. Sorry, ah, you, can okay. you can see it. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let me first thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work here. So I'll be talking on angular analysis of modes with B2 CL new transition and the new physics effects. So this talk is based on these two following publications. So first I will give a very brief introduction and then I will straightly move to the results in the theoretical framework. I won't describe the details because of the time constraints. I will, I will construct the observables in the decay modes. And at the third part of my talk, I will try to present the effect of new physics operators. And at the end, I will summarize. So we, we know that this angular distribution of multibody semi-leptonic decay modes are very powerful tool to access observables in B physics. The well-known example is this labor changing neutral current, B2 K star mu mu, or K star further decays to K pi. And we have this long-standing local tension in one of the angular coefficient P5 prime, which is here. We have 
this in the cube square range, which is the dial electron inverse mass square, we have a deviation at the level of two to three sigma yeah, in the four to eight GV square region, which has actually survived three results from LXCB, the, the data from run one, and also the recent analysis from the data taken from two th during 2016. What happened? Why I can't move? Sorry. Sorry for that, but I can't switch to the next window. Can you see my screen now? No, not. Okay. Maybe okay. if you, and maybe we should give up on full screen and it, it may work better. Sorry. Okay, now you can see? Yes, we can see it. So, um, and also we have this uh, discrepancy in the charge current mode, also with the well-known RD and RD star measurements. And from the recent HFLAV average, we have the combined deviation at the level of three sigma. And this also, this, this actually motivates us to measure the angular observables for this mode also. Uh, and this is a tree level process. So, from the theory side, it's much more cleaner than the flavor changing neutral current modes. So now uh, in this talk, I will discuss about the two excited charge, uh, excited charm states, the D star and the D2 star, where the D star is the vector meson and the D2 star is the tensor one. And they are roughly equal close in the mass, but the width for D star is really small and the D2 star has larger width, but still we can have the narrow width approximation, which is close to this width is close to the K star width in terms of in, in the flavor change neutral current decays. So there are previous analysis uh, for the full four body distribution for B2 D star L nu and when D star further decays to D pi. And recently with Anna, Clara and Tony Peak, we have also done the analysis where we include all possible dimension six, dimension six operators and we also include the right-handed neutrinos. And in a separate study, we also studied the, the distribution for D2 star, the tension measure. And it, this has the same quark level transition and also the same final state, D pi and one lepton and the neutrino. So it provides a complementary information until now, only Bell and Babar has the measurements for the, the product of the bunching functions, which is roughly at the order of 10 to the power minus three. And it also provides some important background for RD star measurement. So in the theoretical framework, we start this dimension six general Hamiltonian, where these O's are the four fermion operators. And we include both the correlatives for the quark current and the lepton current. And we have the different Lorentz structures, the scalar and the vector, and also the tensor meson. And when these are sandwiched between the between the meson states, we have the form factors, the non-perturbative inputs in the in the amplitude. And the C's are the Wilson coefficients. Now in the standard model, this decay mode is only the charge current mediated by W. So we have only the V minus A structure. And that's why the other, all the C's are zero in the standard model and we have quite simple distribution. And this beyond standard model physics can, can induce new Wilson coefficients. And I move straight to the distribution done in the well-known helicity frame where the B meson is at the rest. And we know that the, the D star or D2 star and the W goes back to back with each other in this rest frame. And we define the angle theta D, which is theta D, which is the angle of the D with the initial direction of D and D or D2 star. And the theta L is the angle for the lepton with the, with the same direction. And there is also another angle phi, which is the, the, the angle between the two decay planes formed by this product. 
and in the left side of the of the slide we see the distribution for d star in terms of all these three angles and in the right side it is for d2 star i am not going into the details how we got this full angular distribution basically these angular coefficients are functions of transversity amplitudes which are actually the projections of the particular polarization of the d or d2 d star or d2 star into the into the um, amplitudes and i would refer to the the my backup slide for the detailed expression of these i is the angular coefficients and one can see a distinct feature between the, these two distributions because one is the spin one and another is the spin two meson meson and so these are quite easily distinguishable in terms of theta d and experimentally one can one can access all these coefficients so another uh, easily distinguishable distribution is in terms of the in angular distribution in terms of theta d so this can be effective when we have the low statistics because we don't need to fit i mean if we don't have any data we can't fit all the coefficients which i showed in the previous slide so here you can see that the first line i have the mm, distribution for d star and by measuring the coefficients one can have the transverse polarization for d star and also the longitudinal polarization for d star and in the second line i similarly have a different different coefficients so this is quite easily distinguishable and this is actually the artifact of the the effect of higher partial wave in this between these two modes now mm, the the difference in inputs in these two modes they have the same quark level transition so in terms of new physics we will have the same wilson coefficients but from the theory side we have different mesons so we have different form factors now for d star there there are many analyses in in terms of different theoretical approach the hqt the light cone sum rule and also from the lattice and for d2 star there are relatively com um, relatively less studies and recently there was the result from light cone sum rule where we have the all all form factors for like the, the tensor currents including the tensor currents for the quark sector and we also construct some cp averaged asymmetries so in shown in the first part of the slide so the first one is the well known afb in terms of the lepton angle and then we also define some other asymmetries the a4a5 a7a8 depending upon how we integrate on different angular coefficients different angles and here this capital gamma bar is the the decay width for the conjugate mode which has the flip sign in terms of the weak phase so due to the difference in convention one should note that there exists a different sign between different asymmetries for example a4 comes with the plus sign between gamma and gamma bar whether whereas the for a5 we have the negative sign because it has it has flipped the sign in the mode and we we can also access some other observables uh, from the phi angular distribution the a3 and a9 by measuring the coefficients for cos 2 phi and sin 2 phi terms and we find that this a3 a4 a5 and afb they are proportional to the real part of the amplitude whereas the a7 a8 a9 they are proportional to the imaginary part and in the standard model we don't have any imaginary part for this decay mode and these are the null tests for the standard model now after uh, defining all the observables i move to the section where discussing about the new physics effects so this one is done uh, when we actually in a effective theory approach so basically in this work we focused on the operators which are generated when we include the right handed neutrinos in the in the decay mode contributing in this b2 d star l new decay mode and we fit the observables in terms of bsm operators we also include the differential branching fraction in q square and the limits of the from the leptonic purely leptonic channels from the from the theoretical perspective and in the table i just show very few uh, results for the mediators for example 
the scalar leptoquark X1, R2 tilde, and also the vector lepto1, leptoquark E1. And for the full table, I would refer to our work where we, where we have analyzed all possible scenarios which can arise in this context of the right-handed neutrino. And in the second column, I have the operators which, which contribute to these decay modes. And in some cases, they are related. For example, the scalar and the tensor for the S1 or the R2 tilde, they are related at the, at the leptoquark scale. And in the third column, I show the pool, which, are, which is actu actually the, the measure of the, the statistical, it's a statistical estimate where one can say at what extent the standard model only hypothesis is excluded. So larger the pool means that the better the expansion in terms of the new physics operators with the data. And so you can see the larger we find here for S1 leptoquark and U1 vector leptoquark. And in the last column, I show the best fit values for the Wilson coefficients, those which are only non-zero at the one sigma level. So as I mentioned, this is only the subset of the mediators. And I just choose them because I want to show their effects in terms of the angular observables. So here are the here are the plots on so the upper upper row I have for the longitudinal polarization fraction for if for the D star and the forward backward asymmetry for D star and the lower row I have the angular few the angular terms the I1, I1s, I1 C and S, and then I5. So one can see the standard model is actually the the black curve and the big thick curve is actually the, the case, which is in the previous case, if I go back, the first case where we include the, all the right-handed operators and the, and the standard model like operator OLL. So in this case, we have large uncertainties in the Wilson coefficients and that's why the bands are really fat. So even we can see that after including the uncertainties from, for the Wilson coefficients, we can actually fit the with the, we can actually distinguish the different scenarios when, when, when we look at the angular coefficients or the angular observables. And there are also distinguishable scenarios in terms of, for example, for R2 tilde in the low Q square region for I1S and I5, and also for this one, the purple brown band. So basically this tells us even the pool, in terms of pool, when we say that this new physics scenario is preferable, they are roughly equal. But, but in terms of the angular coefficients, one can distinguish the different new physics scenarios easily. So this actually motivates to, to measure these angular coefficients. Now I come to the, my summary slide. So I motivated why we need the full forward angular distribution. And for the charge current transition, the theory side is of course less complicated compared to the flavor changing neutral mode where we can have the the situations, for example, the non-factorizable contributions and, the, and, and, and here we have nothing like that. But of course, they are difficult in terms of experimental situation because we have the neutrinos in the final state. Uh, I try to motivate um, that these two uh, mesons, the D star and the D2 star, they are easily separable. I didn't have time to mention about how the zero crossing of the asymmetries provide the relation among um, form factors and those can also be verified from data. And the last point is that we should be cautious while dealing about tau's in the final state because it will give rise to multi many neutrinos and those scenarios are actually experimentally challenging. And if one can also consider the further decays of tau into, into hadrons and those will modify the angular distribution. So that's all, thanks. Thank you very much for, for, for the interesting suggestion for the measurement. So are there any questions, comments from people connected? Okay, I do not see any, uh, well, is there Hello. Of, hello, ah, there is one. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I, sorry. I, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. May I ask a question? Sure. 
question. Yeah, uh, about the lepton, the muon is much heavier than electron and tau is much more heavier than a muon or yes. electron. So I was wondering if there is a certain term which could be more sensitive with heavier leptons. There is a certain what? Can you certain uh, distribution which could be more sensitive with heavier, heavy, mut heavy mass mut leptons. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, in the low Q square region, you can see the effect for the angular, um, for, for all angular asymmetries. In the low Q square region, you will have quite distinct effect between tau and muon. But as I mentioned, for tau, one really actually has to consider the further distribution while considering the decay of tau. So okay. Tau, yeah. Yeah. okay. What if we compare electron and muon? Then it's perfectly fine. But yeah, in the low Q square region, you will have different signature for all of all the observables. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, then uh, let's continue with the next presentation, which will be by uh, Suman Kubakar and on the signatures of complex new physics in uh, B2C tau mu anomalies. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see the screen. Yes. Okay, so uh, I will discuss this uh, uh, the signatures of uh, complex new physics in B2 C tau mu transitions. And the talk is based on this archive number. Yeah, so this is a brief outline of my talk uh, where basically <clears throat> we'll talk about the new physics solutions of B2 C tau mu anomalies where we assume that the new physics Wilson coefficients are complex. And we particularly particularly pay attention to the uh, CP violating uh, triple product asymmetries and what could be the largest possible uh, CP violating asymmetries uh, from the current data in in this sector. Yeah, so the standard model is well established and uh, and the uh, right hand. Uh, the figure on the right hand side actually show the different uh, interactions between the uh, all possible particles in the standard model and all the interactions are gauge interactions and these gauge interactions are identical for the three generation of flavors and uh, those, so the standard model demands uh, the universality of lipton flavor and uh, in b to cl new decays uh, so these two ratios rd and rd star are quite good candidate uh, to test this universality because uh, there is minimal theoretical uncertainty due to almost cancellation of hadronic form factors. And also the present uh, standard model accuracy is of the order of uh, 1%. And uh, uh, the story has been started by uh, Babar at 2012, and there have been several uh, consecutive measurements by LHCB and Bell. But the present measurement, including the latest Bell measurement to 2009, the global average stands here, the red ellipse, and the standard model uh, uh, of these ratios uh, is presented by this cross sign. So the deviation comes down from four sigma to three sigma. Uh, and these two ratios indicate towards the violation of lepton flavor universality. And uh, so uh, what can we learn from these uh, measurements? So all these decays are mediated by this charged current transition, which occurs at tree level, B to C L nu. And uh, as it is happening at uh, tree level, so it is much more cleaner than the other FCNC transitions. And the measurement of this flavor ratios, RD and RD star, indicate that the mechanism of happening, the B to C tau nu transition is not uh, similar to the uh, B to C uh, and lighter leptons plus a neutrino. So there could be two possibilities, and these these all these anomalies could be uh, hint uh, for a new physics, and there could be two possibilities: either new physics in B to C electron or muon plus a neutrino transition. But this is highly disfavored because of the other measurements, R D mu by E and R D star E by mu. So the only possibility is to assume new physics in B to C tau new transition. So we assume that, and uh, instead of this R day, R day star, we have other measurements like R z psi, which is 1.7 sigma higher than the SM prediction, and the P tau d star, that is the uh, tau polarization in B2 d star tau nu decay, 
and this is uh, consistent with the standard model but uh, the uh, statistical error is quite high and apart from that we have a uh, recent measurement of longitudinal polarization fraction of d star meson uh, and uh, the measured value is 1.6 sigma higher than sm prediction so we consider an effective field theory and we define our uh, most general effective hamiltonian uh, by this equation where the ovl stands for the standard model contribution where it has the standard structure v minus a times v minus a and the second part of the equation corresponds to the new contribution from the new physics and we set the new physics scale at lambda equals to 1 tv and there could be three ways to connect these four fermions so these are the three ways uh, and uh, from each of the diagram we can get uh, one different set of operators so we can get three sets of operators y y prime and y double prime in particular this y can uh, give rise to any new uh, gauge bosons whereas this uh, y prime and y double prime can lead to uh, the lepto quark models and uh, these are the explicit explicit structures of all, all operators corresponding to these three sets and uh, here i have to emphasize that for single primed and double primed operator can be written in terms of the unprimed operators the first set of operators those are the standard operators and uh, by using fears transformation and in writing these uh, operators we have assumed that the neutrinos are left chiral now what we have done we have uh, defined our chi square or uh, where we have considered all theoretical and experimental correlations into account and we assume that the new physics wilson coefficients are complex and we fit uh, we, we minimize the chi chi square by using minimit library Uh, to calculate the new physics wilson coefficients and we perform this fit uh, by taking only one operator at a time and we choose those uh, wilson coefficients as the best fit solution which fall in chi square minimum less than 4.5 so we got these four solutions cvl csl prime ct double prime and csl uh, with these minimum chi square values and the pool values Uh, so these are the new physics uh, parameter spaces for those four solutions uh, at the at those uh, real and imaginary planes uh, where the uh, red dots are actually the best fit solutions and uh, in particular there is a crucial role from the purely leptonic decay of bc meson and bc to tau nu uh, on particularly on the scalar and pseudo scalar uh, new physics because uh, for those interactions actually the helicity separation is lifted for this decay so uh, the and the standard model prediction for this decay is is very very small that is around 2% we consider here three different upper limits for uh, for this uh, decay so the first one is the 10% uh, which is calculated from the lep data uh, which is an admixture of bc to tau nu and bu to tau nu decays at the z peak and uh, the second one is the 30% which is obtained from the lifetime of bc meson uh and the th- however these two uh, upper limits could be overestimated or uh, could be very conservative so taking all uh, uh, uncertainties into account one can relax this uh, this constraint up to 60% which is not that much conservative so we consider these three different uh, upper limits for this uh, for this decay and we implemented uh, this constraint on our new physics solutions and we got this final picture of the of the four new physics solutions where you can see we have plotted uh, three different ranges for the uh, bc to tau nu decay the green region corresponds to the uh, constraint where the upper limit is 10% and the yellow region uh, corresponds to the uh, uh, corresponds to the upper limit uh, i mean the range of bc to tau nu from 10 to 30% and the uh, violet region corresponds to the region of bc to tau nu from 30 to 60% so the cvl solution if you look at this figure the cvl solution is well uh, well acceptable from uh, from the lep data which is b to c bc to tau nu 10% but uh, for csl prime solution uh, the whole one sigma region falls within the uh, range of 10 to 30% and the ct double prime uh, solution region falls within the range of 30 to 60% but uh, the fourth solution is marginally disturbed because only a small fraction of the one sigma region falls within the uh, 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 range of constraint from 30 to 60% but we can consider that 
so let's move to the predictions for the cp violating asymmetries okay so the kinematics uh, so one can decay one can uh, one can uh, describe this uh, four body quasi four body decay where the d star is decaying into d pi uh, can be parameterized uh, parameterized uh, in terms of four variables that are already defined in the previous talk so i am not going through it uh, so one can uh, get three different uh, cp violating triple products in b2 d star dk by integrating over uh, different ranges of theta tau and theta d so these are the equations where you can see uh, the coefficients of sin phi and sin 2 phi are actually giving the uh, cp violating triple products because those are odds under uh, under under cp transformations so this is a, so this is for the decay of b2 d star tau nu and if you go to the cp conjugate mode then you can get similar three a triple product asymmetry triple products uh, those can be denoted as a t bar where the weak phases change as sign and uh, you can define the asymmetry between uh, between the decay and its cp conjugate mode so these are the three asymmetries and they are essentially zero for in for the standard model and uh, we have calculated the predictions for uh, for for these asymmetries for the new physics based fit solutions so here we have plotted the first and third uh, triple product asymmetries so the first and third triple product asymmetry depend only on the v minus a times v minus a interaction which has the same lorentz structure as the standard model so for the ovl solution it is essentially zero these two asymmetries but for the other solution these are also zero because uh, these two asymmetry doesn't depend on csl prime and ct prime uh, the operator corresponding to these solutions but for uh, the second uh, asymmetry the situation is different uh, the second asymmetry depends on these three operators ovl osl and ot but the standard model is but but the ovl solution uh, predicts these these asymmetry is also zero Uh, which is consistent with the standard model but for the other solutions osl prime and ot double prime solutions they are actually linear combination of osl and ot operators therefore we find that we have plotted this asymmetry as a function of q square where this black curve corresponds to the csl prime solution and blue curve blue curve corresponds to the ct double prime solution so for osl double prime solution the this asymmetry reaches to a maximum only up to 0.7% whereas the uh, for the ot double prime solution uh, this asymmetry reaches to a maximum value of 1.7% at 5 gb square but if you uh, choose some benchmark point from the one sigma allied region and try to maximize this asymmetry then you can find that the you can find that uh, uh, you can find that the uh, this asymmetry the second asymmetry is almost same Um, um, for the for the maximum value of of csl and ct double prime however if we consider the case of marginally uh, disturbed solution osl then you can see uh, there is a maximum this red curve which represent by this red curve uh, the, the maximum value of the cp asymmetry for the second uh, asymmetry uh, it reaches uh, around 2.7% at 5 gb square so uh, the uh, the the concluding line is that the maximum value of cp violating triple product asymmetry is around 3% which is only due to the scalar new physics solutions yeah so apart from that we have uh, we have uh, predicted the values of angular observables which are yet to be measured like a uh, tau polarization and, and 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 forward backward asymmetry in b2d tau nu and the forward backward asymmetry in b2d star tau nu decay and we have predicted uh, these observable for the best fit solutions and we observe that the uh, for all the solution for all these three observables uh, the prediction for all these three observable are essentially same for the ovl solution but however uh, the forward backward asymmetry uh, in in both the decays have quite have, have different predictions for the last two solutions uh, uh, other than the uh, than the cvl solution so let's come to the summary so the discrepancy in rdr distor has been reduced from uh, 4 to 3 sigma however uh, we assume the new physics wilson and coefficients to be complex and we find that the ovl is the only solution uh, which is allowed by the constraint bc to tau nu less than 10% and if you relax the constraint to 30 or 60% then you can get one or two additional new physics solutions
and these forward backward asymmetries in in b2d and d start out decays are quite useful to distinguish these two solutions from the other uh, from the from the um, the ovl solution and the, regarding the cp violation uh, asymmetry uh, the mildly disfavored solution which is the scalar new physics solution uh, uh, that predicts the maximum value. It is around 3% for the second uh, triple product asymmetry among all other solutions. And uh, in experimental perspective view, to measure this forward backward asymmetry and this uh, triple product asymmetry, one needs to do the reconstruction of the tau lepton momentum, uh, which is quite difficult because of the, uh, because of the missing neutrino. But uh, LHCB had tried to reconstruct the tau using three pi and decay and all that. But uh, however, we think that uh, uh, high luminosity LHC may have potential to do do this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So are there any questions from the people connected? Okay, it does not seem to be the case. No. In that case, I would encourage people to to, to put question to the Mattermost channel in case uh, they they find find it uh, find some in the in the later time. Okay, so thank you, Shmar, again for 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 showing us uh, this uh, result and. Let's move uh, to the next talk, which is an experiment about, by Marco Milesi about the leptonic and leptonic decays with Taus at Bellevue experiment. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. And I hope you can see also the slides. Yes, we can. Okay. So yeah, let me start. First of all, I also want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present at ICHEP. I'm Marco Milesi. I'm presenting on behalf of the Bell2 collaboration, showing the first preliminary results on leptonic and semi-leptonic decays with TAUs at Bell2 and also some prospects for the future. So first of all, uh, let me give some brief motivation for why it's interesting to study uh, uh, tauonic and semi-tauonic BDKs. Uh, first of all, because as it was said in the previous talks, they are a powerful test for lepton flavor universality violation, uh, especially uh, some discrepancies that at the moment we see for, for example, the RD star uh, ratios, uh, which are at the level of three sigma, as it was said, uh, could be explained, for example, by beyond standard model uh, Higgs, like the two Higgs tablet models, which of course uh, will stronger uh, couple to the tau leptons uh, and also other new physics models such as laptop works. But not only that, uh, uh, the tauonic uh, BDKs uh, represent also a complementary set of measurements of uh, CKM parameters such as VUB uh, to complement uh, the standard light lepton semi leptonic channel measurements. Uh, and this goes as inputs to the CKM global fits. So we can extract uh, information also for this. So, uh, as you know, uh, it was presented uh, previously. Uh, Bell 2 is an upgrade of Bell at the Super Keck B uh, Collider facility, which is expected to uh, eventually operate at 40 times higher uh, instantaneous luminosity than Keck B used to have, so about six times uh, 10 to the 35. And Bell 2 uh, represents a major upgrade of the Bell detector uh, in order to cope with the harsher uh, conditions from being background because of the higher luminosity. And also Bell 2 underwent major improvements uh, in the software side and the detector side in reconstruction, in particular for what concerns the tracking, uh, vertexing capabilities and particle identification. So as of today, uh, Bell 2 has collected uh, about 75 uh, inverse femtobars of data, uh, and the actual data set uh, uh, used for the studies uh, presented today is only uh, roughly a half of that, so 35 inverse femtobars pretty much. This, of course, uh, is a data sample that is too limited for performing uh, B uh, tauonic or semi tauonic uh, physics measurement. However, this was enough to start uh, a study of the data to Monte Carlo comparisons to demonstrate uh, 
how well we actually understand the detector and how well we can uh, reconstruct uh, the events. Uh, I anticipate uh, that we will be uh, expecting the first measurements uh, with tau leptons uh, with about uh, 200 inverse femtobarns, and this is uh, essentially what we can achieve next year in 2021. So moving to the event reconstruction strategy, uh, the uh, general idea here is that from the Upsilon for SDK, we try to reconstruct uh, one side, uh, one of the bees, uh, which is what we call the tag side, uh, and we use this uh, to uh, constrain uh, uh, the flavor and the kinematics of the other bee, which we call signal side. There are different ways of doing tagging from uh, the highest efficiency and less information. We have the inclusive tag, then going to the less efficient, but with the strongest information to constrain is the adronic tag, where we have an exact knowledge of the tag side because we reconstruct everything. And so we can put strong constraints on variables like the beam constrained bus or the difference of the energy of the B tag and the beam. As far as the B tauonic decays are concerned, most often we reconstruct the B signal through leptonic decays of the tau because we, in this way, we minimize as much as possible the backgrounds. So, as I said, uh, we reconstruct uh, the tag, uh, and in order to do this, uh, we exploit uh, an algorithm called full event interpretation. Uh, this was presented at ICHEP a couple of days ago by Will Sutcliffe, uh, and essentially this algorithm is a large set of hierarchical BDT classifiers that are trained on a huge number of possible BDK channels, uh, uh, combined together in order to try to identify completely the tag. Uh, of course, the final efficiency that we reach uh, for uh, like an adronic tagging, uh, it's pretty low. However, this uh, achieves uh, a pretty good purity uh, of order up to 60% uh, with the current setup. Uh, and I want to remind that the full event interpretation has been already successfully exploited in the RD star uh, measurement with the semi leptonic tag analysis on Bell data that was analyzed with the Bell 2 software and that was presented the last year at Morion. And this uh, to date uh, represented the most uh, precise uh, measurement of RD and RD star uh, that we have available. Let me uh, give you a bit further insight on what are the relevant observables for BDKs with Taus. First of all, one important observable is the momentum of the lepton in the BCMA reference frame, uh, which is crucially dependent on how well we can uh, identify leptons. And this is challenging because leptons from the Tau decay will have a lower momentum, and this is a delicate uh, uh, region of phase space uh, to uh, separate leptons from the rest of the background. I will also call Missima squared, uh, which essentially in events with Taus uh, will have uh, uh, large values because of the many neutrinos and can be used to separate the signal from B to XL nu or pure adronic final stakes, uh, which will have uh, a value of missing mass squared closer to zero. And finally, we have the EECL variable, which essentially is the energy in the calorimeter of all the neutral particles that are not used in the reconstruction of uh, both the signal or the tag. And this quantity, we expect it to peak uh, closer to zero for well-reconstructed signal events with tau and spread to higher values uh, for, uh, for the background. As I said, uh, lepton identification is particularly important. Uh, and so far, we have already performed some measurements in data of the lepton ID performance and also the hadron misidentification uh, probability, uh, calibrating the simulation to data with several uh, what we call standard candles to cover as much momentum range as possible. I put here in the table uh, what are the channels that we studied. So for lepton efficiency, J side case to leptons, or for lepton final states, or radiative BABA and immune for higher momentum leptons. And for hadron misidentification, we use K short to pi pi, uh, um, adronic decays of the tau, or D star to D zero K pi pi, which is useful both for the pi on uh, mis-ID probability, but also the K one. And the plots here essentially show you the distribution of the lepton momentum to show how the different uh, momentum region probed by the different measurements are. And you can check out the new result uh, in the link I put here in the slide. And this is the result for a representative bin uh, in the uh, barrel region, so the central region of the detector in polar angle uh, for electrons and muons, uh, for efficiency and fake rates uh, for pions and k-ions. 
and essentially we see that we have uh, achieved a pretty good efficient, a pretty good uh, pion rejection uh, for like an efficiency of about uh, ninety percent for momenta greater than one GB. We are also working to improve uh, the lepton identification at low momentum. This is critical because at low momentum, we cannot really exploit uh, all the sub detectors, in particular, the outermost uh, K long immune detector because of the bending of the tracks in the magnetic field, uh, which means they will not reach uh, the KLM. And therefore, we developed a method to combine uh, uh, lots of observables from the calorimeter in a boosted decision tree uh, to improve the lepton hadron separation. The, the preliminary results that we have in simulation are very encouraging. We have a large factor reduction in the pion electron fake rate and uh, also a sizable reduction in the pion to muon fake rate for a moment less than one GB. Going on to the preliminary results uh, for full leptonic B2 tau new decays. Uh, this is a, a test bench for the capabilities of Bell 2 of performing event reconstruction in these final states. We considered only the electron decay of the tau and we used uh, the Adronic uh, FEI uh, tagging using the selection that I highlight here in the table if you want to see the details. But essentially, what we achieve on the tag side is a distribution of the beam constraint mass, which is pretty well modeled uh, by, by simulation in data, and we achieve a 50% purity for correctly reconstructed beta candidates by fitting the MBC distribution. And uh, to uh, suppress the continuum, uh, we uh, at the moment we do something pretty simple. We just cut on the angular distribution of the trust axis of the B tag uh, with respect to the rest of the event, uh, where uh, in the B tag events we expect more spherical uh, uh, symmetry of the topology, whereas in continuum uh, we will expect more jet like distribution. So for electron candidates uh, from the signal, we require momenta greater than 500 MeV and a good level of electron identification. And we check the distribution of the EECL that I talked about before. And we also check the sum of the missing energy plus the moment missing momentum in the center of mass frame, as you see in the plots here. And the statistics that we have now is very limited, uh, but however, we can already tell that there is a pretty good modeling of background uh, in the signal enriched regions. Uh, so high E miss uh, and CP miss and uh, close to zero ECL with the statistics we have. And so we can demonstrate the potential for observing B2 tau new with a larger data set. Another improvement that we are um, uh, we have achieved is to uh, try to suppress the beam background uh, contamination uh, for the signal in the tail of the ECL distribution. And to do this, uh, we developed the BDT uh, to exploit the calorimetric cluster shower shapes and angular position in the context of the B0 DL new analysis, training the algorithm on uh, mu mu final states where we are very good at identifying beam background clusters. And if we look at the ECL after applying this uh, BDT, we see that the distribution becomes more peak towards zero, which is what we what we want. In terms of prospects uh, for uh, leptonic and semi-leptonic BDKs with tau, for a B2 tau new, we expect to reach five sigma observation with 2.6 uh, inverse actobarns, uh, with a total uncertainty on the branching ratio of around 10% uh, with uh, about five uh, inverse actobarns. Uh, and as for the uh, RD and RD star, we expect a 5% order precision with five in inverse actobarns. Uh, and uh, with the entire 50 actobarns uh, uh, data set of Bell, we expect to have a precision that is uh, comparable to the 1% precision from the theory of the standard model uh, on, the, on the actual value of the ratio. And in the future, as it was mentioned before, we will also be able to measure observables that are sensitive to new physics effects, like the polarization of the tau and the D star, or study the kinematic distributions like U square and the momentum of the lepton that were not really, uh, um, uh, like we couldn't really tell much uh, with the Bell data, uh, but we expect to be able to uh, see any effect uh, with the full Bell 2 data set. There's going to be some important experimental challenges uh, in this analysis, in particular studying the backgrounds, like the background from B to D double star L nu, which is critical because the lepton here will be soft, so resemble the one created from the tau. Uh, and uh, this channel will require measuring the branching ratios with very good precision and also improve uh, the phi zero reconstruction efficiency to 
uh, suppress this kind of decays in exclusive analysis. Uh, uh, as you see in this plot, this is a bell analysis. Uh, this background is quite important for, uh, for this uh, Taiwanic analysis. Then uh, for inclusive B2X tau analysis, we also want to be good at handling background from the leptonic charm decays, so the cascade B2D L mu. Uh, and also, given this analysis will have large background yield, we want also to be very good at uh, measuring the branching ratios of the background processes with high precision. So to conclude, the operations of Bell 2 are in full swing. Uh, the first analysis uh, on uh, B decays with tau uh, successfully test improved techniques uh, for reconstructing events like the full event interpretation. Uh, the preliminary studies uh, on lepton identification uh, show good performance uh, and we uh, anticipate exciting developments to be tested in physics analysis. And also we will uh, hopefully present uh, more interesting results on beta one final states uh, uh, next year with more data. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco. So are there any questions from people connected? Okay, it's really very nice to see that uh, we will have uh, pretty good measurements already with, the, with below five in this autobahn. So I was wondering on the previous slide when you mentioned the uh, uh, that we need uh, precise uh, branching ratio measurements for, for, for the Monte Carlo processes, I guess, for the backgrounds and so on. But do you have an idea? Are we talking about older, better precision and uh, whether you it will be Bell 2 who will measure it or basically all the other experiments? Uh, I mean, we do expect Bell 2 to be able to measure uh, these background processes uh, autonomously. Uh, in particular, the B to D double star, uh, it's going to be uh, to be studied uh, as soon as we have more data. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then thank you, Marco, again. Again, I uh, remind people to put more questions to the Metamos chat. And let's move uh, to the next presentation, which is uh, which is by uh, Lopa Mudra, uh, uh, who will present to us the flavor, uh, flavorful in a double doublet dark matter. So another field shock. So Lopa Mudra, can you go ahead? Yeah, Marco, please try to stop sharing because otherwise, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, I can see the slides. But I cannot hear you. Are you talking? I'll probably mute it, I guess. Lupamudra, uh, can, can you try to, ah, yeah. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, thanks. Mm, yes, uh, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so now can you hear me and see the slide? Yes, you can. Okay. okay, yeah. So firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to give, uh, talk about my work. Uh, today I will talk about the flavorful inner double dark matter, which is uh, based on this work mentioned here. So as we all know that lepton flavor universality is uh, sacred in the standard model, but uh, anomalous results are reported in the semi-leptonic PT case, which hint at the presence of new physics. I mean, we have been hearing a lot about the observables RTR star, RTR star, and so on, which uh, deviate from their uh, standard model expectations by more than uh, 2.5 or 3 sigma and so on. Apart from these long-standing anomalies, we also have measurements of the magnetic moments of the muon and electron. And uh, in spite of the very precise predict standard model predictions, uh, the respective experimental uh, 
uh, measurements deviate from the standard model pre prediction by 3.7 sigma in case of the muon and the negative 2.4 sigma in case of the electron. Uh, we have also heard of, uh, talks on the by the Koto experiment where uh, they reported three signal events in the KL to pi nu nu uh, branching fraction and uh, where the standard model expectation is uh, uh, zero event there. So the question that I want to address is whether a dark sector can uh, address all these anomalies together. And by the dark sector, I choose the inner Higgs doublet model, which is a very simple extension of the standard model. Uh, and uh, it was first proposed by Ernest Ma back in 1977. So apart from the usual Higgs uh, doublet, we have another uh, doublet H2, which is odd under a discrete Z2 symmetry. And therefore, the lightest uh, neutral component of this doublet becomes a stable dark matter candidate. Now, the inert Higgs uh, doublet is known to satisfy the correct relic abundance only in uh, two specific uh, dark matter mass ranges, one when the mass is between 50 to 90 GeV and uh, the other case when the mass is uh, greater than 500 GeV. But because the inert Higgs is, I mean, as, as I said, it's inert, it does not couple directly to the standard model fermion. So achieving lepton fever universality violation uh, with only the inert Higgs is not possible. So we further extend uh, this inert Higgs doublet model with an additional uh, vector-like lepton and a down-type vector-like quark, which are also odd under the discrete Zeta symmetry. And therefore, they can couple to the standard model lepton doublet and quark doublet via the inert Higgs as shown here. And the couplings that I mentioned here are flavor non, uh, family non-universal. So with this framework, we aim to simultaneously explain the dark matter relic abundance, which has been precisely measured by the Planck satellite, uh, and also abide by the direct detection constraints provided by the xenon wonton collaboration, as shown here, and uh, also be able to uh, explain the RKR star anomaly and the muon G minus two anomaly. So the model contributions, we have contributions to the semi-leptonic uh, effective operators O9 and O10 through these box and penguin diagrams as shown here, where uh, the scalar, uh, neutral scalar here can be either A0 or A0. For the annihilation diagrams, apart from the usual inner Higgs doublet annihilation channels like this uh, S uh, channel Higgs mediated annihilation or other channels, we have additional uh, T-channel annihilations due to the presence of the uh, vector-like fermions in our model. So uh, we make a few assumptions regarding the coupling. So we assume that the octagonal couplings are much smaller than the diagonal ones for simplicity. And uh, in order to also ensure lepton universality violation, we further assume a hierarchical structure in the diagonal couplings. For example, we consider uh, that lambda 1, 1, which we call lambda E, is much smaller than lambda 2, 2, which we rename as lambda mu. So we have contributions to lepton flavor violating uh, decays as shown here. And uh, uh, we can see here in this plot, I've shown that uh, for a few hundred GV vector-like fermion masses, uh, uh, lambda mu of the order of, I mean, even higher than one is uh, still allowed by the current data. A similar uh, hierarchical structure in the quark sector also helps us to overcome uh, and be to excess gamma. And as I've shown here, uh, for vector-like quark mass not less than, uh, say, 500 GV, uh, lambda B uh, as high as uh, one uh, is allowed by the data. So uh, with that, we can uh, fix a few of the other couplings. And for simplicity, we consider that all three generations of the vector-like uh, fermions are mass degenerate. So we then uh, scan the parameter space of these uh, the, the relevant couplings and the masses. And the correlations are shown here. So uh, the red uh, patch uh, is uh, the parameter space which satisfy the relic uh, constraints, that is the relic abundance and the uh, direct detection constraints. And the blue points uh, here uh, actually satisfy all the uh, B2SLL uh, DK constraints, for example, the RKRK star, branching fraction of BS to mu mu, and um, uh, other BB bar mixing, and so on. 
so uh, and when we additionally uh, put the constraint of the uh, muon uh, sorry we uh, additionally put the constraint of the muon magnetic moment the blue points shrink to this uh, green points that are shown here so uh, as you can see that uh, we have two distinct uh, patches for lambda b one when lambda b is small and the other when lambda b is high and um, uh, the small lambda b is actually disfavored because it does not satisfy the relic constraints but uh, we have uh, seen that if we lift the mass degeneracy then the parameter space increases so in the cyan is the, now the uh, region allowed uh, by uh, the relic constraint so which also accommodates the low lambda b data for the high mass dark matter on the other hand we we actually require uh, the, the lambda mu to be uh, quite high like much greater than 1 uh, in order to uh, satisfy the rk rk star constraints uh, but such a large lambda mu actually makes the relic underabundant so we uh, do not obtain uh, simultaneous solutions for both and so we discard this solution uh, we then uh, try to study uh, some collider signatures at the LHC and these are the few benchmark points that we uh, choose and uh, we study specifically the dilepton plus uh, missing ET final state and the digest plus missing ET final state and uh, here I'm, I'm showing you the dis uh, distribution of the events. So the red ones are the signal events and the others are the background. Uh, this is the dielectron invariant mass distribution. Uh, and uh, this is the HT distribution and ET distribution. As you can see for benchmark point one, we observe a huge uh, number of signal events uh, over the background. So when we put a uh, a cut on the dilepton uh, final state, uh, a cut on MLL greater than 200 GV and HT greater than 280 GV. Uh, we find that the signal significance actually crosses the 5 sigma uh, mark even at the present uh, luminosity reach of the LHC. And uh, because uh, LHC has not seen any excess in these channels, so we can uh, clearly say that uh, benchmark point 1 is in danger. And if you remember, I had highlighted the benchmark. Uh, in green color so it actually that benchmark uh, in that benchmark we had considered quite uh, low mass uh, fermions both for the uh, uh, vector like lepton and the vector like quark and uh, so we can say that they are uh, ruled out we are uh, for the digest uh, we also see a great significance for dp1 high significance so which again we can put a bound on the masses in case of uh, on the on the vector like quark mass from that the other benchmark points uh, will not be really uh, accessible even at the very high luminosity reach of the LHC. Uh, now i would uh, talk a little bit on another extension uh, of the standard model which also includes the inert higgs doublet so uh, we all know that uh, extending the standard model gauge group by uh, u1 gauge symmetry is uh, quite popular uh, we have uh, the well-known U1 B minus L and U1 L mu minus L tau are quite some extensions that are uh, uh, studied uh, with respect to the uh, this uh, flavor anomalies. And uh, most often, uh, we, uh, we uh, in order to cancel the gauge anomalies that arise uh, you know, while extending the gauge symmetry, we, we add chiral fermions, mostly right under neutrinos. Uh, to the theory and uh, in case that they, these right-handed neutrinos are all uh, z2 odd uh, so that one of them can become a dark matter candidate, uh, we require an inner Higgs doublet model in order to uh, achieve uh, small neutrino mass generation via this one loop scotogenic mechanism, the diagram I'm show, uh, shown here in the right. So, um, and one can also study uh, leptogenesis with the same uh, thing. So, uh, recently in this uh, paper that I mentioned here, we studied uh, uh, a similar uh, generic U1x extension of the standard model, where we consider that the gauge boson couples, uh, uh, is, is leptophilic, so it couples only to the uh, standard model leptons with a uh, gauge uh, strength uh, Gx and the charges are denoted by Ni. 
and uh, we also have a small kinetic mixing between uh, this uh, light uh, gauge boson X and Z prime standard model and the standard model uh, Z boson. So instead of choosing the charges in an ad hoc manner, what uh, we constrain them from the low energy data that is the lepton, uh, I mean lepton universal violating observables in B2SLL like the RKRK star, uh, branching fraction of B2K, K star mu mu and so on and also uh, the muon magnetic moment diagram is shown here and we mainly focus in the region uh, mass region where the mass of the light uh, gauge boson is greater than twice the mass of muon so here i show the correlation between n1 and n2 which are the charges of the first generation and second generation of lepton so as you can see uh, it, it's a, there's a negative correlation between the two because of the discrepancy uh, in in the uh, ratio of b to k k star mu mu to with respect to the electron mode and uh, we find that um, n1 equal to minus 1 and n2 equal to 2 is a good solution and uh, due to uh, insufficient data we uh, are free to choose the value of n3 which we choose to be uh, minus 1. Now for n1 equal to minus 1 and n2 equal to 2 the correlation between uh, the mass and the gauge coupling is shown here. So we mostly consider masses like uh, from around 250 MeV to uh, about 1 GeV and uh, now in order to when we uh, make a choice of for these charges, in order to cancel the anomalies, we require additional chiral fermions, which we choose to be the three right-handed neutrinos with charges uh, mentioned here. And they are odd under the Z2. And as I mentioned, in order to give mass to the uh, light neutrinos, uh, we need the inner doublet. Now, and this is the relevant Yukawa Lagrangian. Uh, it is quite interesting to see that for masses of the uh, uh, U1x gauge boson between uh, 300 to 350 MeV, we are also able to explain the uh, anomalous result in the Koto, uh, ex by the Koto experiment, that is the, we are able to uh, explain the, the three signal events that are observed by the Koto experiment. So we can address that as well. Now, uh, with the presence of the right-handed neutrinos as well as the inner thick doublet and the gauge boson there, uh, we are uh, able to additionally address the following phenomenologies. One is the lepton flavor violation, uh, which is comes from due to these type, type of loop diagrams, the electron magnetic moment, uh, the RDRD star due to vertex correction uh, given by this and also some Higgs invisible and lepton flavor violating decays. So I won't uh, go into the details of the results because of the time constraint, but you are free to check out this article uh, for the interesting results that we uh, shown here. And we have also, uh, uh, in this case, uh, in this talk, I have mostly uh, focused on uh, the, the, the model with in presence of an inert Higgs tablet. But for a similar model without the inert Higgs, uh, I would request you to go through this article. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Lopamudra. So, are there any questions yeah. from people connected? Does not seem to be the case. All right, in that case, I would like to ask again people to uh, look for the question. Ah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, to, to the Metamorphs channel, and we will continue. So, thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, next speaker is uh, David Berevich, who will tell us about the flavor phenomenology with scalar laptop quarks. Oh, please, uh, Damir, can you hang on? Let me see. Okay, okay. that's good. Cool. Yep, we can see the slides and yeah. also hear you. So that I'm not sure really which one. Yeah, then fine, that's good. Yeah, okay. So, uh, first, 
So what to say to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the results we obtained here in collaboration with all these nice people, I, I, uh, the names of which I mentioned here. Uh, actually, I would like to discuss a little bit about this lepto, uh, flavor phenomenology with the scalar leptococcus in particular. I would skip this short introduction because uh, we've been discussing this already before. And here I will uh, uh, jump on the main motivation that uh, kind of uh, motivated for all these leptococcus uh, searches and leptococcus discussion in flavor physics in the more serious footing because of the hints on leptoflavor universality violation that started in 2012, 2012 by Babar and uh, ever since there have been uh, uh, lots of experimental efforts in order to kind of clarify the issue. As you will see the situation is not really that clear but still it is being a very motivating and exciting thing to kind of uh, nourish the ideas, theoretical ideas on how and uh, how can one explain those in terms of, uh, uh, of, the, of the new physics models, definitely new, new physics scenarios. So now just to briefly remind you, and you've certainly heard it many times before, is that RD and RD star, is the fraction uh, between the branching ratio of the B to D uh, semi-leptonic with the heavy lepton in the final state and with the basically uh, massless lepton in the final state. And what is interesting in that ratio, many things cancel. Yep. Uh, Actually, said, Damir, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I'm not quite uh, sure. Are you st still on the introductory slide? No, I'm, I'm ah, further done. So, so they, are, they <laughs> are not switching in the video actually. <laughs> okay. so let because I have a two windows open and then it's a question which one was the right one, sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm here. So that was the, what is the ratio? So that was B to okay. D heavy. And one is the massless, as I said. And what was interesting actually that is being observed that RD and this RD star were uh, measured to be larger than RD in the standard model. Whereas for the case of the, of the, of the uh, uh, RK, which is in a standard model loop induced process because it's uh, flavor changing neutral currents in a case of muon in a final state and electron E plus E minus for the partial branching fraction it turned out to be smaller than predicted in the standard model. Now, from the point of view of the model builders, for instance, there is immediately a, a, an issue because in order to build the new physics and to propose some new physics scenario to describe this RD, uh, say the SAR plus, you need the new physics scale that is of order one TEV, and you have the order of magnitude larger new physics scale if you want to reconcile this observation that RK and RK star are found to be smaller than the sole deficit of this with respect to the, to the standard model. Now the experimental situation just briefly, kind of in both, both situations got a little bit uh, tighter uh, after the last year's Morion conference, Electro Week session. And you can see here, this is certainly, you've, heard, you've seen this many times, when you have RD and RD star, uh, uh, you have the uh, uh, RD is on X axis and RD star on Y axis. And you see here actually that the bar bar result is uh, basically different from the results that you have in Bell. Of course, when you take the average, then the average with respect to this tiny standard model value is still three sigma away, but it is an uncomfortable feeling that you have these two results that are not yet, uh, not really in agreement uh, between themselves. So we now expect that the Bell 2 will clarify the situation. It, that's definitely something that we, we, we need in order to get a, a, a better, 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 better handle on on this uh, RD, RD star situation. On the other hand, also at the Morion Electro Week, it has been shown actually that the full data of RAN1 uh, are indeed 2.5 sigma lower than the standard model prediction, which is basically one. And also RK star, which has been previously measured, but one should always keep in mind that this has been obtained only by one experiment and here we were focusing on the window between one and six gel square, and that one needs to definitely have a experimental confirmation, for instance, from Bell 2, which is now up and running, and that's what we are eagerly awaiting 
uh, uh, to have. But now from the theorist point of view, you are just playing on this and you are saying, okay, there are now discrepancies. There are these anomalies, which are called B anomalies, almost unfortunate name and B discrepancies, I would call them better. And now how to handle them. In terms of effective field theory, as you've heard it certainly by previous speakers, actually you build an effective Lagrangian that reminds you of the, uh, is reminiscent of, of the Fermi theory that everyone learned at school. If you switch off all of these couplings, then it would be simply Fermi theory. But if you now switch on of these, uh, all of these uh, G couplings, then you might have, uh, of course, you have the extensions of the standard model. Now, which of these coupling, if you switch on one at a time, then if you see this uh, horizontal line, pink line is the chi-square of the standard model, you can see actually that by having a specific value of GVL, for instance, then you can improve considerably the value of, of this uh, chi-square, it gets much lower. But also when you do it for another coupling, for instance, this GSR or GT, and also for specific combinations that are relevant for the laptop work scenarios that you can see in a second later on. So now the question is now, uh, that's been done by, by turning on one at a time. Now, which Lorentz structure you will indeed choose? So that's a really model dependent statement. So then you are really choosing a specific scenario. Now, uh, that's something I will not talk about, but here about the viable electrocoke scenario, if I now focus only on this RD and RD star, you will see actually that they are in the upper part of the table are the scalar electrocokes the lower is the vector leptocorks. And you can see that these with the good check marks, obviously these highlighted zones are those that are viable. And as you can see, uh, these are the, these couplings that appear that are different from zero in each of these scenarios. And they can be, uh, uh, obviously they are evaluated by fitting them uh, or matching them with the data. But since you only have a one observer, which is RD and RD star, of course, uh, but it's the same story, if you wish they are two. Uh, you need more observables in order to, to disentangle which of these scenarios is indeed the good one. And this can be done if you have the angular distribution of B to D star, tau nu, but also lambda B to lambda C, which is something that we've been working on recently, and soon there will be also a paper on this, so that one can be disentangled among these scenarios if you have more information on these angular observables, which is something that VEL2 will definitely do. Similar approach to this effective uh, theory is actually when you do it for this uh, flavor changing neutral currents. And here I only focus to these two operators, which are O9 and O10. You see from the hadronic side, these are simple uh, semi-leptonic operators. But from the leptonic side, you have simply vector current and axial current, so C9 and C10 would be then relevant. And here is the cleanest maybe observable that we have there, which is B, B sub S to mu mu, as well as this RK and RK star. So if you use only those that we call the cleanest observables, then you obtain the region in this uh, surplus, if you wish, of this C9 and C10. And if you compare this, so it, in the standard model, if standard model was indeed there, that it should be zero. So we see the value are different from zero. We see that they are negative and different from, uh, from zero for the C9. And they have a specific correlation such that they do not really follow the line C9 equal to C10. That is really disfavored by the data, but indeed is consistent with the idea that this is C9 equal to minus C10. So this is with, the, with, the, with only these three observers, but if you use the full global analysis of this uh, data B to SLL, the similar picture actually uh, crops up anyway. Now, for this RK scenario, you have uh, many different options, so it's kind of more generous now. Here we are giving an asterisk for the scenario that we proposed a few years ago with Alcia Sumenzari, who was um, a brilliant PhD student, now postdoc, now it will join us soon at Orsay. And uh, it was actually based on the fact that if you see the R2 scenario, this is the Lagrangian, how it looks like. And if you at three levels, so if you have only these R couplings, you would have that you verify C9 is equal C10, which is disfavored by the data. However, by a clever choice of the Yukawa couplings, you can see that this contribution is irrelevant. 
and that the relevant contribution is the one that is still loop induced by computing this kind of diagram. And you indeed verify C9 is equal minus C10, which is what you want. And the sign of this loop contribution is going in the right direction. Now, what is interesting why I'm talking about this because by only two constraints, because we recently also computed this contribution from leptococcus to the Z2 mu mu, then if you include only lab bounds to Z2 mu mu, and the LHC bounds from the from the dilepton uh, tail no, of the of the PP to mu mu scattering, then you will have actually that um, that uh, the window that is not restrained. So these are all exclusion zone, and the allowed window is this white region here in which you cannot have the very small values of RK and RK star, but only 0 0.9 or higher. So that means if the value is on the lower uh, uh, on the lower allowed range that is right now experimentally suggested, then this model would be killed. But if the higher values are still preferred, like such, such as 0 and 9, then this model is still surviving even in this situation. Now I would go for this uh, uh, if I want to do the global analysis. So if I want to accommodate all of them, namely those for the tree level in the standard model and the loop induced ones. So RD, RD star, RK, RK star. So all of them I want to explain in a, in a one consistent scenario. Then the only available uh, that is the single leptococcus solution, which we say would be this vector leptococcus. However, the problem with this is actually that you need to specify ultra, ultraviolet completion in order to compute loops simply, this is not renormalizable and you need to uh, complete it. So that means that you have to introduce extra assumptions, extra parameters in order to obviously tame all the loop contribution divergences that you are getting there. And uh, there's been a considerable effort really invested in this direction. What we prefer is to work with these scenario which are renormalizable in effective uh, field theory approach that are renormalizable that you can compute loop and that's when you have the scalar leptococcus. However, one of them is not possible to devise and you need to combine the two of them at least. And as you could see from this, you can combine S1 with S3 and R2 and S3, and that would be a viable scenario. In the, and indeed, I will call it option one. That's the scenario we proposed a couple of years ago. And the more popular is the one at the S1 and S3 that is being investigated for several years recently. So I will now just uh, flash this slide and I will not obviously expect anyone to go to the details of this. Then I, when I have a S3 and R2 scenario, so this is R2 part of the Lagrangian, this is S3 part of the effective Lagrangian. And then the situation here are the quantum numbers. You see that is a, a standard model, so it would be the triplet, so it's a, it carries a color, then it says you to double it, and this is the heat hypercharge and so on for the others. Now, uh, the, uh, the whole crux of the game is actually that you have to uh, fix these Yukawa couplings. So now, the structure that we have chosen there was the one that is consistent with the SU5 unification, and it indeed turned out to be minimalistic and consistent with this SU5 unification. You see that these S3 Yukawas are indeed the same as the left-handed for the R2, with the opposite sign and the right-handed couplings, there is only one that should satisfy this, but indeed, if it's only one, then obviously it satisfies this as it is diagonal. So in terms of this coupling, you have this specific angle, which is called the theta. And if you write these observables, I remind you what was the problem of model building, that this is huge separation of scales. So how you can accommodate if you want to tree level and loop induced processes, because the scales are vastly uh, uh, different by orders of magnitude. So here it is shown actually that indeed there is this sign to theta that plays the role of this suppression parameter. So despite the fact that uh, B sub S mu mu requires higher scale, but since there is in a coupling, there is a smaller, there is a small parameter that would really play the role of the suppression, which is even more enhanced in the case of the B sub S, B sub S bar mixing. And this is indeed what we want because B sub S, B sub S bar mixing is quite, is very consistent with the standard model. So this is shown in, in, in this 
slide. And here is what is happening now on this GSL. You remember this coupling that we had for the Bs to CL nu. Now, when you combine everything there, you can see if you were really picking only the uh, 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 real axis that there would be no solution because RD and RD star are not crossing the real axis at the same point. However, if you are allowing a complex solution, then you have really two symmetric solution as you can see, and the bunch of different uh, 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 flavor constraints are being included in order to get these small islands uh, in this upper and lower part of this imaginary axis GSL. Now, when you have the direct searches, namely from LHC uh, uh, constraints, then these are these gray excluded re exclusion regions, so that in the end we are indeed on this island that is uh, finally uh, acceptable. And finally, there was recently also the work done, done on a PP to tau knew that it also can be used in order to uh, generate an extra constraint. And indeed, it generates a constraint that is however, not really killing too much of our space. And also this bound could be relaxed by the fact that they have not considered uh, the, 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 the propagating uh, laptop work. Now, some uh, uh, observations that we made is, uh, that are interesting in this, that we, if we have the imaginary part that then the uh, CP asymmetry in this D to K, K and D to Pi Pi, and in particular in this Delta ACP might be a problem. We checked on those and indeed we are obtaining a tiny contribution so that it does not uh, generate any problem. Then for the electri electric uh, uh, dipole moment of the neutron that could be generated through charm, uh, we also see that this contribution is really very small and our results are perfectly consistent with the, uh, the experiment. And what is interesting actually that now in order to check on these models where everything is consistent, everything is great, but can we uh, distinguish, check on the model if, we, if there is an observable that can tell us indeed that the model is viable or that it can be refuted. And that's uh, what can be done from the lambda B to lambda C, for instance. And that's one of the example on the forward backward asymmetry. Standard model here is given in blue. And you see it's crossing the Q square axis here at AJAV. And if I switch one of these couplings that I gave here, independently on the sign of the imaginary uh, uh, part, then you get something that uh, pushes this zero at the larger value of Q square. And obviously the value of the forward backward symmetry would be larger. Now there are uh, some uh, observables which can also distinguish the sign of, the, of this imaginary part. They are different. Now I will just say a few words on this S1, S3 scenario, but it's being a popular. So there is a model of the Zurich guide and called the Butazzo et al. Then there is one by Cleveland in which they have the uh, uh, Z2 symmetry for the Yukawa couplings imposed for the B to K nu nu. And then we have a scenario which we propose here, which has an extra coupling actually here, and it's two by two matrices in S1 and S3. So now what is interesting, we did all this study with the many different flavor observable. And you see with respect to the standard model that you did improve, you practically half the overall Q square, not total Q square. Now, what is interesting is that you see on this y axis is this B to K mu mu. And the observation that is being already made before is that if you want to uh, satisfy that RD indeed pushes towards the experimental value, which is here given by blue, and this is what is allowed by our models, our uh, model to Krivelin et al. And this is uh, Butazzo et al. So you see actually that uh, what is being observed actually that you would have a problem with the with the B sub S, B sub S bar mixing. And now what uh, we show actually here that there is being also an effort that the flag result that is being used as flavor lattice averaging group that is being released the last year, the beginning of the year. And since then there was the HPQCD that released another set of results, which are very accurate also, but they are somewhat different. And you see now, if I use this HPQCD, that the agreement that is going really in this direction towards the uh, uh, overlapping with the experimental data for RD, RD star. So you cannot push at the very large value of RD, RD star if you want to satisfy all the other constraints. So it's somewhat better, but we have an extra parameter that's normal. It happens in this model, uh, uh, which I call model three, which is ours. Here are the 
conclusions or summary, and I really apologize for being a little bit old, uh, old, uh, old and long, uh, but old definitely. So there is a, one thing that I would like just to mention, the rest I will let you read, but uh, what I would like to mention is that none of these proposals really discuss the issue of the G minus two of muon. And this discrepancy now is the question whether it is an issue or not, because the recent LATTE study of uh, BMW collaboration shows that uh, the agreement with standard model is quite good. But if you take this hadronic vacuum polarization uh, that is being uh, obtained from the fit with the data, it is being done before, and you have this practically four sigma uh, deviations from the standard model, then this could be done, but uh, at the expense of obviously switching one of the right-handed coupling because you need the chirality flipping definitely. So, and this can be done in this S1 and S3 scenario, and there's been work in this direction. Still, I believe that the issue of uh, uh, G minus two still deserves more scrutiny and more uh, certainly new lattice data will, will finally solve that issue. And also to the experimenters, I would like to say in all our models, we have that the, this lepton flavor violating mode, either B to K mu tau or even Z to mu tau have upper and lower bound, which is also extraordinary. So definitely uh, deserves to be studied further at the LHCB and Bell 2 will do for this one. But FCC is definitely what we hope to get uh, in order to get more shed more light on this Z to mu tau. Okay, sorry for being long. Thank you, Damir, very much for, 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 for the summary of the bundles and uh, the suggestion for the experiment, experimentalists. So are there any questions from people connected? So we, may, we may have time for one quick question, basically. I see Leonardo is unmuted. Ah, no, I'm just preparing. Ah, okay. Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you again, Damir. And uh, I again encourage people to put questions to uh, Metamos chat. Okay, thank you. Speakers. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so Leonardo and Justi will present us a novel computation paradigm for the precise, precise determination of uh, the hadronic uh, uh, contribution to the ion G2 uh, from the lattice QCD. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, we can see your video, but not the screen. Okay. So I had to leave the meeting. Okay, let's wait for Rona to, uh, to join again. Can you sh can you see the screen now? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, sorry. I, okay. Can I start? Yes, the slides works. Okay, sorry for the delay. 
Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. What I would like to present here is a novel computational strategy for a precise determination of the adronic contribution to the anomalous magnetic moment of, of the muon using lattice QCD. This is work done in collaboration with Mattia Dalla Brida, Tim Harris, and Michele Pepe, and it's been published on the archive uh, a couple of weeks ago. So let's summarize what is the status of the anomalous magnetic moment. Uh, a few weeks ago, there, there was a, a comprehensive, an excellent comprehensive review by the, the Muon G-2 initiative, theory initiative, and the facts are the following. There is still the, the experimental result is still the old one here with an error of 0.54 parts per million, which means an error of 63 here. And the best theoretical uh, prediction to date is the uh, standard model for the standard model value as an error of 43 that you see here. Now, if you make the difference of the central values, then you see that the two differ by 3.7 sigmas. So this is the first fact. The second fact, if you see here the number that I, I, I highlighted in yellow, is the second fact is that the error, the standard model error is dominated by the adronic contribution. And among the adronic contribution, the dominating error comes from the adronic vacuum polarization. So this is the second fact. Now, what is the role of the lattice here? So a third fact is that lattice even, even though there was a, a remarkable and, and a very huge effort in computing the adronic vacuum polarization, you see that the error that is quoted in this review from the lattice is still more than four times larger than the error that you get from the dispersive approach. Now, the fourth fact that we have to keep in mind is that the running experiment E989 at Fermilab we reduce or is expected to reduce the uncertainty on the experimental number by a factor of four. And so this means that if we want to match the final uncertainty from the Fermilab experiment, we need a two per mil precision for the adronic vacuum polarization and in general for the adronic contribution to the standard model prediction. So remember this number, just two per mil precision. And now if you see these numbers here, you see that the lattice it's a factor almost more than a more order of magnitude away from this, uh, from this target. So if we want to exploit the most from the experimental results, we should reach the two per mil precision. And what is plotted here in the plot below, it's, it's again from the same review. Then you see that there are the red points are the results from uh, dispersive approach. The green band here is just the value of the hadron vacuum polarization if you compute all the rest in the standard model and you subtract from the, from the experimental value. So the green band is essentially the non new physics scenario. So the difference between the red and the green band is the 3.7 sigmas. And you see that the lattice results are the blue points here. And if you average them, or actually you average the best of them, then what you get is the, is the blue band here. And you see that this blue band is too large, even to discriminate between, between these two results here, the theoretical one and the experimental one, and will be huge if you think that the experimental results will be improved by, by a factor four. As, uh, as Damir said, there has been a very recent paper by the, the BMW collaboration, and this, this paper is under debate and was not included in, uh, in this review here. So, but what is, so what I would like to discuss here is how, what is the bulk of the problem in Lattice QCD? What is the conceptual problem that we have in Lattice QCD and why after such a, a large amount of work, we, we still have an error which is 10 times larger than what we would need to match the final Fermilab uh, precision. And okay, if you analyze in detail how we do the computation, you will realize immediately that the bottleneck is the signal to noise ratio in the correlation function that we compute. In fact, the hadronic vacuum collaboration to, to the anomalous magnetic moment of the mu on a mu can be written as an integral, as an integral over, a, over a, a product of two functions, k, which is just an analytically known function, and G, which we need to compute numerically. G is just the, the zero momentum correlator of two electromagnetic currents. 
And when you do the integral over the fermions, you realize that you have two, uh, and then you use the big theorem, you have two kinds of contraction, the connected one and the disconnected one, which are depicted here. Now, by far, the largest contribution to G, to G minus two comes from the connected diagram here, connected here where, where the, running, the running quarks over the lines are the up and the down quarks, so the light quarks. And now, if you compute the ratio, the ratio of the error square of sigma square divided the central value square, then you realize immediately that this ratio explodes exponentially with the distance of the sources. You know, it goes like e to the two m rho minus m pi times the distance between the two sources. And the only way that you have to reduce the error and, and then to get a signal is to increase the number of configuration and not in this formula here. Now, what is plotted here is as a function of time, as a function of time of the dis of x naught, if you like, uh, as a function of the distance between the sources, on the y axis is plotted the integral of that we need to do. And this is from the mind's collaboration. Then you see that if you go above 1.5 Fermi, the error starts to increase. And then when you arrive to 2.5 Fermi, where the contribution to the integral is still very relevant, then the error explodes. Okay, so this is the, the bottleneck, the, the barrier that we have on the lattice to, to get an error which is at the Fermi level. And one can ask, uh, is this just a problem of, of this correlation function or it's a generic problem uh, that we have when we use Monte Carlo to compute correlation function. And, there, and the, the answer to this question is that this is a very generic problem. You have the same problem in baryonic correlation function, in vector correlation function, and so on. The only correlation function where we do not have a problem is the correlation function which are dominated by the pseudoscape, by the pion contribution, okay? And this problem is really intrinsic in, in the Monte Carlo that we use, in the, in the important sampling that we use. And so we need here a new computational paradigm to, to solve this problem. And what we advocated is what is called the multi-level integration. So the multi-level integration works as follows. Let's suppose to have your four-dimensional space-time that we discretize. And let's put on the x-axis the time and on the y-axis, the, the three-dimensional spaces. And let's suppose they, they divide your four-dimensional space-time in two blocks, okay? What I call here omega zero and what I call here omega two, okay? And let's allow these two blocks to have an overlapping region, which I call lambda one. So the block omega zero will have a, a region lambda zero, which do not overlap with the block lambda, uh, omega two. Then there will be lambda one, which belongs to omega zero and omega two because they overlap. And then we will have lambda two that belongs only to omega two. And now let's suppose, let's suppose that we have a factorized action. So an action in which the dependence, and the dependence on the gauge field in lambda zero in, in the first block is only in the first part in S naught. And the dependence on the gauge field in lambda two is only in the second part. And let's suppose that we have the very same, the very same, the, the, the very same for the observable. Then we could do the following. We could generate with our Monte Carlo N0 configuration, which we call level zero configuration for the gauge field in, in the overlapping regions. And then for each of those configuration or those N0 configuration, we can generate N1 configuration in the two factorized region, lambda zero and lambda two. And now, now, since the action is factorized, then you can combine for each of the N0 configuration, you, you can generate not only N1 configuration for lambda zero and lambda two, but for the overall lattice, you can combine them because the action is factorized. And then you can generate N1 uh, square configurations, okay? And so at the end, what you end up, you end up, you end up that in the formula that we had before for the error N0, N, N0 or N0, is replaced, is, replaced, is replaced by N0 times N1 square. And this is at the cost of generating N0 times N1 standard configuration. So you see immediately that with this trick, you have gained a factor N1. And this N1, this N1 is of the order between 10 and 100, okay? So you, you may immediately gain in the cost of the simulation one or two order of magnitude. 
Now, if conceptually you, you generalize this idea to more than two blocks, okay, and then you see that what you have to replace is a knot with a knot times n one to the number of blocks. Now, the number of blocks goes proportionally with the distance between the source and the sink of the two currents. And therefore, it's true that the computation of this correlation function would cause is exponentially difficult with the distance. But then you gain with the multilevel an exponential, you gain exponentially. And then the net result is that the effort would increase only linearly with the distance. So you see that conceptually, the multilevel integration is a completely different uh, Monte Carlo uh, procedure but would solve the exponential problem. This is not only for G minus two, but for many other correlators that we compute on the lattice. Okay, now thanks to the work of the last two or three years, now using multilevel integration for fermions is a reality, okay? This is just new. Multilevel was used very extensively for just pure gauge, but not with fermions, but thanks to the work of the last couple of years, and the two, key, the two keywords here are the so-called overlapping domain decomposition that we just saw and the multi-boson representation. Then for the effective fermionic action, so the determinant of Q, and let's say for two flavors, determinant of Q squared, we can rewrite it as a, a, an integral of auxiliary scalar field times X of an, of an action, E minus an action with a factorized dependence on the gauge field. So you see the gauge field in lambda zero is only in S naught, and the dependence of the, of the action from the gauge field in lambda two is only in S2. And this has been obtained because the path contribution from the quarks is treated differently in this construction. In particular, you can ca uh, categorize the, the contribution from the, uh, from the quarks in paths that have no loops around the, um, the overlapping region. And these are, are taken into account with the so-called pseudo-fermion auxiliary variables. Then there are, then there are uh, quark paths with, with one to n loops around this overlapping region. And these are taken into account with the multi boson auxiliary fields. And then there are the, re the rest of the path that contribute to the action that usually goes in the important sampling. Now these now go, so these are the path with more than n loops, quark loops, and then they go in the observable in the form of a reweighting factor. Okay, so the first multilevel computation of the hadron vacuum polarization with this technique was, was completed just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what we did, what we did is the simulation on a realistic lattice, a lattice spacing of 0.065 Fermi, a pi of mass of 270 MeV, a lattice with the spatial extent is three Fermi. So this is a very good lattice. And we choose, this was just a proof of concept study. We choose N0, the level zero configuration equal to 25 and N1 equal to 10. Okay, and, what, and this is the, the domain decomposition that we use. And this is what you see in this plot is in X, you see the, you see the time distance of uh, uh, the two electromagnetic currents. And in Y, you see the variance of the correlation function. So you see immediately, you see immediately that with the standard technique, so the red square and one equal one, and one equal one means that is the standard technique. You see how it increased the variance of the two point function. And in particular, in the difficult region between 1.5 Fermi and three Fermi, you see that the variance increased by more than one order of magnitude. And in fact, the variance to the integral is dominated by the variance, uh, by the variance of the points at the larger distance. Now, if you switch on the multilevel, so you take N1 equal 10, for instance, what you get is the blue triangles here. And then you see immediately that the variance, you gain exponentially with the distance of the, of the currents. And then you see that the variance remain constant with the distance of the currents. Okay, so you see that with this, with this uh, new uh, important sampling, the, the sharp price of the variance is automatically flattened out by the two level integration. Okay, and then you don't need to model anymore uh, the correlation function at large distance, like, like what is done typically and what makes this error from the lattice large. So then now you, what you can compute, you, co you compute the various contribution. So what is shown here in the upper plot is as a function of the distance of the sources, is the correlation function and is the light light, uh, sorry, the light connected contribution with the red points. There is the strange connected contribution with the blue points. 
And in green, there is the overall disconnected contribution. Now on the down plot, on the plot, uh, on the lower plot, what you can show, what is shown as a function of the distance is the integral of the results on the upper plot. So if you want to know the integral up to 1.5 Fermi, you go to the lower plot, and this is the at 1.5 Fermi, and this is the integral. So x not max is the upper extreme of integration of, of the in the computation of a new. Now, what, what we learn from this plot, first of all, we learn that even up to three Fermi and without doing nothing to the data, just taking the data as they are, we, we reach a 1% precision just with uh, 250 configurations. Okay, and this is <clears throat> a large improvement, almost a factor 10 with the respect to a uh, factor 10 because we had then one equal 10. So a factor 10 with respect to the standard computation. The second lesson that we learned, and this was already known, is that the strange, it's, it's uh, significant, the contribution to the strange, but its error is completely negligible. With the multi-level, its error is well below the per mil level. And then the, the third important point that we learned is that with the multi-level, the disconnected contribution that, is very, that was very difficult to be computed, now, the, the problem of computing this contribution is essentially solved. If you combine the split even estimator that were recently proposed to compute this connected diagram and the two level integration, even at the larger distance here, notice that this contribution here is multiplied by 10 to be shown in this plot. So even at the larger distance, the error coming from the disconnected contribution is a third of the error from the connected contribution. And so it's essentially negligible, okay? So with the multi-level, the disconnected contribution is solved. The strange is, the error from the strange is negligible and the same is for the charm and so on. And so the dominant, the dominant error here is coming from the light contribution. Now, when you go, now this test has been done with a mass of 270 MeV. And when you go to the lighter quark masses, actually the gain due to the multi level is even more dramatic, okay? Because, because the m rho minus m pi increase, and therefore the exponential problem that we have in this case here, you know, the, the, this coefficient in the exponent increase dramatically, and therefore the signal to noise ratio problem become more and more severe. And therefore, the multi you get more and more gain with the multilevel. Okay, so the conclusion are the following. The multilevel Monte Carlo integration accelerate the inverse scaling of the statistical error with the cost of the simulation. To get, the same, to get just 1% error here, we had to have just 250 configuration. Now, this was a proof of concept study, a pilot study. Now, if you want to go to the two per mil, what you need to do is to increase this number by essentially a factor three. Okay, you have to increase N1 by two to four, and then you have to increase N0 by four to six. Okay, this has to be seen uh, in, a, in a, you know, which number to choose exactly has to be seen in a real computation. When you go lighter, the gain is even more dramatic because the signal to noise ratio problem increases exponentially and therefore the gain increases exponentially. So all these results uh, suggest that the change of computational paradigm that we have presented here removes the main barrier for making affordable on the computer available today, the goal of the 2% precision of the hadronic vacuum polarization. It goes without saying that the very same variance reduction applies also to, what, to the other ingredient to reach the 2% precision, which is the calibration of the lattice, the calculation of electromagnetic correction, or the calculation of the light by light contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonardo, for the presentation. So we have a time for a very quick question only. from the people connected. Okay, it doesn't seem to be any question. In that case, uh, thank you, Leonardo, again. And uh, again, uh, people, please, if you have further questions later, put them into the most chat. And let's uh, finish the session with the last talk. Uh, which is uh, the, the plant measurement of the muon uh, anomalous magnetic moment and electric dipole moment at J Park, presented by Hiromi.
Okay, here maybe we can see our shared screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. We can see the slides as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, this is Hiromi Inuma from Ibaraki University, Japan. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, measurement on mu and g minus two EDM at JPARC. Uh, there are four features listed below, but uh, I would like to emphasize here is uh, we will apply a completely different experimental method, uh, different from Brookhaven or a Fermilab experimental method. The first collaboration paper on experimental design is uh, published uh, last year, uh, which shows uh, here. And uh, you can find more detail of our experimental information. Uh, please look at it. We measure uh, muon anomalous magnetic moment, G minus uh, two. G minus two is a very good probe to explore uh, beyond the standard model uh, because uh, uh, prediction and experimental value are both obtained very precisely uh, level of uh, sub PPM and there is a uh, differ. So we need to improve uh, experimental uncertainty as well as theoretical uncertainty to judge this difference is real or not. Existence of uh, electric dipole moment EDM itself is beyond the standard model. And the upper limit from experimental approach is obtained in this value. Our aim is increase uh, improve sensitivity, 100 times better sensitivity of this number. This is our uh, motivation of experiment. This slide, I will briefly introduce how to measure G minus two and the EDM of muon. In uniform magnetic field, uh, muon has been rotated ahead of uh, momentum due to non-zero G minus two. And if you if we take an inner product of momentum and spin, and we will have a, a spin precession frequency omega. General form of this uh, spin precession vector is uh, following. And to cancel of this second term, the Brookhaven uh, people or Fermilab people apply so-called magic momentum to cancel this term. And they obtain this formula. Uh, on the other hand, uh, JPAC, our approach is completely different. Instead of uh, having a magic momentum gamma, but we set a completely zero electric field to cancel this term. And we obtain this simple term. And this first term is G minus two, and the second term is related to EDM. And as you see, these two terms are also now. This means we can detect these two parameter, physics parameter from experiment uh, separately at a time. Uh, this is an important feature to apply a new uh, physics approach. And this is a comparison table of two different uh, experimental approach. And these are our uh, parameter. Our beam, muon beam momentum is uh, uh, very small, 10 times smaller than uh, Brookhaven one. However, our strategy field is uh, bigger uh, than uh, twice bigger. And then cyclotron period of our case is 20 times smaller than the previous experiment. This means that 20 times smaller stretch link is available in our experiment. 
Uh, this is a very important feature of our experiment. This picture, uh, this slide shows uh, the signal of two physics from uh, decay positron from the muon. Because muon decay uh, spin, spin dependently, and uh, if you take a, a decayed positron uh, time spectrum, you will get these two physics uh, result. But as I mentioned, because of the uh, compact stretch link, uh, we may have, we can have a large acceptance detector. And this large acceptance detector allow us to give a vector information of this spin precession. That is why we can detect G minus two and EDM signal at the same time, but separately. Uh, this is what I want to emphasize in this slide. To, in order to uh, realize uh, this experimental approach, uh, new muon beam line is a uh, dedicated mu new muon beam line is now under construction at JPAC MRF. Okay, in my talk, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, ongoing R&D items uh, listed here. And the first three, I will discuss about uh, muon beam source of low emittance. And this is very low emittance compared to 1000, uh, smaller than conventional uh, muon beam from pion decay. And we also accelerate uh, muon beam with LINAC and keep low emittance. And we need to inject a beam in the compact stretch ring. And finally, I will introduce a position, position detector to reconstruct new decay point. Before I go detail, I will inform you a budget status in this page. KEK, a scientific advisory committee endorsed E34, uh, this is our experiment for the near term priority last year. And this year, KEK prepares a funding request to next this year. And uh, we won the grant in aid for specially promoted research. Uh, this is a kind of a big budget uh, which can apply uh, individual researchers. And uh, we also, we are just noticed this information uh, yesterday. Uh, although uh, we still need uh, amount of budget to complete uh, construction. However, uh, this is a big step forward to realize this experiment. Okay, let's move to the next slide. This picture shows uh, image of low emittance beam source. Low emittance beam is uh, from muonium production target. Uh, muonium is a bind state of positive muon and electron. And this is a production target and in thermal energy. And we need to have an ionization laser and we will have a thermal muon, very uh, small momentum uh, thermal muon. Then we will accelerate a muon beam up to 300 mEV over C by use of LINAC. This picture shows a production target of muonium. This is a silica aerogel. And the efficiency of a muonium production is three times 10 to the minus three per muon. This is a kind of good number to be a realistic uh, beam source, I would say. Then uh, we will accelerate some of muon up to uh, relativistic, relativistic energy. And the muon line are consistent of uh, several steps and the entire length is roughly 40 meter. And the line can uh, keep the low emittance 
in the muon beam source. And this uh, bottom four plot shows uh, beam phase space at the exit of muon Linux. And this is a very low emittance beam uh, compared to compared with uh, conventional uh, muon beam from pion decay. So we, we are designing uh, to have a very low emittance beam. And uh, we are developing step-by-step -step for uh, real uh, LINAC. And this is a picture of first acceleration of the muon by use of a radio frequency coder pole. And this is a, a result from 2018. And actually this is a, a it, oh, this is the first signal of the muon acceleration in the world. And now uh, we are working on the second step, IHDTL so-called. And uh, we also working on uh, non-destructive muon uh, beam profile monitor along the LINAC. So we are uh, developing a real uh, experimental material every day, okay. Now, uh, because we have a very low emittance beam, uh, we will have. So we don't need to have uh, any electric uh, field to control uh, muon beam phase space like E821. That is why we have uh, this uh, simple equation. And we, have, we can have a very compact stress link. However, we have to think how to inject a beam such a small only two meter circumference link with uh, good injection efficiency. So I will change the topic, how to inject the beam into a such uh, compact ring. To inject a beam in a small area, all in one solenoidal magnet is uh, suitable. Okay. okay. And the beauty is a small uh, connection between the stretch area and the, uh, the stretch area and applying a kick and uh, uh, we can store the beam in the center plane of the uh, solenoidal magnet. And this is an image of a solenoidal magnet and injection trajectory. And we expect uh, injection efficiency is about uh, 85%. Actually, uh, I am a responsible person of this uh, injection scheme and the uh, detail uh, in this paper. And uh, after the kick, uh, this is a, a trajectory, expected trajectory, and we will store the beam on the blue plane. And we also have another study to keep a uh, phase space matching in this uh, fiducial uh, stretch volume. Uh, 3D way, uh, such kind of injection is brand new items so that I need to demonstrate this feasibility by use of electron beam. And this is a, a setup of the test experiment. And this is a 3D view in the nitrogen gas. It's not muon, but electron, but we can see the very beautiful spiral uh, trajectory. The key of this uh, injection is to control transverse motion of the beam. And this is a bit detail of uh, beam dynamics. So I, I don't go detail. Then this is a picture of a uh, stretch magnet and the light plot is showing the uniformity in the uh, fiducial volume, which uh, muon uh, stored. And this is a RG uh, picture and averaged uh, in Ajimusa way. And this picture says uh, we, our design is uh, plus minus 50 PPB uniformity is available. The detail you can find in the, uh, pic, the uh, publication. And not only design, but we also have a skill to control a very good uh, magnetic field uniformity by use of uh, iron seed. Uh, this is a picture of MRI type magnet for the another muon experiment, but do we have a skill to align, uh, adjust the magnetic field and we achieve plus or minus 
0.45 ppm in 30 centimeter spherical object. Now I would move to a uh, detector, uh, decay positron detector. This is a picture of the detector because a uh, decay positron from muon is always going to inside of the muon trajectory. So detector is like cylindrical shape and this shape, the acceptance is almost two pi. Therefore, this is an image of the uh, decay positron. And we can tra trace back the decayed positron up to a muon decay point. This is a very important to detect the vector information of spin uh, precession frequency. And this is a simulation result of the reconstruction efficiency of uh, our signal region. And this is a very good signal. And the bottom plot shows uh, expected mu uh, uh, positive momentum resolution. Again, this is a very good. So now uh, reconstruction uh, software preparation is uh, very in good shape. Not only uh, software uh, preparation, but also we uh, develop a real detector. Uh, this is too much complicated to explain detail, but we do uh, real development of our detector as well. And you can find more detail on this uh, paper. Lastly, I will introduce our schedule and the milestone. Uh, here is uh, now. Although uh, we may, uh, we have to do many, many steps, but we are expecting commissioning and the first data taking of 2025 and maybe uh, very uh, brand new physics result, maybe uh, before 2030. Okay, uh, this is my last uh, summary slide. Uh, J Park mu and G minus two EDM experiment will uh, independently measure G minus two and EDM with a method of completely different from Brookhaven uh, EA21 and the Fermi lab uh, 989. Uh, mu beam line construction was uh, partially started and the intense R&D of each subsystem sub detectors is ongoing. And in coming years, uh, construction construction is ongoing and we will uh, we expect uh, data taking from uh, fiscal year 2025. Uh, this is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yomi. So, so I see already a question from Lopamudra. So please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether uh, the J Park also plans to uh, measure the electron G minus two. Uh, electron G minus two. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, there is no plan for electron G minus two in J Park. Uh, J Park uh, is a proton accelerator and the uh, electron accelerator is completely different facility. So uh, my answer is okay. no. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, any other question? Or comment? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you, Hirme, again for for uh, the nice presentation of the, and uh, we will be looking forward the improved limits on the on the muon EDM. Uh, so we are concluding basically the the today's uh, session. Uh, again, the Zoom uh, room will remain open uh, for people uh, for, for possible discussions. And as well as, of course, uh, I would like to ask speakers to monitor yet a bit uh, the Mattermost chat in case uh, late com uh, questions come to, to, their, uh, to their presentations or talks. Well, thank you, everyone. And Otherwise, we will probably hear each other on the on the plenary sessions next week.